Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. 
The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same.
They can tell you stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow will never be the same. Stories which are brighter than yesterday. The streets have never been so quiet. The squirrels found a new hideaway. Tomorrow 
So quiet, the squirrels found a new hideaway. So quiet, the squirrels found a new hideaway. So quiet, the squirrels found a new hideaway. Go ahead, Rajiv, unmute yourself. Rajiv, unmute yourself. Okay, Rajiv, okay, wait. Rajiv, 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 stop. You got two devices, someone. So, Rajiv, just stop one of the devices, please. Sign up for one. Riti, coming. You can start the session. Riti, over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, global namaste to all of you. Wherever you're joining us from around the world, we welcome you to another session of Integrated Health. As usual, let's start with the mantra. I will choose the Gayatri Mantra. You are welcome to choose whichever mantra works for you. Oh. Oh. basically taking us from a place of darkness to a place of light as we are hoping this session today will do for you as well we have an array of speakers all very talented in their own modalities and this session in particular, we are looking at how to bring together all of the different disciplines all of the different modalities to answer a couple of questions and those questions are how do we get all of the modalities to work together where are the synergies where are the differences and how can we help each other to grow through this movement 
Another thing that we're looking at is in particularly chronic pain. How can we manage to control that pain? How can we reduce it? How can we make our lives happier, healthier, and more holistic? So today is a really important session and for a couple of reasons. A, we've got a very special surprise in store for you today, something that the team has been working incredibly hard on and I can't wait to introduce that a little bit later. We've also got people from all of the different modalities that are coming together all under one roof and that is the Zoom roof. The Zoom room is really the place today to be if you want to be able to enliven your lives, to be richer, to be more fulfilled within, and just be absolutely amazing. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our producer for Healing Our Earth Integrated Health Sessions. And that person is Dr. Rajiv Gupta. For those of you that don't know, let me introduce him. So Dr. Rajiv Gupta is a qualified medical doctor. He has had over 30 years of experience working with the NHS, the National Health Service, here oh. in the United Kingdom. Oh. He is also the chairman of the Regional Council of the British Medical Association Association and the Regional Consultants Committee and is the Chairman of Central Specialist Committee of the Royal College. Professor Rajiv Gupta is trained in Western allopathic medicines as well as other medicines too. He has had 30 years of experience. However, he has begun to realize the gaps in modern medicine. And for the past 10 years, he has been fascinated by this integration of how other systems of medicine, including alternative health, can begin to work together to synergize. And to, that is our theme for today, the integration between all of these different modalities and all of these different medicines. He is also the chairman of the Advisor Advisory Board at the International Organization of Integrated Health Practitioners. His philosophy is that there is no branch or discipline that is perfect and a cure for all ailments. He's working together, helping a patient, and in particular, understanding the benefits and the weaknesses of these different modalities of medicine and how they come together and fit together in order to be able to cure, in order to be able to heal, in order to be able to help patients. He is also our integrated health producer for Healing Our Earth. Let's hear what he has to say about integration. Global Namaste Rajiv Ji, welcome. Global Namaste Rajiv I'm so delighted to be here today to have this program created with you. You are the co-host and those of you who do not know Rajiv she is a very inspirational source. She's qualified in law, but does yoga herself and practices it. And I'm so grateful that she is an energy creating this program with me, which is the integration. And those of you who believe, and I think majority of you would believe that there is no branch or science or medical field which is giving cure for every single disease. So I'm qualified in Western medicine, but there is no cure for every disease like fibromyalgia, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, chronic arthritis, chronic backache. There are many conditions in which there is medicines given, but it's not getting to the position where you can stop medicine and get cured. While on the other hand, you have Ayurveda, homeopathy, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, uh, Qigong, aromatherapy, they're all complementing each other. And the whole idea for today is, although modern medicine may be a base, but there are holes, how we can plug the holes in this so as to provide the best care. Because in today's complex healthcare landscapes, patients often seek more holistic approach to the care that addresses their physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. So, integrated health, which combines the element of modern medicine with alternative and complementary medicine, 
offer a comprehensive and patient-centered approach to the healthcare that fills the crucial gaps in the traditional medical models. So, by harnessing the strengths of the multiple healing modalities, integrated health promotes collaboration, a personalized care, and improved health outcome for the patients. So that is fantastic. So what we're basically doing is bringing together all of the different modalities to answer the physical, the mental, the emotional, the spiritual, the energetic. We're looking at all of the bodies combined into one and how integrated health can help there. So Dr. Rajiv Gupta, I know we've got a very interesting project that is under wraps at the back end. Is it something that we can reveal right now or shall we do that later? Um, I think it's time to to really reveal to the people Ooh, how exciting everything is going to work together, promoting the wellness, addressing the root cause of the illness, embracing the holistic view of the health, drawing upon the traditional healing practices, and fostering the supportive healing environment. And these modalities combine more comprehensive, integrative, and patient-centered approach. And we are going to reveal also the ambassador program of the international organization of the integrated health practitioners, IOIHP as it is called, which play a vital role in advancing the mission and the goals of the integrated health program worldwide. As ambassadors of the integrated health, members of this program would serve as advocate educators and leaders in promoting the principle and practices of the integrative medicine and the healthcare within the respective communities and professional networks. And we have got galaxy of speakers you're going to perhaps introduce. They are master in the field and I'm so uh, delighted and I'm actually very um, humbled to be part of this whole program. So I think it will be a great pleasure, Riddhi, for you to unleash the whole thing and hats off to you, to Nil Kumar and the whole team of Healing Our Earth who have been doing the program for so many years and making impact on a big community in a holistic way. So back to you Riddhi. And isn't it just fascinating that the speakers that we have on board today are going to be some of the first people that are going to get a sneak peek within this program that you've introduced so well to be able to really start to work together work in a collaborative manner and see how the different disciplines can actually start to speak to each other, how we can start to actually unveil some of that today. And I'm pretty sure 15 minutes, even though we've got people engaging on our website and Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, and all of our partner channels, 15 minutes for each speaker is just not enough time. So what can we expect to see going forwards? Um, so actually, it's a very tight program, and it's in fact a sneak peek view. It's a taster session because we have got so many modalities which work together. And what we have tried to do is combine all of them so that today's program becomes the initiated program to give a sneak peek view, how Ayurveda can help, how homeopathy can help, how Chinese medicine acupuncture etc etc and there are many others so we have tried to fit what we can and then we are going to have a second follow-up program and third follow-up program and i'm so fascinated that we can give a detailed view so that going forward we will have a system and this international organization of integrated health practitioners has a potential to play the transformative role in connecting modern medicine with alternative medicine and complementary medicine by bridging the gap between the diverse approaches of the healthcare. So we have got these people here who are going to come back again to give detailed view. And the whole idea is that today we generate the interest, we stimulate people. 
Fantastic. And to stimulate people, we've also got our host, Amrita Sharma, who will be keeping a close eye on all of the different platforms to see what kind of questions are being asked. So we strongly encourage engagement. We strongly encourage interaction here as well. Be involved, ask your questions. We've got a panel of speakers around us here today that can help to answer each and every single question that we come across. And even if we may not be able to come back to you straight away, we've got the knowledge and we've got the experience between all of us here today to be able to answer those questions. So please do be involved. Feel free to just unleash and ask your questions because once you've actually got uh, your problems out there, your problems, I always say, are actually three quarters of the solution. If you can actually modify what that problem is and get really specific for us, we'll have the resources to be able to answer or at least point you in the right direction and for you to then have that clarity of thought to know that you're not alone. So strongly encourage you to get involved, ask your questions, be a part of this here today. We're here for you and we look forward to hearing your views too. And Dr. Wang, Global Namaste. Hello. Hello. Uh, Dr. Wang, you are one of the, like, I believe, uh, pioneer doing the whole academy of the acupuncture and uh, Whole Chinese medicine, but I'm thinking is that uh, you will be a very uh, added value. Uh, I don't know whether, um, I'm sorry, people are thinking I'm having this big turban because we are having a special function here of Gangur, which is a festival uh, of ladies serving their husbands and asking God. So I had to be in this attire, but uh, that will be great. So back to you, Riddhi. Fantastic. And Dr. Wang, for those of you that don't know, I'll introduce him. He is the principal of the London Academy of Chinese Acupuncture here in the UK. He is also a guest professor of Nanjing University of Chinese Medicine in China, the president of the Academy of Scalp Acupuncture in the UK, director of TJ Acupuncture Clinic and Brain Care Centre in London. He has also written a riveting book. He is the author of Springer book, Acupuncture for Brain. And no doubt he'll have the connections here between energies, between bodies and minds. So without further ado, Dr. Wang, welcome here today. Okay. And we look forward yeah. to hearing what it is that you have to share with us. Okay, thank you already. Um, let me share my screen now. Okay, uh, dear guests and uh, and the owners the, and the host, I'm uh, Professor Dr. Tianjun Wang. I'm uh, pleased to be invited by Dr. And uh, Rajiv uh, Gupta to join this Integrate Health Global Seminar and Education. And as uh, the host introduced, uh, now I'm based in London. And so today, my uh, speaker, uh, the, the of the title of How Can Acupuncture Field Gaps in Modern Medicine? And the host has already introduced my background, so I do not spend more time on this, this uh, part. So first, I'd like to start with a very briefly to introduce my PhD research, which was done about, uh, let me say, uh, 16 years ago in Nanjing University of Chinese Medicine, before I moved to the UK to join the University of East London as a senior lecturer and the acupuncture director uh, in London. I, I studied this uh, and uh, PhD research, including this clinical uh, trial. And later on, I published this, my study on the journal called Acupuncture in Medicine, which is the sister journal, uh, partly from the BMJ. The, my study called Acupuncture Combined with an Antidepressant for Patients with Depression in Hospital, a Pragmatic Randomized Controlled Trial. And very briefly introduce this uh, this research. Um, it's one of the earliest uh, RCT research to indicate acupuncture 
particularly some special and acupuncture, brain acupuncture, can fill a gap and for the West medicine treatment for depression, such as it can quick the onset of the antibiotic. It can reduce the side effects of antibiotic. It can increase the successful rate for the patients suffering for the depression in hospital. So that's a very briefly introduced by uh, PhD research. And as the host introduced, uh, and based on my previous 30 years uh, experiences in clinical education and research, uh, working together with Springer, as you know, the world famous uh, uh, publisher, I published my uh, English book called Acupuncture for Brain, Treatment for Neurological and uh, Psychological Disorders. Uh, this book was published in December 2020. The, this book, it's a, uh, the, or I say it's the uh, the first book in the Western countries to systematically introduce the uh, Chinese medicine acupuncture brain theory, such as the part one of this book introduced the acupuncture for brain theory research and the techniques such as scap acupuncture, dao qi learning, etc. Then the part two of this book uh, has introduced uh, some of the commonly seen neurological and psychological conditions, such as stroke, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and other dementia, multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury, autism, uh, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, headache, pain with neurological disorders, and also some sample mental disorders, such as depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, and uh, post-trauma stress disorder, insomnia, substance abuse, etc. We all uh, noticed the moment in the UK or even the many of the Western uh, countries, acupuncture is not covered in the mainstream medicine, such as in the UK, the NHS. Acupuncture in NHS, the moment the NHS uh, the guidance of the NICE only recommends considering acupuncture as a treatment option for only for chronic pain, chronic tension type headache, um, and migraine. And also acupuncture is also often used to treat other muscular skeletal conditions and the pain conditions, including joint pain, etc. And on the NHS website, they mentioned acupuncture is sometimes available on the NHS, most often from GP surgeries or uh, physiotherapy along access is limited. It is true. Um, I used to work in one NHS hospital uh, once uh, one half day a week in the uh, North Essex the hospital as a pain clinic. It was only maximum 12 patients per half three hours, but the waiting list is at least six months. You can imagine. And let's review the, and the nice guidance. You know, the, um, there, are, there are hundreds of thousands of light guidance. Now, on the nice guidance, if they say yes, only these three chronic pain, uh, such as acupuncture recommend or option chronic pain, acupuncture sometimes used for migraine, headache, or some other condition, they say it's mixed or questions, such as uh, a pelvic uh, golden pain, lower back pain, side. But most of other conditions, they, 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 they say no for acupuncture. Let's briefly review this guidance, uh, such as the nice guidance uh, for acupuncture with mixed, they say the pelvic girdle pain, lower back pain, sciatic, uh, alcohol misuse, uh, sub substances misuse, uh, animated uh, heart burning, cancerous uh, birds, uh, intrapartial care of health women and uh, babies, and uh, in the attic of the appearance, etc. For these conditions, uh, for the garden, say it's a mixed evidence. But uh, nice do not offer acupuncture for most of the garden, including some of the conditions are quite commonly uh, treated or benefit from acupuncture, such as dementia, eating disorder, 
induction of label IBS and, uh, and the arthritis uh, uh, and the depression, etc. Such as last one. There are some evidence for acupuncture effective and cost effective for the combination of acupuncture and the antibiotics, which is, as you know, this is partly of my the, uh, PhD research. But the committee was aware this evidence was based on Chinese acupuncture, which is different to Western acupuncture. And so this result may not be applied to the UK population. So we can understand that uh, we, we are in the UK. The Chinese acupuncture is very, very widely practiced in the UK and many, many other Western countries. But the NICE only accept Western acupuncture. So that is a tricky question. So that means the UK, the depression patient um, are very, very unlikely to receive this effective treatment. And of course, the mention about the chronic pain, but the acupuncture said it's recommended as an option. But the, the this recommend, the, they said it delivered by a community setting, delivered by the bond seven, and also no more than five hours of healthcare professional time. And the, the mentioned also about the lower cost. So even the accept acupuncture, mm, Mm, accept the acupuncture for chronic pain, uh, primary or secondary, but there are many, many uh, limited priority problems. So in the moment in Asian system, acupuncture is still not recommended or commonly used by NHS to acupuncture. Yeah, the, the reason the acupuncture for chronic pain, the committee make a recommendation of these uh, slides. And also they mentioned the, the headache and the diagnosis medic they said if both uh, top remote and the prolapse law are unsuitable or infective, they may recommend for acupuncture for chronic pain. Yeah, and uh, based on so far the evidence, I will say, uh, we very briefly summary, acupuncture may have central, local and uh, principal effects from clinical. So acupuncture involves the stimulation of echo points, which are located as specific sites of the human body by insertion of a fine metal needles followed by meditation. Yeah, okay, so acupuncture has been proven to be an effective treatment in pain relief. That is very, very uh, the clinically effective. And, avail and uh, available evidence showed that acupuncture elevated the acute pain in conditions such as uh, uh, post-operation pain, acute back pain, lumbar pain, primary uh, dysmenorrhea, tension type headache, and migraine. In addition, acupuncture release chronic pains, such as uh, lower back pain, knee arthritis, headache, shoulder pain, and neck pain as well. So that should have uh, the central local and the principal effects. Yeah. And uh, unst uh, the understanding of uh, acupuncture application and the mechanism there are many, as you know, they can work through the ATP and the tran transcendent receptor. They can work through the central nerve system, the neurotransmissions, including uh, opiates, uh, serotonin, uh, non represent etc. And acupuncture can reduce the effect of the positive and negative reinforcement by modulating uh, dopamine release the uh, nucleus accumulate, etc. So this is a very uh, and, uh, briefly the, uh, and the illustration or imaging to, ex to explain after the acupuncture insert in certain points, they may go through multi systems to help the, uh, the body system to release help, such as including the anti-inflammation system they can walk in from the HPA access. They can walk walking from the central system. They can walk in from the ACTH. They can walk in the immune system. They can walk in through the uh, vigorous nerve system. They can walk in through the, uh, the, uh, the hormone system, uh, systematic nerve system, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd like to share some very uh, recently, case a uh, very brief case for indicate acupuncture main field gap, uh, such as 
I help, uh, I used to help a very severe case. She, uh, he's suffering from brainstem hemorrhage. Uh, he, he was in coma for five weeks in the Queen Hospital in Rumford, London, in ICU. He was, uh, uh, his uh, classical coma scale, GCS was five. After a long story, uh, luckily the family found me, contact me, contact me, invite me to the hospital, uh, Queen Hospital in London to help this guy. Uh, unfortunately, the hospital say, at the beginning say no, because I'm not a registered doctor in the UK. I was a doctor in China. Um, but finally, after lots of argument, uh, they accepted my acupuncture in the hospital in ICU. I used an acupuncture, particularly called brain acupuncture, including scalp acupuncture, etc. After in totally 14 sessions, he wake up. He wake up, he came awareness for his wife and his three children. Yeah, it's a successful case. And I published this case study on the journal called Acute to uh, introduce the, for the uh, colleagues. Acupuncture may help much more patients, not only just pain, for even including very severe cases, including stroke, including the other of the neurological diseases. And also, and uh, I treat this, uh, this guy suffering from the brainstem infection. Uh, he, his wife drove him from South Southampton uh, in return about eight hours to my clinic in London. Uh, finally, he was completely uh, recovered. We say 95 recovered for his stroke, his vomiting, dizziness, balance disorder, double vision, et cetera, all fully recovered. Yeah. And uh, I published uh, a paper uh, to discussion about acupuncture of stroke uh, in a uh, research conference. And, uh, uh, and this is absolutely amazing, Dr. Wang. Thank you so much for sharing with us the effects yes. of acupuncture and yes. the case uh, um, summaries as well. It's been really useful. Do hang around because we're going to come back to you very shortly for a group panel discussion. And we can see a lovely summary from yourself on screen at the moment as well. Absolutely amazing. Hang around. We'll be back with you shortly. Okay, thank you. Thank you thank very much. You. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. And next, we'd like to welcome on screen Dr. Wai Ching, who is an absolutely phenomenal woman. She does a lot of work with energy healing. She is a medical intuitive healer, qualified holistic health counselor, holistic bodywork therapist, and collaborating with medical doctors in the field of integrative medicine since 1992. Wow, what a phenomenal woman. She works with health and medical advisory board of Nature's Frequencies, Energy of Vibrational Medicine, and Quantum of Qigong, where art and music movement therapies are integrated for creative and therapeutic expressions, rejuvenation of both spirit and body, holistic nutrition, and applied kinesiology. Welcome, a global namaste, Dr. Wai Ching. It's great to have you with us here again. Please take over, the next 15 minutes are yours. Thank you so much. Global namaste to everyone. And Dr. Rajiv, you look splendid. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And all these colors uh, that are here now, that, that's all part of chromotherapy as well. So uh, thank you for inviting me on again. It's been a while and um, I'll be speaking about bridging the gaps with uh, traditional Chinese medicine and the modern medicine. So if I may share my screen, let's see, then I can just proceed with, with that. Okay, uh, uh, Riddhi, could I share please? Uh, it says host only. Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, wonderful. So here we are. I'll sh okay, share screen. Excellent. Can you can you see that? You can see your screen. Yes. Beautiful. Okay. So what I've been asked to do is to fill in the gaps to actually build. Let me see how I'm trying to to uh, erase this. Uh, whoops. One second. I think I might have. To 
I think I've included who can share. Uh... Go ahead, Weiching. We can see your screen. Yes, but you know, it's blocked because can you see that who can share? We can uh... see the human physical substrate screen. Okay. All see right. All of your screens. Go ahead. Your uh, slides. Okay. All right. So. You see the title there, Ancient Wisdom, Sacred Science, and we're translating traditional Chinese medicine into quantum medicine. And so this is just bridging the gaps on how we can uh, translate uh, ancient wisdom and uh, traditional Chinese medicine. And I'm following Professor Wang in seeing how we can do that. But let's go through first the subtle and dense anatomy structures of the human body. So, and it's a bioenergetic model of our multidimensional cells. So here we have the human physical substrate. That's us in this matrix and our flesh and blood and lymph and all the physical wonderment that we are in this temple of the soul. Now, as we go through this, we are also a beautiful network of uh, circulatory, pulmonary, sympathetic, and parasympathetic nervous and lymphatic systems. And it's just a network. It's all going through the fascia, which is this beautiful like skin, uh, translucent skin uh, around the musculature of our bodies. But more than that, we are energy beings. We This is a schematic of the Tantian and Meridian system and the chakric and Nadi systems in the systems of the Vedas. And in the Western languaging, it's called the auric or organ field and uh, along the fascia. So remember the meridians and these energy systems run through this very thin layer. It's called the interstitial um, fluids of the body in between the cells and outside the cells and in the cells, actually. Now, beyond that, we are this beautiful etheric light lattice. And here we have what we recognize as the centers of consciousness, the chakras. And so they correspond with the endocrine glands as well as our consciousness, our states of being the lower one, being uh, connected with our security, money, and um physical wellness. And then as we go up, we have our physical selves that is connected with our personalities and also with each other. And as we go further up, there's also the connection with the heart, our emotional being, and further up, our throat expression of ourselves in both speech as well as movement and in our expressive healing arts. And then as we go further up, there's the mental body, but beyond that, there's also intuition. And beyond that is the connection with the soul. Now, here we go and we look. This is the connection. This is who we are. Isn't it beautiful? Our soul matrix configuration in a series of spirals and figure eights. That's who we are. Beyond when we sleep and beyond when we die, when we pass on to the other realms, Beyond when we, the sutratma is the, the silken cord that holds us to our physical temple is still holding on when we are asleep, but when it releases completely, when we go back to the light. And this is who we are. And I'm going to illustrate, right, as I translate TCM into the quantum science. Now, bear in mind this yin-yang. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this. And so you see the, the, the very iconic yin-yang symbol. That's the dark and the light sides of um, the symbol, each one punctuated with the another circle. Now, if you look very carefully, they're actually a whole series. Our cellular structure is made up of the whole series of yin yangs. And we are actually constantly changing. And that is the only um, permanence. Impermanence is change. And so we are always doing this vibratory changes. And just keep that in mind as we talk about the DNA and the spins of all the energy systems within our body. We're actually spinning, spiraling vortices of energy, chi within the human body, including the DNA. 
and they spin clockwise and declockwise. And as I mentioned earlier and showed that the wheels of consciousness, the chakras, and the, these are called the three treasures, the sanbao in TCM, which reflect the upper, the middle, and lower tantians. So in the Western terminology, it's the torus forming the toroidal feel. So this kind of... Uh, of uh, understanding will help us to understand how we can fill the gaps and the gaps that are in, let's see, the gaps that are within the cellular structures themselves in our consciousness and how we take it out into the world. Once again, let's look at the Chinese cosmology and the quantum field. So first there is the Tao, is the illimitable, the void, and that's all there is. And it is known as the quantum field. So why is it known as the quantum field? If you look further down, the quantum is the black hole and the black hole. And that's what is known where there's a vacuum. It's a vacuum of nothingness and a vacuum of human potential, of full potentiality. So of nothingness and full potentiality. And that is the paradox. It exists within the same time. And if we can tap into the quantum field, we are able to tap into the healing into ourselves. So keep that in mind again. That's why we showed the physical substrate and how to pull in this energy, this prana, if you will. And then we go into what is known as the tai chi. The tai chi is when you separate into dark and light, masculine, feminine, Shiva, Shakti. And this is where... We then have uh, the Sutratma into the Ida Pingala and then into the Nadis and the Mama points. So as we come down, as we, we download ourselves, our souls into our physical substrate, this is how we become our mortal selves. And then it explains itself in Bagua. The, it's Bagua is eight sides. And so we continuously move into these hexagrams and trigrams of the I Ching, the Book of Changes. And this is where we find that there's a binary code. So these are codes of the universe. If you see the lines, the broken lines and the straight lines, they represent the codes. And it's been shown in science that the whole universe is codes. And so when we download our soul codes, we actually download them into our cells, into our consciousness, into our realities, into who we are incarnated this lifetime. So you're starting to see the connection, the gaps. And it's actually the gap is a good word because it's the, the space in between, which is powerful. And if we can tap into that, then we are able to um, basically transmit chi. And this is a thermography of Dr. John uh, Rogerson and myself. And this is a, it's capturing the energy. This is using modern technology again. So I'm going to show how in the past we would just trust how we feel, right? And how we feel in energy. And the gap then is now showing it and being able to capture the different areas of chi and prana inside and outside our bodies. And if this is in a moving state, you can see that it actually moves. Now, this also explains our emotional states, the quantum DNA evolution and the wave of us, ourselves as a matrix of light. And if we are in fear, look how contracted we are. If we're in love, we expand. We expand the toroidal field. And this is how the Western world would explain our chi body and the pranic field so and this is the infinity quantum qigong which is what i founded and it was based on the understanding of the figure eights in the body and how energy moves in waves and not in linear forms and how it can be useful in the world of healing or therapeutic qigong or medical qigong is the the understanding of qi now, the understanding of chi or prana is holding the basis of energy medicine in the Western allopathic world of medicine. And it's also going into the field of quantum or frequency medicine, that how is it possible that through acupuncture that we are able to create physical changes? So that is, again, another gap that is closing. And as you can see, we can do um, a lot of changes in the physical realm. 
So this is just a description on how it is um, effective in the figure eight. Now let's go into another gap that is closing. That's the understanding of um, the earth. And in Qigong, we practice staying in the center of the earth um, the, the, on the ground, and it's called earthing. But it's also based on the 7.83 hertz, the Schumann's resonance. And we have even technologies that are called earthing cards that can help us if we are not earthing enough, we can hold it to us. So that is a frequency device that is free flowing. It's not attached to any electrical um, outlet, but it is constantly creating energy the same way that our bodies are constantly creating energy if we know the techniques. Now, the techniques are based on spiral energy, just like water. So if we can know how to spin our chakras, how to spin the spirals in our bodies and the figure eights, we can change the DNA. And we have done that. These are known as miracle healings in Qigong. Yeah, I'll constantly go back to Qigong because we're discussing TCM. The same in acupuncture. And so um, I'm known here to modernize the ancient healing arts into uh, scientific information. This is not too scientific at the moment. But just as an example of what can happen is that we have overnight disappearance of growth, let's say on the shoulder. And this is Bharat Chopra, the nephew of Deepak Chopra. I'm sure this name is very familiar to all, all of you. And so we can even clear any kind of um, addictive conditions. This is 52 years of smoking, uh, cleared in one session with Dr. Deepak Whitmer, who is actually the astrolog astrologer to Osho. So we can do a lot within uh, using the, the premise of energy techniques, if we understand what we're doing. So for example, the physical condition, long distance even of healing of eyes. So this client said that her ophthalmologist told her that a condition will be healed in three months. We did it in one session, long distance. So let's look at some of the terminology bridges that it actually happens. Earlier, we, we saw the earth, we saw 7.83 hertz, and we, we hear of rooting and grounding in the Qigong practice right? Energy practice. Qi gong simply means energy cultivation practice. And so earthing, and many people have actually started to buy earthing pads and earthing uh, products and so on. And the earthing pads is electrical, actually. And so instead of that, we can go to the earth, we can go to the beach and sand and just put our feet on the ground and breathe and then send energy, our intention, our E to the earth. And that's another um, terminology that has come to the fore in modern terminology. E, intenting and intention. Energy follows intention. So let's look at another thing, uh, terminology that has come about. EFT, emotional freedom technique. If some of you are uh, accustomed to that, it's called tapping. But it's based on Taoism. And now in practice is after the practice of Qigong, we tap into our bodies to release or to energize. So that is another one to keep in mind that it, we already are closing the gaps. So there's something called ASMR, which is very popular at the moment. But what it stands for is Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. Now look at the words meridian. We go back to the TCM. And these are just uh, signals and triggers that really help a relaxation response. And it helps especially in sleep and, um, and sleep apnea, which then would include uh, the breathing techniques. So here we are. Remember how it's already connected through the languaging. Now, there's sonic healing sound healing with uh, crystals and uh, crystal bowls, brass bowls, and also uh, based on the voice, the mantra, all right? And so then in traditional Chinese, there's the six healing sounds. And now they are known into frequency healing with sounds. And um, they have been identified as 432 hertz, 528 hertz, and triple one hertz, and various different hertz of different frequencies and sounds that go into solfagio tones and binaural beats uh, in scientific terms that comes from the even the word om, 
right? And uh, how it is uh, representative of the universal codes and the universal sounds of Genesis, the beginning. So that is being translated as well. Uh, and there's breathwork, there's holotropic breathwork by Stanislav Groth, for example, and including my own, the infinity breathwork, but it's all based on pranayama. It's based on just basic breathwork. And so this is um, a, a very basic and we're going back to basics. Now, we, I talked about a little bit about acupuncture, but we don't really need the needles. Of course, it has its very precise science and art of acupuncture, but we can use our fingers and transmitting energy through the fingers and using the art of acupressure. Now, even if we don't know uh, how it works, even sometimes when we massage ourselves, we know where the trigger points are. That's another trick, terminology, trigger points, and it's based on acupuncture points. And so we know that how to release energy or disperse energy. And there are now also laser lights, there are electrodes, and even little needles that you can rub against the skin, like a micro needling almost, to activate the chi. Uh, just underneath the skin. And these are little devices that one can use. And there's also this uh, iTeraCare wand that's based on terahertz and it's based on qi frequency. It's um, been identified by a scientist in China and this product is made in Malaysia and it's taking the Western world, UK, US, Australia by storm. And because it's so effective, it's like having your own chi healer with you all the time. And it includes heat and we'll discuss thermal because that's an ancient way of healing as well but through moxibustion, uh, through uh, yin yang baths, that's hot and cold baths as well. And um, we have also what is known as lifestyle medicine. We're looking at terminology. Now, what is that? Basic common sense medicine, right? And it's according to natural uh, cycles, like going back to basics, really, you no know, sleep cycles, uh, eating habits, and breathing and going out to nature. If we just do this, well, generally, we can be very healthy uh, on a normal uh, basis. That's so the point why Ching is so important that the whole lifestyle medicine is kind of taking shape and more and more attention being paid. And you are so beautifully putting everything together right from the home to the acupuncture so neck healing and lifestyle medicine it's just amazing to hear it all i'm just thinking that we can kind of bring it all together through some more panel um, if that makes sense and then yeah. uh, that will be fantastic so um i uh, i'm thinking is that uh I don't know if Dr. Wang is here together and then you together kind of deal with this. So what is the important message uh, you have kind of elaborated so much? How would you really think people should do or change the thinking? And what are like three bullet points from your point of view? It's so amazing to hear this all. But for me, I would think just going back to basics, going back to the breath and movement of the body, somatic movement. Yes, somatic movement is another buzzword now. It simply means intelligence of the body, that we have time to meditate, you know, go through, find meditation as medication and to reflect on ourselves, who we are, who are we, the eternal question. And, and that's really important because once we know that, we are comfortable in any situation and we're able to handle everything. And the the body is, people say, self-healing. If we can, I mean, with all things remaining equal, that it is actually regenerative. And we know those techniques. And so the three things, it's that. And also then the energy input. It could be food, as I was going to look at curative cuisine or holistic nutrition, is to know what suits us, our constitution, our doshas. And so it, it's like basic. So you ask for three points. These are what I feel would be the most basic of health. Uh, Wai Ching, just before you carry on, can you switch off your screen share so we can have all the people spotlight? If you could just switch off your screen square. Thank you. Over to you, Rajiv, Riddhi, and everybody. It's such a beautiful uh, 
kind of summarization. In fact, I'm I'm feeling like um, you have actually brought East and West together in a very holistic way. And within that, the Far East, the, the Far East, have, I personally think, has been a pioneer in the medicine, which is like Chinese medicine and Indian medicine, like Ayurveda um, and the, the yoga. And then, as you mentioned, yin and yang, together building into the modern medicine. So can we just think uh, briefly about the gaps in the modern medicine and particularly the chronic pain? Uh, how would you think that that is so important to bring it together? So we've got a beautiful panel here. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Lalit Sola, we've got Dr. Wang, we got Dr. Why change so fast, uh, Dr. Wang? What do you think? How your philosophy and uh, this integration, filling the gaps, particularly in chronic pain, would work? Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajit. Um, based on my knowledge, I I think there are uh, sufficient uh, evidence to support and uh, acupuncture Chinese medicine uh, can help to fill in the gap. Um, but unfortunately, the uh, uh, the awareness public, well, not only for public, but also for the medical society, are still very limited. So I think this is a good opportunity for this seminar or this conference to uh, post for public awareness about this important alternative medicine to involve in the NHS system. Or and we said you involved for the uh, mainstream medicine and to and to enhance this kind of the natural therapy, natural medicine to provide the uh, public and and uh, the patients with the chronic pain relief with the natural way with less of the side effects and most uh, more uh, effective for everybody. Thank you. Perfect. We also got Sanjeeva Gupta. Uh, who is a pain consultant, so managing chronic pain uh, from the modern medicine point of view is his all day job, 365 days or whatever days he works. So he's so immersed into it, let's hear his reaction. So what do you think are the, you know, the methods in the, in the modern medicine and the gaps and do you buy into the philosophy that we can bring other modalities to help chronic pain? Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, just introduce myself. Uh, I'm a pain specialist. I do both acute and chronic pain. Um, and that's what I've been doing for the last uh, uh, 25 years or so. Uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be with you all. And I know Rajiv has taken a lot of initiative in organizing these meetings. Um, I, I certainly feel that, uh, uh, I don't know what why we call it modern medicine. <laughs> <laughs> I think you get my point what I'm trying to say exactly uh, uh, I, I think the Eastern medicine are probably uh, more embedded and more uh, 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 modern and more effective in certain conditions rather than uh, the modern medicine what we call with all its associated side effects. Uh, 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 and everything else. But however, I think both the Eastern and Western medicine uh, can complement each other significantly uh, in any pain conditions, uh, uh, particularly so in uh, chronic pain conditions. Uh, uh, in my practice, like uh, I, I, I tell patients, anything that helps grab it, because if there's one treatment for any condition, there'll be only, only one treatment. Human body is so varied, so any treatment is always welcome if it helps and doesn't cause harm. And uh, the very simple way I put it to our patients is, uh, say for example, if you're using acupuncture, if it helps you, grab it. If you're using, say, Ayurvedic treatment or herbal medicine or, uh, say, uh, 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 mindfulness medicine, I'll call mindfulness also as medicine actually, mindfulness medicine, yoga, meditation, whatever you call it, if it's used in a context of disease, it becomes probably therapeutic and medicine. It could be anything, just talking. Yeah. Uh, so, so in my opinion, 
uh, when I tell when I talk to the patients about managing uh, or uh, trying to see how we can alleviate uh, the, the the chronic pain conditions, I give them a metaphor which makes it very easy. I'm sure you'll love it. What I tell them is, say for example, if a patient comes to my clinic, they will have physiotherapy. The physiotherapist do acupuncture uh, services, so they will look at that if they can uh, provide that. They will have had heat application or cold application. Yeah. Then uh, they will have had a tense machine probably. Yeah. Or we'll advise them. And uh, uh, understanding about pain is therapeutic. Knowing what pain is. Yeah. They're not trying to sort of uh, cheat us. They're trying to be realistic and uh, their pain is real. Accepting that is most important for us as physicians uh, uh, or, or any therapy, therapist. Uh, education is so important. Then we come to pharmacology, where we can look at paracetamol, anti-inflammatories, opioids, strong opioids, and all uh, the light drugs. And if the patients have neuropathic pain, we look at anti-neuropathic pain medications like amitriptyline or nortriptyline. Then we move on to gabapentinoids and other medications that can be used for chronic uh, neuropathic pain conditions. And then we come at interventions and then surgery. Yeah. And... Uh, sorry, I was just thinking that uh, it will be good to see Dr. Landit Soda deals with uh, uh, all chronic pain also all the time, um, like uh, he's a chiropractic uh, expert. So uh, let's see his reaction. Rajiv, before we go to Dr. Lalit Soda, there is a question for Dr. Tianjun. Uh, Stelios from Cyprus is asking, are there any side effects and risks of acupuncture? Over to you, Dr. Taijun. Okay, <laughs> this is a very good question. I, is this, I would say this is also a very uh, common and uh, public awareness about acupuncture. Uh, they are, they are, uh, some of them, they are worried about any possible ha harm or uh, side effects for acupuncture. I would say, after any formal training or education of our acupuncture in a college or a school, acupuncture is much more than safe than any other, uh, in, in many of the other we, we call the modern medicine. Thank so, you. Thank you, Dr. Taiting. Stelios, it is safe. Go ahead and go and see an expert. Over to you, Dr. Lali Soda, our resident host and reporter. Say hello to Wai Ching in Indonesia and Rajiv and also uh, Dr. Sanjiva who are also in a pain management. Over to you, Dr. Lalit Soda. A global namaste to this wonderful Healing Our Earth family. How are we all? A thumbs up. Brilliant, brilliant. This is an outstanding discussion. Yeah, I can see Wai Ching being super excited on the Easter break. Thank you very much for that. Um, Dr. Yeah. Sajima, I know uh, your conversation uh, was obviously then put forward with a question but I loved your discussion on how you, anything that's available to heal with pain, whether it's uh, what we call modern medicine or mainstream medicine, or whether we call it complementary or alternative care that a lot of us are practicing. I think with chronic pain, there is so much one can do. It's unfortunate that people do suffer chronic pain. It is a genuine and a real condition. It is not all in the mind, so it has to be dealt with. And obviously there are so many, many more ways to deal with it than just mainstream medicine, as I would call it, mainstream and alternative or complementary. And what Dr. Sanjeeva was talking about was about the first route of either painkillers, anti-inflammatories, uh, some form of physical therapy, uh, maybe uh, intervention with cortisone injections or pain relieving injections, and then obviously, if the condition is one such that may require surgery. But uh, looking at that aspect of pain management in chronic pain, and also from the alternative aspects, like our wonderful Professor Tai Jun and uh, Dr. Wai Ching and the others who are on the panel over here, and myself, including practicing alternative care, Dr. Rajiv Gupta also. So really... Uh, I personally feel from a complementary or an alternative care practitioner, I'm a chiropractor by, by profession, and dealing with pain is absolutely vital that both um, modern medicine, uh, East and Western work together because there is limitations to both. 
because uh, alternative like acupuncture, chiropractic, uh, homeopathy, Ayurveda, all the breathing techniques that uh, Dr. Weiching has been talking about, we all can practice that, but every practice, including modern medicine, has its limitation. When the two practices are combined, I feel, there is a huge and a significant milestone that is achieved. And what's very interesting is in this modern day, a lot of uh, the old folk, as I may call them, the doctors, the GPs, the medical profession, who, who were thinking the olden fashion that medicine is the only way and no other way. They're changing their perspective. There's so much more research that is out there with complementary care, with Ayurveda, acupuncture, breathing, yoga, chiropractic, osteopathy, that there is a lot of science-based validation to how these therapies can help patients. So I feel chronic pain can be managed in a very, very nice way if both the medicines can work together. That's my opinion. Uh, can I complete my metaphor, Rajiv? Yes, yes, Dr. Sanjeev, I was waiting for you to I, say I think, I think, I think the, you, you love this. That's why I was trying to build to that. Yes. <laughs> so I told that pain or any, any condition for that matter, actually, you know, it, this, this particular metaphor will not apply to just pain. Anything that you, you try to synergize uh, multiple modalities, that this can be used and if it's very common. So I tell them uh, in our uh, language uh, that if you eat chili, it is chili. Too much chili will give side effects. Yeah. Too much, any 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 form of too much therapy will give you side effects. Yeah. Pepper is pepper, salt is salt, another spice, you mix anything. Yeah. If you mix all these spices in the right quantities, it becomes a curry. <laughs> I love it. So, what I tell the patients, each spice, in addition to having its own effect, has enhanced the other spice as well. So, like that. You, the number of spices you're going to use depends upon your condition, the intensity of pain and everything else. So start with the simple thing, understand your pain, then physiotherapy. If there is provision for acupuncture, Ayurveda, homeopathy, you can try that. Yeah, they're, they're compared to less harm, very practically no harm actually, in a way, if it's, it's done uh, rightly. Then you go on to transmission, heat therapy, whatever it is. Then you move on to pharmacology. Yeah, in the pharmacology, use a simple one, like start with paracetamol, then consider anti-inflammatories if there are no contraindications, then move on from that side. Then you come to intervention surgery at the end. So most of the patients can manage, once they understand the concept of synergism, like two plus two need not be four, it can be six or seven or eight, provided you use that properly, the, uh, what you're using. So once they understand, in my opinion, they can manage, it, 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 it empowers them to manage things themselves. So they, they can manage, self-manage very well once they understand this concept. And not only that, once you spend little, all this takes time, unfortunately, once you, once that patient understands, he becomes your ambassador in the community. Okay. Yeah, he becomes your ambassador in the community and he will tell others also in the right way, of course, in the safe way that, yeah, this has happened. You can try this, 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 this. So, and uh, patients just love the concept. <laughs> I'm done now. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very, very true. If you put all the masalas in the right proportion, then the, the final product is obviously the most delicious one you can get and enjoying it. So like yeah. health, I think with health, it's not just the one way. It's not the one way or the highway. I think all the tributaries, all the branches come and make that, that, that human body function better because human body can be dealt with the mind, the body and the soul. We have to break it down into three. All those three things need nourishment before we can say we are optimally healthy. And what is optimum health? Optimum health for others can be, oh, I'm pain-free. And optimum health with somebody else could be, hey, look, I'm pain-free and flexible and jumping jack. And somebody will say, hey, look, I'm happy, healthy, well, and eating. Like health is composed of so many things. So yes, well, you're right, Dr. Sanjeeva. It's not just the one that will do it. I think it's a combination of everything. Lalit. Make a before we proceed, uh, Wai Ching has got a comment. Wai Ching, before you make your comment, Joseph from South Africa is asking a very relevant question, which others are asking as well. And since we've got Sanjeeva here, you here, Wai Ching, and uh, uh, Dr. Tai Jr., he's asking a very simple question. If the pain management is not a threatening medical condition, 
Should one accustom their body to manage the pain without medicines? Before we answer that, Wai Ching, your comment, your one minute answer to that, and we will go around the panel. Wai Ching, over to you. I will yeah. do both. I will. You can, you might have a, a roundabout, and then I uh, think uh, we have Dr. Rakesh Sharma ready, so we quickly finish and get him. Uh, he is the president of the uh, Association of the Commissioning Body, which is the Board of Ethics and Registration of So, he is not here presently. As soon as he comes, we'll bring him in the front. Okay. So, it might be the iPhone one. I don't know. I will ask him. But yes, let's check. Let's do a round back a discussion that will just end in like probably one minute. So one sentence from each, please. Okay, I will start because I need to comment. <laughs> it's been like I'll comment, answer the question, and comment on nourishment of the soul and body. We haven't talked about food and inflammation and pain because it's also no important to know what not to eat. Like curcumin is amazing for reducing pain, inflammation, and also what not to eat. Like inflammatory foods like wheat, sugar, milk. So that's a very important for certain people. So that's the my comment. Very quickly, that's it. Oh, Mr. Sanjeev, do you want to go next? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the, to answer the question, uh, the way I put it to my patients is, if they say I don't want to take tablets, then I tell them, look at the side effects of pain. Pain also has side effects. Yeah, it decreases your mobility. It makes you immobile. That means your deconditioning. It affects your psychology. Yeah, you get angry with everybody around. So what are the side effects of pain? And look at the side effects of the medication and balance it out. That's what I tell my patients. Just one comment about psychology. I didn't mention about that. Psychology is a very big thing. And it's there is a taboo attached to it. People don't accept it very easily. So the way I put them to is, psychology is like physiotherapy for the mind. Uh, if you go, if you have musculoskeletal pain, you go to a physiotherapist. Like that, psychology talking therapy is physiotherapy for the mind. It makes them a little more acceptable, and they'll try to accept it better. I'm finished. Thank you, Doctor Wang. Your comment, please. I think you're on mute. <laughs> okay, so very quickly comment. Yeah, uh, I agree with the uh, we Ching, uh, the importance of the food, and also we, I agree with the doctor uh, Sajiv uh, Gupta uh, for the pain has lots of side effects as well. So we need to try to uh, combine the, of this both side. We of course we if necessary we need therapy, whatever techniques, acupuncture, uh, food therapy, and also most important for our daily life such as positive thinking, such as the, uh, the outdoor exercises, such as the meditation, Qigong, Tai Chi as well. Thank you. And last but not least, our resident chiropractor, what are your thoughts on how to bring together the physical and the energetic body by actually lifting our prana, by increasing our energy? Does it have an impact on physical health? Absolutely does, really. I think uh, health is a whole health. The body is the whole. You can't no. just look at it from no. one aspect. No. And as, as Dr. Sanjeeva also said, and, and the other wonderful uh, guests have spoken about how important it is to combine all health. Pain has side effects. Medicine has side effects. Which one do you want to weigh? Do you want to lead a pain-free life? or a life full of difficulties? Do you want to age gracefully or do you want to age in pain? A question that one can answer for themselves, do you want to live with pain or do you want to do something about it so you can enjoy life? I think the bottom root is, what does the one individual want? There's a lot out there and a lot of pain can be managed in a nice way. So the question is, how do you want to age? Age gracefully or age painfully? Perfect. So doesn't that just go with the motto in your clinic as well, which is the choice is always with the patient. It's for the patient to choose which kind of life they want to live. And we've also got our CEO here as well, Mr. Neil Kumar. What are your thoughts? Um, uh, really fantastic. And uh, Lalit, this was so useful. Joseph is very pleased because we have succinctly answered that question. We also got a very eminent doctor here, Dr. Rakesh Sharma. 
Dr. Sharma, can you try to put your video landscape and we will be attending to you in a moment. If you just flip your camera to landscape so we can have a full thing. Uh, Riti, go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Rakesh Sharma and let's carry on. Fantastic. So Dr. Rakesh Sharma is a president. He is the Board of Ethics and Registration for Indian Systems of Medicine under the National Commission for Indian System of Medicine, Government of India. He is also part of the Ministry of Ayush, a retired director, Government of Punjab Health Systems Corporation, ex-chairman, Board of Ayurvedic and Unani Systems of Medicine and Punjab, clearly wearing multiple hats and practicing multiple disciplines. Rakesh Verma has also served as chairman of State Drug Licensing Authority Advisory Committee, vice chairman. He is also part of the Punjab State Faculty of Ayurvedic and Unani Systems and Unani Systems. He is the director of Herbal Health Research Consortium Private Limited and member secretary state medicinal plants board. He has had 22 years of teaching experience and 36 years of clinical experience. He is retired from the government of Punjab after serving as director Ayurveda for 12 years. A global namaste and welcome to Dr. Rakesh Sharma. It's wonderful to see you, uh, Rakesh ji. You have got such a immense experience and we would love to hear from you how you think Ayurveda can work with the modern medicine. And you have other branches as well, Yunani, Siddha, etc. So please uh, share your ideas, what you think, how it can work together. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv ji. Uh, as such, Ayurveda is a uh, Indian system of medicine, including in the Indian system of medicine. And uh, uh, we have the specifically uh, our principles for the treatment. Just now I was listening uh, regarding main uh, pain management. Uh, as per Ayurveda texts, there are so many medicines to uh, treat pain manage, pain. Pain in uh, joints, pain through arthritis, pain is a, I can say, very, uh, uh, very, uh, very crucial uh, time and uh, patient go for the emergencies, for emergency treatment. But uh, uh, when a patient come in Ayurveda, treat, come for Ayurveda treatment, uh, I will give an example. We say osteoarthritis, Sandhi Gatavat. There is a Svedanam and there are specific Kadhas, decoctions. And uh, there are some tablet which is called Singhnath Google, Yograj Google. And uh, a specific line of treatment is mentioned by our Asian text for the pain management of joint pains. Like this, there are so many exercises mentioned in uh, Ayurveda, which comes under yoga also, and uh, so many therapies, which, is, which are the natural therapies, which we can say that is a naturopathy. And this is a part of Ayush system through uh, any for any disease. There are specifically uh, diet for the patients which can cure the disease. There is a uh, specific some uh, exercises and uh, some uh, discipline habits which can cure the disease and some common medicines, common herbs, and which we can say the single herbs which can cure the disease, compound herbs which can cure the disease, and then 
our specifically rasha oshadis rasha oshadis means which medicines are prepared by the uh, metals that is called ash bhasmas with that also we can cure the uh, pain and other diseases like that we we have the uh, panchakarma treatment in ayurveda very uh, very much explained in ayurveda text panchakarma treatment for pain for pain in ayurveda uh, we will uh, we uh, first we diagnose that uh, which uh, dosh is prominent because pain is always by the vata dosha it is a basic principle of pain without vata dosha there will be no pain so uh, another which dosh dosh is involved with the vata dosha maybe pitta or maybe kapha and which organ specifically like joint pain like uh, uh, any abdominal pain or any other pain where it it may be like if if a person have any severe pain there is a specific medicine for the that pain that cure any type of pain in which we use opium that is ras raj ras vedantak ras these are the ayurvedic medicines which can stop any type of pain uh, like that when we uh, treat other disease which disease are curable with ayurveda treatment uh, we can say swas rog that is asthma we can say twag rog that is skin disorders we can say uh, viral diseases in corona period ayurveda decoctions are very famous around the world and in india we have casualties but uh, the people used to take ayurvedic deco decoctions and other our immunity boosters like brahmarsain like chavan prash so and with that uh, our people were advised to do yoga and exercise this was the very useful for the people with yoga respiratory system was very strengthened and with the decoction uh, upper respiratory uh, respiratory system uh, because we people uh, believe in the kapha uh, is a kapha dosha is a uh, very much involved in the respiratory system with vat dosha these two doshas are prominent for the respiratory system so for vata dosha pranayam is very important for kapha dosha we give to use decoction and hot water so this type of combined treatment given by the ayurvedist we treat the patient and there are uh, because uh, i frankly i will speak because uh, our ayurveda our means uh, everybody's ayurveda who uh, is a scholar of ayurveda they know that uh, ayurveda have his own uh, anatomy physiology pathology and treatment these four factors are very much uh, uh, very much uh, uh, good written by the ancient authors so as per the ayurvedic physiology and anatomy sharira rachana and sharir kriya vigyan we think about the vat pitt kapha ras rakta mans mai dasti majja shukra these are the seven important component of the body with with that uh, the body can survive and the disease can be you know, occurs and uh, that that our one factor is a agni factor which uh, which is the main cause for the disease and main cause for the uh, health uh, because uh, yeah, digestion system i i this is digestion system is very small for uh, agni concept agni is a very important thing when we treat the patient any patient when we treat which is not uh, treat by the surgery only we can treat the uh, patient when we treat the patient then we see uh, patient uh, needs to be surgery or needs to be medicine in ayurveda specifically mentioned every disease and for his basic principle and basic concepts how, uh, uh, how i explain uh, ki there are so many uh, basic concepts 
in pain pain management i don't know uh, I, uh, rajiv ji will uh, uh, surely understand rasna the quath is a mo most important uh, pain reliever digoxin and arandamool vatharanam shrestham arandamool uh, this is a one ha raw material uh, then it uh, cure the pain pain of rheumatoid arthritis as such uh, joint pain also and it leaves also when give the swedan steam by this uh, this arandar leaves then also uh, pain is uh, we, we get, uh, patient got uh, relief in the pain so there are uh, uh, there are uh, uh, so many uh, 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 medicines for pain and integration where the uh, uh, question arise uh, integration is a good and uh, we believe to do integration as per the patient's condition and if a uh, if his emergency is there surely we should because our one motto is we, should, we uh, our one goal is that we we should cure the patient with the uh, first our our pathy then if needed and we if if i we have a knowledge for the other system of medicine surely we can treat with the medicine patient should be cured with uh so uh, integration is very good but uh, uh, it is my uh, personal opinion uh, whenever we treat the patient that patient should be treated by the uh, which pathy we studied uh, in which uh, in which system we are registered practitioner which licenses we have in that pathy we should treat the patients and uh, rajiv ji this is my first time talking to you all at global level i have no uh, such experience for this uh, this type of conversation or this this type of seminar or workshop and uh, i am th very much thankful to you to join me for a globally meeting thank you very much thank you so much rakesh sharma ji for actually joining us today and sharing your wisdom with us um one of the things that you've actually mentioned is that vata when the vata is out of balance that's when disease is actually at its prime that's when pain is being caused how can we help to pacify the vata dosha please uh, please uh, vata dosha uh, there are there are uh, so many causes mentioned by the charak shushrut and bhagavat these are the original three ancient texts uh, vata dosha uh, uh, become uh, vikrut we can say how it uh, become uh, to create a disease factor uh, so many dietary factors are there which can increase the vata vata dosh and there are so many karmic means uh, uh, the, the patient who uh, do not bother to do any work uh, which he cannot do be do that can be cause of vata vriddhi vata uh, vata prominent doshas the bad dosh can be uh, occurs and create a disease and uh, there are uh, two type of disease that is called nanatmaj vyadhi and samanya vyadhi nanatmaj means which, which disease are uh, only occurs by the vayu and other disease which where vayu itself go in the uh, body and create the problem like uh, rheumatoid arthritis arthritis amazing so practically by actually being able to work around it by being able to reduce the vata to bring the system to bring the goshas the gunas and the doshas into balance we were able to create equilibrium and is it that state of creating equilibrium where the agni and is actually at the strongest so the nutrients that we're feeding ourselves does that also have an impact on the mind does it also affect ayurvedic psychology absolutely right see agni uh, is a very important uh, in charak sangita very clearly mentioned that agni is a, a promoting factor for the vata uh, other uh, twel agnis and prana agnis this specifically mentioned pranashtokta deh agni hetuka pran means vayu uh, which we inhale oxygen for oxygen for uh, digestive system and for panchabhuta agni dhatva agni and other factors agni is the most important factor 
but the dosha uh, can create disease uh, individually also but most of as per ayurveda principles agni is the main cause for the uh, create disease right so when we're actually able to keep the mind in a state of equilibrium mental equilibrium so to speak does that also have an impact on the gut are we able to keep the gut in its optimal prime conditions and does that actually impact the way that one thinks and one feels yes there are then if uh, uh, mind is not uh, not uh, balanced uh, there are so many medicines when we give the uh, when we treat the patient then we used to give them uh, with the, uh, their uh, gut medicines brahmi shank pushpi and uh, uh, jatamansi uh, because it, it, it these are the sedative medicines and this uh, use in abdominal or gut disease also uh, mind is a very uh, important factor to create to occur any disease mind uh, मानसिक रोग और दोष शारीरिक रोग दे आर बोथ आर क्रिएट डिजीज कलेबरेटली एज पर आयुर्वेदा अमेजिंग यस एंड वी हैव आल्सो सीन राजन पटनकर हैज एक्चुअली हैड अ कमेंट एज वेल व्हिच इज वेरी पावरफुल एंड राजन जी इफ यू आर एक्चुअली हियर feel free to come and join us as part of this panel i know that you do quite a bit of work with ayurved yourself you will actually practice ayurved yourself as well um in the meantime dr lalit what are your views what are your thoughts on this ah uh, really amazing uh, conversation with dr rakesh sharma i think it's uh, even though it's his first time as he says i think the amount of information that he shared and the amount of experience he brings on this panel is outstanding So Dr Sharma thank you very much for that but thank I wanted you. to yeah I wanted to share something and something that you touched about Riddhi and Dr Sharma is about equilibrium a very common word uh, equilibrium or what they call homeostasis yeah. is the maintaining the equilibrium in your body so whole health health as we say vata pitta the doshas that are working in the body from the ayurvedic side and we also believe Uh, from a chiropractic viewpoint that equilibrium the homeostasis is so important that the nervous system works in harmony with the whole body so the total body that works on is the mind the body and the spirit and i think equilibrium or homeostasis between these three parts of the body are, are of of the entity uh, where we talk about total health the mind the body and the spirit is very very important so as much as we feed our body with good food good exercise as we believe with exercise you lose what you don't use so exercise is a vital part of your health food is a vital part of your health you lose what um, you are what you eat basically so eating the right food feeding the right stuff to your body is important equally feeding the right things to your mind is very important where the mind has an effect on the body and the pain of the body has an effect on the mind we know that mind and body work hand in hand so feeding the mind feeding the body and feeding the spirit are all three very important parts of health and this is where homeostasis or equilibrium is maintained to have a totally functional individual that's optimal health That's what Absolutely. I believe in, and I think. And they... I'd actually take that a step further as well, Doctor Lilith, if I may, and say it's not just what we eat; it's what we digest. It's the energy and the nutrients that are being absorbed into our cells on a cellular level as well. The way that we're able to um, generate that oxygen and to be able to infuse it with that um, oxygen to keep the stress levels down, because a lot of the times when vata pitta. Kapha is out of balance. The work that Dosha is high is because there's a stress element to it, which where the body actually keeps the score. So even though we may not feel stressed or we may not think that we are stressed, even if the um, nervous system is out of balance, we can tend to sense that within ourselves. What are your views? Absolutely agree with you, Riddhi, and that is so true. And this is why this kind of discussion is so interesting because. this there is no one single way to health i think if we can combine everything and make this a total optimal health situation i think that's what uh, majority of us are thinking here along those lines that everything from breath to body to whole health 
starts from a single cell that you nourish with everything. So health as a accumulation of all these aspects is vital. Agreed. Totally agreed with you, Riddhi. Amazing. And Dr. Sanjeeva, welcome back as well. What are your views? Uh, I think I agree everything that uh, Dr. Rakesh and uh, Lalith have said. And as rightly put it in, in a very succinct way, uh, mind, body and the spirit. I think the body is taken care of to a large extent, but the mind and the spirit is hardly taken care of. And if that can be taken care of, I think half the problem will be sorted out. Now, so for example, you're talking about gut health and everything else. I think mind is the most important thing. If you don't eat unnecessary things, which if you control your mind, half the disease is gone in a way. Yeah, most of the obesity, hypertension, because of increased weight, so, so many so many medical conditions are because of eating habits. Uh, if you can control our mind, all these things can be very well controlled, uh, or at least uh, the, the burden can be decreased considerably. And uh, I was just reading today morning about something called uh, healing system and belief system in the body. Yeah. So if we have a strong belief system, it can impact on the healing system. So the way we think is so, so important. Uh, indirectly, in, 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 for want of a better word, in, in current modern medicine, what they call, we call it placebo. <laughs> but but, but they, they are very powerful. The way I look at it is, uh, we need to optimize the placebo as well. Reason being that, uh, in my opinion at least, for a given condition, uh, placebo doesn't have side effects. So you can call it placebo or you can call it proper education and uh, uh, implementation of a treatment or uh, psychology, whatever you can call it in different ways or maybe a combination of everything. Everything has to be uh, 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 incorporated in a particular condition, be it pain or hypertension or diabetes or any other condition. And that's how it's going to work better. And that actually brings me to thinking about karmic cycles there as well and how the mind actually works together, the way that we're thinking, the way that we're feeling, when we get those repetitive patterns that keep coming up and we're not quite sure how to break through them or we solve them and it's only a temporary fix and it comes back again. So how do we actually break free of those karmic cycles as well? I think the karmic cycles, uh, to get rid of that, uh, you need a bit of a spiritual background in my opinion. And uh, if, any, any, any faith for that matter will have some solution for this. Uh, I, I, I come from a Hindu background. Now only I can speak only about that because I, I, I am a Hindu by, I'm a practicing Hindu. Uh, like that, I think in other special, other, other faiths like Christianity or Islam or uh, Judaism, whatever it is, they will have their own way of looking at things. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, 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 there is a strong sort of a case uh, uh, in 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 my religion, uh, as I said, in other religions also there are there. I can only talk for my religion. Uh, I think uh, that's the only way to uh, unburden the karmic burden. That that's my way of looking at things. That is fasc fascinating in itself, and I think it does actually come down even an element um, more to that as well into the subtle side, which is to say, let go. I think so many times we're gripping onto things like a fist. And we're so adamant that, because that creates a sense of safety in itself, because we know what's within it. So if we were to open that up, we know the devil that we know. So better than devil that we know rather than anything else. But also just by loosening that grip ever so gently, ever so slightly, we begin to feel that there's a sense of relief. And that relief comes from letting go, letting go of all of that stuff that we're holding on to. And I think Sanjeeva G, this brings back to your point as well, when it comes to the placebo. The placebo in itself is nothing more but allowing the patient to feel a sense of safety, at least the way that I look at it. And it's a sense of safety around those things which they think may well be conjuring some kind of discomfort for them. So by giving them the placebo, we're putting them at a sense of ease, at a sense of feeling better within themselves on some level. I think it's more than that. It's belief system, actually. Right. Uh, because because it's the trust you develop with a particular individual or a patient. Uh, if they trust you, 
like the reason I'm saying these things is they're, they're very powerful, very, very powerful, actually. If, if you present to them nicely, talk to them nicely, uh, it has a huge placebo effect. Uh, and I think we should optimize that. that. That's the way I look at it. I agree with you totally, Dr. Sanjeeva. It's your bedside manner of a practitioner. Absolutely. <laughs> the choice of words you use with your patients. Uh, one practitioner could be academically brilliant in what he does, but if the bedside manner or the choice of words when they use with the patients is not correct, um, the placebo, well, we don't want the placebo effect, obviously, but that effect of mind connecting with the other patient is so important that they function at the same level that you can change the thinking of the other person and the strong belief is strong healing. And I'll always remember that statement of yours. Yeah. I, and yeah. Uh, see chronic pain, uh, when patients come to us, they will have had pain for six months, six years, 10 years, 20 years, name it. Yeah. And uh, I have a habit of examining almost every patient. Uh, that's my habit and that that's i don't feel complete without doing that yeah. yeah so i examine them a good number of patients say doctor you're the first patient who have examined me in the last five years ten years so i've already scored a, quite a lot in the whole process by spending five or ten minutes and all they want to make sure is somebody examine them and tell them that well everything is fine don't worry this this you do half the problem is already gone that human touch is necessary Amazing, amazing. 100%. 100%. Amazing. 100 and I mean, most of the times, you know, uh, because today the timings for patients with a particular doctor or consultants are limited, but if that five minute extra is spent where you put your pen down and listen to the other person, or as Dr. Sanjeeva says, examine the condition, touch them, the power of touch is absolutely powerful. Listening is powerful. Oh, they are coming to talk to you. If you don't listen to them, it doesn't help. By listening to them, as, as Dr. Sanjeeva says, by listening and by examining, 50% of the battle is won. The other 50% is how we treat them. Absolutely correct. Communication is the most important. And we know that the words are only 7%. Rest is your body, language, and your tone of voice. And if you can emotionally connect, as uh, Sanjeeva said and uh, reiterated by uh, Lalit Jay, that if you have a way of connecting to the patients, it relieves the problem. You think that somebody think that somebody is listening to me, somebody is caring for me. That is the most important aspect. They know that if you care for me, I'm looked after and I'm happy because then they can surrender to you. They can listen to you and that they are going to follow what you say if you have not made that connection then whatever you say is not going to sink in they're not going to follow through the results will not come and therefore the problems will continue and particularly in chronic diseases that is a persistent problem so i think that's fantastic discussion i'm conscious of time so i'm thinking that can we bring the next speaker in i can see him i should is him. So let's do that. Fantastic. And just in summary there as well, the thing that I really took away from it was the sense of human connection, human touch, just empathy and compassion for the patients that walk in, listening to them, seeing where it is that they come from and how it is that we can help them as practitioners in this field. And um, Lalit Soto, did you have a final comment that you wanted to make? I certainly did. I just want to add a statement which I abide by and I truly believe and I hold it very close to my heart. And the statement goes, the patient will put faith in the doctor who knows the most about them, into brackets examining them. And the patient will put the trust in the doctor who knows the most about them and cares the most about them, so listens to them. So I think that statement is a very powerful statement and every practitioner should put that in practice. The patient will put faith in the doctor who knows most about them and cares the most about them. Thank you, Riddhi.
And it's certainly something that you help your patients for as well, is to Thank feel you. that care, it's to feel that love and that empathy. And it goes such a long way, especially when we know that the healing power is in the hands to actually just have that connection with the patients as well. And I'm pretty sure it's something that Himanshi can speak to as well. Global Namaste Himanshi. Um, for those of you that don't know, Himanshu is phenomenal in yoga. If you're ever there on a Saturday morning, feel free to be in Juhu Beach and join one of his sessions. And he's done phenomenal work when it comes to yoga. He's done Surya Namaskars, which bring together the chakra healing, the energetic systems that we've just been speaking about, as well as the physical asanas and how the two systems interrelate to each other. Also, how to keep the mind nice and calm and peaceful as well and Himanshi ji feel free to take the stage and tell us more about yoga and the brilliant work that you're doing yeah in fact uh, last week am i first of all am i audible clear yes. right oh great so last week i believe uh, we had a uh, uh, vinod by doing yoga with us yeah and yeah. i think he's uh, probably 75 plus i believe and wow. he comforted me Suri Namaskar, and he enjoyed it. Uh, right, Vinod Bhai? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Global Namaste. Global Namaste. Uh, uh, we had, uh, last year, we had Dr. Suda with us. So, we really enjoyed it. We had a great time. Yes, and as Dr. Suda said, uh, mostly uh, patients, they go to the doctor, and uh, it's more 75% of sympathy and 25% of empathy. Am I right? So, there's always a vacuum which doctor fills up psychologically. I used to do hypnosis years ago, so I can relate to that. And uh, I have uh, been fortunate to even uh, hypnotize quite a number of uh, students, patients, and had a fantastic result. So now talking about yoga, yeah, what we have been discussing about Ayurveda, homeopathy, and whatever uh, cure, it's more... Uh, of a cure than prevention. So yoga is actually a preventive med medicine. Okay. So uh, I would say the whole of yoga, most of the people, they understand yoga as uh, only asanas, which is actually incorrect because yoga is, I mean, asana, they are like tip of the iceberg. There's Immense, immense depth in yoga. It's a vast science. It is metaphysics, philosophy, psychology. I would say it's more like a manual for humanity. What I've studied, as much as I've studied yoga, it's more like a manual. If you open up a yoga sutra, the whole of sutras, I mean, it leads you how you can, first of all, take good care of yourself. And then how well you can take good care of the community and then the country, and then the, the whole of the entire universe, I mean globe, uh, what we can say. So it, it's yoga for three edge, health, happiness, and harmony. And that, that's how it prevents any kind of ailments. If you're really following the path of yoga, then you don't have, I mean, you, you can avoid all the ailments, okay. And before it comes, before it affects you, whether it's physically, psychologically, and if you're a follower of yoga, if you're a walking on the path of yoga, is, there's a sutra which says, Heyam Dukham Anagatam. Means the pain or suffering that is yet to arrive can be prevented. So yeah, that's all about yoga in short, I would say. Yep. Phenomenal explanation. Um, and I think it's so important that we look at what yoga is not as well. Um, because a lot of the times we tend to get stuck in this mindset of what asanas do I need to do in order to be able to cure a particular problem? Or what pranayamas do I need to do? Whereas yoga actually, it's more of a holistic system. It's not just about picking and choosing certain things, but it's about looking at the system overall, just the way that Ayurved is about looking at the system overall as well. Um, can you lead some voice into that, please? So, uh... Patanjali, Maharishi Patanjali, he 
has gifted yoga for human race, for fruition of human race. Okay. So all these sutra, 195 sutras, they are leading for, if we all follow the sutras, I don't think we can have any war, any evil, anything of the sort, and we can really live a happy, harmonious life. And that's what really I understood practically too. So now talking about individual problem, let's say I'll give you my example about a few months back, uh, almost a year back, I had a lumbago problem. It's a kind of a slip disc. So, and uh, doctors have told me not to do any any kind of exercises. Then it was more out of a wrong posture and uh, immense kayaking, and maybe my lifestyle had for a few days at I mean gone for a toss for certain reasons. So I took rest for about uh, four or five days, and then I referred to my old notes of uh, Guruji. Uh, Ayengar Guruji, and he has prescribed many of the asanas for various kind of uh, ailments. So for Lumbargo, I practice about, about 25 to 30 asanas, different, different asanas. And you won't believe I could get, get over it in just two days' time, in just two days of practice. And after a week, I was practicing Surya Namaskar, and the same doctor who had diagnosed me, he was on the beach, and he said, how come you're doing it? And he uh, you were immensely suffering. I said, I have no problem now. There's no pain at all. And I'm perfectly all right. So likewise, you can have solution for your for our own self and the solution for all our fellow human beings. So it brings me to something quite important, which is a healthy body is a healthy mind and a healthy mind is a healthy body. And even though we actually are yoga practitioners ourselves, we may well feel that we have a slippery slope at times, but it's just about bringing ourselves back to that state of um to that state of balance, to that state of equilibrium, to that state of just being. And I think that's just so important because even when we look at this a little bit deeper and we can start to see those thoughts that are playing out, it's that case of I may well be in pain, but I will not allow myself to suffer. There may well be something that's wrong, but I will not turn that wrong into a lifestyle. And by having a healthy lifestyle that we're able to follow, even if we were only practicing yoga for like 10 or 15 minutes the first thing in the morning, it has such a massive effect, even that I found, on the body and the mind, which is not just the body and the mind. It goes way deeper. It goes into our belief systems. It goes into our energy. It goes into the way that we mindfully do things throughout the day and the actions that we take and the actions that we don't take so I think I feel that it's phenomenal to actually see a yoga from not just the 360 degree view which is phenomenally important too not just from the bird's eye view but actually to go in a little bit deeper because that's when we can really start to see how these things integrate with medicine and with different disciplines yeah so uh... Yoga believes and uh, it is said that uh, the problem, the ailments is always due to the tumor or the body fluid, what we say, the imbalance in the body fluid. And even Ayurveda believes the same. That's why they give the, those kind of medicine which tries to balance it. And so, uh, and that's how the problem occurs, basically. So it's always a lifestyle issue, basically. And uh, even the food, what we take, we don't think about anything, what, what exactly your body needs. So that's how it uh, affects. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's just the brilliance of it in itself is to actually know the way that different things um, integrate together with each other as well. I think it's a beautiful dance there. Even if we start to look at the five koshas and the way that things actually work, it's not just the mental, it's not just the physical, it's not just the emotional, it's not just the um, soul level, but it's actually way deeper than that. And I feel like for me, yoga is a sense of just being just being present in ourselves, that state of stillness, that state where we can actually go beyond our thoughts, connect with the breath, and then something really um, revolutionary happens. We're able to slip past the mind, 
by actually having a control over our breath. And that's really the moment of stillness. There's those few golden moments, there's few golden nuggets where we can just literally be is bliss in itself. And Dr. Neil, uh, sorry, Neil Kumar, did you have a comment? Thank you, Riddhi. What a wonderful session we are doing so far. It's beautiful. Uh, Himanshu actually is based right on the ocean and he's on the beach. Uh, Lalit will actually vouch because our Lalit has been there. And, and also Kamlesh, who is part of our team, recently visited India and attended the yoga and was presented with the book. And as was uh, Vinod and Manju, who were in uh, uh, India very lately, they actually celebrated. Maybe they can just give their comment. Lalit, you actually attended Himanshu's session. Fresh oxygen right from the sea breeze and yoga. What better way than to alleviate the pains from the body? Does anybody need medicine if you can do that daily? Absolutely not. You know what? This was at six o'clock in the morning. I was rushing on the auto rickshaws from Kandivali to Juhu Beach and I made it on time. And the, the, the waves are rushing onto the beach. The morning sky is just opening up and you're doing connection. The yoga, my goodness, outstanding. The fresh air, the sound of water and nothing but the best association with wonderful yogis. It was Outstanding. I wish I could get to Juhu Beach every weekend on a Saturday to do the yoga. So, but whoever, so Lalit, whoever visits Mumbai, you are always invited on to the Juhu Beach right next to Novotel, where at 6 10 in the morning, you will be welcomed and treated with Nariel Pani, which is coconut water and some treatment. In fact, uh, Vinod and Manju were there. So, Vinod, you can unmute yourself. You only came two weeks back. How was your how was your experiment and how was it uh, when you were there live at Jew Beach with Hemanshu? Yes, I mentioned the same thing what Laliti just mentioned. I like the atmosphere and I did mention it over there with all the all the one who came at yoga station. I mentioned the same thing. I said, look, you're so lucky with the sea, sun, sand, everything there. The weather is there. You know, you, it's a perfect, but, you know, it, the atmosphere was so good, you know, and I said, they're so lucky that they've got this weather and everything in their favor. They should practice yoga every day if they can. There you are. Thank you. We know that Manju was there recently. Uh, really shortly, we'll be going to our homeopath, resident and homeopath expert, who is our, our patron at Healing Our Earth, but he also knows Hemanshu. He has also been at Juhu Beach. Dr. Mukesh Bhatra, Global Namaste to you. Welcome. What do you think of this holistic approach where you're by the ocean, breathing fresh oxygen, doing yoga and feeling good, taking the deep breath in? It's absolutely excellent. And uh, it's not just uh, oxygen, but it's also ozone. Because, you know, the ozone layer is very, very good near the beach. And it actually has a lot of healing powers. So, yes, I believe that. And, of course, yoga is holistic medicine. You know, mind and body, it calms you down. It kind of makes you flexible. Uh, so, I'm all for it. And I so wish uh, Himanshu all the best with his book as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Batra. And we'll be back with you in a shortly, just in a moment. Don't go away. Lalit, you are a pain management specialist as well and a chiropractor. And really, you practice uh, yoga as well. What do you think from a holistic point of view that do you think daily basic yoga is also good and breathing and would it actually eliminate certain potential future risks of certain diseases? Let it first to you and then to Riti. Yes, certainly. Thank you for that question, Neil, Neil Kumar. That is an outstanding question and the only way I can answer. But before I answer, my humble global namaste to Dr. Batra and my respects to you my fellow, my dad's friend, who I've always kept in touch with and love to see him all the time. So wonderful to see you. A wonderful family member of Healing Our Earth, if I may say that. Anyway. I love, I love, I love your new specs uh, and I was going to comment on them a little later. So that's a new look <laughs> that you have. Wonderful. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Batra. Oh. Wonderful to see him, Anshu, and all my, all my lovely, lovely people. So anyway, let me answer this question. So is this something one should be doing daily practice? So 
one common statement I've I've heard about, as we said about exercise. So I I consider yoga also as a form of exercise for your body. Obviously, there is more to yoga than just asanas and exercise. But I looking at yoga from a uh, exercise perspective. A very famous Bollywood actor once mentioned, and I always remember him for for that is Akshay Kumar, and he said, "Look, if you're going to look after your body, you're going to feed your body every day. So." you're feeding you're eating every day he says exercise should be done the same way if you're going to eat every day you got to exercise every day the day you decide not to exercise mate forget eating that day so i think these practices are absolutely essential on a daily regular basis if you're going to breathe every day if you're going to eat every day well we might as well exercise every day and i think i 100% believe in that philosophy and for that a big hello to akshay kumar if he's listening on healing of earth if not we should probably send a message to him about healing of earth um what a fit fitness guy he is so from that perspective yes this should be done on a daily basis thank you this comes from dr lali soda who is an expert and a reporter and a senior anchor and a chiropractor so himanshu is smiling with that ridhi is of course smiling because ridhi practices breathing and yoga and meditation she is also a producer at healing of earth for yoga and meditation ridhi your comment gentle daily yoga helps absolutely i'm a follower of yoga myself i practice at least half an hour first thing in the morning and it's just working absolutely revolutionary and um, i wouldn't say that you have to practice half an hour maybe even 10 minutes but what we're basically doing is getting some movement into the body really simple movements getting the breath that's working in tandem with the movements that we are doing and allowing the mind to be at peace allowing the mind to calm down the second thing i would say is that yoga doesn't just have to be done on the mat it's not just about being mindful whilst we're on the mat whilst we're on the mat it's absolutely fantastic to just drop our worries and to be there and be still but it's also a step further it's also being mindful in our day to day actions it's also what we're doing on a moment to moment basis and how we carry ourselves through the day and personally what i found is when i've actually been practicing yoga it helps me throughout the day just to have that sense of emotional intelligence um himanshu's done a fantastic book on making of a yogi which is available on amazon and he shows us how to be conscious of what it is that we're thinking of how it is that we're feeling of how we're moving and actually that body posture goes a massive way to actually just being able to be ourselves a lot of the times when we're sitting for long periods i say sitting is a new smoking when we're sitting for long periods of time we tend to fall into postures which aren't so conducive for our health but by have practicing yoga we're aware of those movements we're aware of what it is that we're doing we're aware of how it is that we're fixing it himan shiji just mentioned very briefly about that problem that he had in his back and how over the space of 2 days he was able to fix it where well, i think that is very possible because a lot of it comes to body posture a lot of it comes to alignment a lot of it comes to how we're holding ourselves throughout the day and when we're more aware of those things the first step is awareness when we're more aware of those things guess what we have the toolkit to be creative and to find a problem to our solutions thank you ridhi what a wonderful you can see how passionate ridhi is she loves it it's good time himanshu stay around we'll be back with you in a moment we are going to move to dr mukesh batra our resident expert we welcome our ish sharma who is our yoga episode producer as well so from one senior director from ayush ministry to another mauritius director at mauritius global namaste ish to you before we move to dr mukesh batra namaste to all brilliant ish stay around we are going to chit chat Now we go to our supreme of homeopathy. Everybody knows he's very famous. Riti introduced Dr. Mukesh Bhatra and uh, Lalit. Say hello to your longtime friend. Riti, you need to unmute yourself. Of course, I would help. Wonderful. <laughs> A very warm global namaste to you, Dr. Mukesh Bhatra. 
I hate Puavel. For those of you that don't know, Dr. Batra is the founder, chairman, and managing director of Dr. Batra's group of companies, which encompasses the world's largest chain of homeopathic clinics, daycare aesthetic centers, and health and wellness products. Dr. Batra has played a stellar role in legalizing homeopathy in Mauritius in the Middle East. He has succeeded in establishing the first ever corporate homeopathic clinic in Oman. And in England, Dr. Batra's clinic is the only homeopathic healthcare corporate to find a spot in that sacred hub of medical excellence, which in itself is Harley Street. Dr. Batra, global namaste here on Healing Our Earth. So pleased that you could join us today. Thank you very much. Uh, really, it, it, it is this wonderful honor. And, you know, just to correct, I'm no longer the MD of my company. I've actually retired from my board. But yes, I'm still the founder chairman. So thank you for that introduction. And uh, please go ahead with any questions that you may have on the topic. Fantastic. So the first question that I had for you is homeopathy in itself is such a powerful medicine um, to actually be able to give to patients. How does it help to fill the gaps in modern medicine? So that's a very good question, really. And uh, let me just answer this in, in three parts, you know, because our topic really today is integrated medicine. And let me just, you know, talk about the three challenges that we have, the three parts that I would like to divide my talk into. The first, of course, is what are the advantages of having integrated in medicine? The second is what are the disadvantages? And the third is what are the challenges? So if we divide our kind of conversation into three parts, the advantages, the disadvantages, and the challenges, I think we would cover up a lot of this uh, you know, this topic. So let me first start with the advantages. You know, the first advantage, of course, and you also mentioned that earlier in your talk, uh, is the advantage of choice. You know, I think every consumer deserves a choice. And it's very unfair that every time when somebody goes to a hospital, the only choice they get is of, uh, of, of, of commercial medicine. And there's no choice of any other system of medicine at all, whether it's homeopathy or otherwise. In India, of course, lots of hospitals now do have OPDs as well, but they don't have IPDs. So you can't get hospitalized with homeopathic treatment. You can get hospitalized only with allopathic treatment. So that's really, uh, you know, one of the challenges, uh, you know, that's an advantage that we have that by giving people a choice, uh, they could actually select whatever they want. And I think that's a very, very important uh, factor because years ago when I came to London and I addressed uh, at the House of Commons an all-party meeting, that's what I told them. I said, you know, you have a political choice of Brexit, but you don't have a medical choice of choosing which system of medicine you want to actually uh, follow. And it's very, very fair uh, that every consumer must get the right of choice. So I think the first advantage is giving every consumer the right of choice, which is very important because right now the system is so kind of, uh, you know, structured so as not to give that choice uh, to the consumer. The second, of course, is holistic medicine. Homeopathy is one of them. You spoke of yoga as well. And homeopathy is holistic medicine, is mind and body medicine. Uh, it's also personalized medicine. And I think today all over the world, people are going for bespoke medicine, as it is called. You have bespoke tailoring, but you also have bespoke medicine. So rather than just giving pills which are kind of, uh, you know, act at a particular time on a particular body, why not think of a human being? And why not think of every patient as being different? And therefore, we don't just treat the disease, but we treat the person who's suffering from the disease. And this is really the advantage of homeopathy. And this is the advantage of holistic medicine as well. And this is the advantage of, uh, of integrating medicine as well. Because rather than just chemicals and rather than just body parts, uh, you know, treating the human being as a whole uh, through holistic medicine and through homeopathy and other systems of medicine is clearly a, a, a very major advantage. The third, of course, is prevention. Unfortunately, not too much of, of uh, emphasis is actually given on prevention in, in medicine. Uh, while, you know, a lot of diseases today are lifestyle related, uh, we've seen that, for example, in COVID, the buzzword has been immunity. We always want that people, we saw that people who had high immunity didn't fall sick so easily. Those who had low immunity fell sick. So building up immunity, you know, and, and kind of looking towards preventive medicine rather than uh, curative medicine uh, is another very, very big advantage uh, that we have with homeopathy and with other systems of medicine. Uh, finally, of course, I think it also gives rise to higher patient satisfaction because when people have a choice and they decide you know, to choose the right kind of therapy, 
uh, the chances of getting better are much faster, much quicker. So these are my points for the advantages of, of using integrated medicine. May I now come to the disadvantages? Or would you like to? Yes. Okay. So let me finish my conversation in entirety. And then, uh, so the disadvantage, of course, the first major disadvantage is clinical evidence. Uh, you know, uh, in today's world, we want to measure the outcome of treatment and we want double blind trials. We want, you know, clinical evidence. We want the outcome to be actually medically authenticated. And this is a big gap today in uh, alternative medicine or complementary medicine. And this is something that needs to be, you know, fixed. The second, of course, is cost because, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of it is not covered under insurance. In India, it partly is now. In, in Dubai, it is. I know where we have clinics there. Our patients do get reimbursed uh, by insurance companies. But it's not so all over the world. And so that's really what happens is that because homeopathy is like a super specialization, particularly in Europe, so it's actually more expensive than, you know, uh, traditional medicine. And therefore, you've got to add cost to it. So it really becomes more expensive because you take your regular treatment or you go to hospital and you pay those bills and plus you also take homeopathy. So it's added cost really and that's a disadvantage. Sometimes another disadvantage is also drug interactions. You know, we actually find that, uh, you know, that uh, very often, unfortunately, uh, practitioners of complementary medicine are not very, uh, very, uh, you know, don't easily disclose the prescriptions that they have. And therefore, sometimes, you know, they can it can interact with you know, the chemical medicine that is being given otherwise to chronic patients. Uh, the other disadvantage is, of course, having no common nomenclature for the kind of disease that we have. So all over the world, we follow this ICD classification. So the international classification of drugs is very important. And I think all practitioners of complementary medicine should practice it because if you have a patient suffering from allergic bronchitis, but an Ayurved doctor says that, no, it's cuff with an, and, you know, it, it is, is, you know, is, is, is pit and vat and uh, homeopath says no, it's low immunity, uh, there can be no common ground. So to create a common ground, it's very important that we should all actually follow uh, ICD and a standard kind of classification of, of medicines and of diseases, uh, which will then help to build, to build common ground. Uh, finally, of course, I also think that one big challenge that we have is really uh, sometimes missing the elephant in the room. So what happens is when we try to treat everything, uh, sometimes we can, you know, critically miss something which is very critical uh, through alternative medicine. And that's really a big challenge. Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, when our doctors appear for an exam in Dubai, the first thing that they are asked is not what they can treat, but what they cannot treat. So I think all practitioners of complementary medicine must know where to draw the line and what not to treat. I think that's as important as knowing what to treat. And that's something I think that, uh, you know, we all should train ourselves to do. Because sometimes you could miss, like just a common cough could actually be cancer of the lungs. It could also be tuberculosis. So you can't just, you know, treat it and continue treating it uh, without understanding what really it is. Coming finally to the challenges, uh, I'll just, uh, you know, uh, mention just three. The first, of course, uh, you know, like I said, is integration. It's not easy to integrate, to integrate in, in the mainstream medicine. With complementary medicine, there's a lots of challenges uh, because it's an established system of medicine. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's got a whole industry behind it and it's not easy to break into that industry. So uh, that's something that one have to really work very hard to do. Uh, like I said, you know, to have IPD uh, patients treating, being treated through alternative medicine is also not very easy. The second very important challenge is awareness. One needs to actually create strong awareness for homeopathy and alternative treatments and complementary medicine, not just with the common people, but also with the medical profession, because they need to understand what can really help, what kind of disease can help, uh, can better help uh, the consumer. And finally, I think, which I mentioned in the beginning as well, the biggest challenge is also creating uh, evidence-based medicines, because today everybody wants to know really what can work and wherever, whichever can work better in whatever system of medicine, that's the kind of treatment that the consumer should take. So that's my take on 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 integration on integrated medicine. Brief. Thank you very much, Doctor Lowe. Did you have a question? Okay, so no, I'm no Doctor Mukesh. Okay. Thank you. You've, I think you've done a really good job there of summarising. Where do you feel that homeopathy can actually fit in with the other modalities? 
like I mentioned already, that number one is in preventive medicine is very good. We've used arsenical, for example, as a preventive in, in, in COVID, during COVID. I distributed two crore medicines free of charge and also to the entire Maharashtra police force and their families. And, you know, we kind of saw that very few of them actually got COVID. So as a preventive, it has been used time and again, right from Spanish flu more than 100 years ago, very effectively. And that's one role. The second, of course, is in uh, in NCDs, in, in non-communicable disorders and chronic disorders. Uh, you know, today, a lot of diseases are lifestyle related and therefore holistic medicine, you know, and a lot of problems today are psychosomatic as well. Also, I would say in mental and emotional health, homeopathy has a clear-cut advantage because it's holistic medicine. So I would say that these are the three things in, in, in chronic cases, in prevention, as well as in mental and emotional problems. And that's one of my new books coming up next week uh, on mental health and emotional health and homeopathy by Bloomsbury. Uh, so I hope that uh, it will be available on Amazon. It already is actually available on Amazon uh, even now, but we're having a, a, a kind of a personal launch uh, in Bombay on the 22nd of April. Uh, with a lot of uh, stars, Galaxy of Stars, coming and talking about mental health as well. So uh, if any of you are in India, we certainly like you to attend. And Riddhi, just to tell, Riddhi, just to tell our global view viewers, it's going to be 50 years that Dr. Mukesh Bhatra has been at the top of a ladder. He started, he started top, he started running top. He's right at the top. He's not only a philanthropist. He's not only a singer. He's not only an entertainer, 50 years. So if you are in India in April, it's a private invitation only. Do contact us or contact him directly, those who are listening to us. Lali, 50 years, what do you think? Absolutely amazing because on his 50th birthday, I was with him celebrating his 50th birthday in Bandra. And uh, 50 years of his life in homeopathy is an outstanding achievement. A superstar. Thank you, Alanit. I, I I complete fifty years tomorrow, from <laughs> April onwards. So that's wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, Amrita. Thank you. Thank you. Amrita, your thought on Dr. Mukesh Bhatra's fifty years? Amrita is our senior anchor here as well. And uh, what do you think of Mr. Bhatra achieving fifty years right at the top? Uh, global Namaste, everyone. It's really good to have at this episode the integration of so many pathies and everything together, which we already have been discussing from long, long time. And uh, what to talk about Dr. Batra, he has been one of those incredible people which are rare stars on earth. So hands off to you. And I really hope uh, that your endeavor, that practices that you have in your life, you have inculcated and you have spread word over globally with so many qualities and facets that you have. You keep glittering all time and shining and may you keep giving the legacy of this integration world over for global peace, health and prosperity. Thank you, Amrita. And Himanshu, you are in Mumbai. You know Dr. Batra. You go to his, some of his concerts as well. And you are in there in April. So go in on, on behalf of Healing Our Earth, congratulate Dr. Mukesh Bhatta in person. 50 years in, not just in Mumbai, but globally. What do you think, Himanshu? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was, I've been fortunate to attend uh, three of his programs. One was on uh, philanthropy uh, uh, that was in Opera House years ago. I went with uh, my friend Farad, with, who is a common friend. Yeah, Farad Arora who is Vijay Arora's son. And Vijay Arora uh, was Dr. Batra's uh, good friend. And uh, then, of course, I went for a Prithvi Theatre. We had a drama. Jina uh, Gina Isi Kata. Oh, what was it? Sorry. Jina Isi Kanaam. That's correct. Yeah. Right. And, On my yeah. biography, yeah. Yeah. And then I think I remember going to YB Chavan. Uh, you had a singing program. It was fantastic. We all enjoyed so it's amazing. I mean, he's multifaceted personality. So great. Thank you, Himanshu. Uh, yeah. Stay now. We'll be back in a discussion in a moment. Uh, we are now also going to ask Sarah Mills. She's Sarah Mills and she's in the United Kingdom. She's also a regular supporter at Healing Our Earth. Sarah, Global Namaste and welcome to you. 50 years at the top of the industry in homeopathy, not just an as expert. But homeopathy guru, what are your thoughts? And you are the next guest on our oh. platform. 
Thank you so much. This is just perfect for me because um, it's music to my ears. It really is. It really is. So thank you so much for being there for 50 years because uh, I remember in my 20s being very attracted to homeopathy and finding out all about it. And um, I've used it ever since. I used it through um, helping me with through um, being pregnant, through childbirth, through my childhood, through children's you know uh, illnesses and all those sorts of things. Um, I had some very bad experiences being laughed out of my GP surgery for using homeopathy, but you will understand that I'm sure. But that is you know now 30 years ago. So I would yeah. Uh, my heart sings literally and I can't sing, but it, I'm glad you can sing. But I, my heart sings for hearing, you know, the steps that have been now taken towards um, bringing specific, specifically homeopathy for me um, really to the forefront. Because, um, yeah, I, I believe and have seen such wonderful benefits from it throughout my adult life. And that's quite a long time. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. It really does make my heart sing. Thank you, Sarah. Stay around. You are the next uh, guest contributor and exchanging your ideas why integrated health is very good. Dr. Mukesh Bakra, on behalf of everybody at Healing Our Art, we wish you the 50th special act <laughs> of your event and we wait for the 75th because that's the time where we're going to hit three quarter of a century. Stay around. We'll be with you in a moment. Let's go to Ridhi and uh, Ridhi, as we say goodbye just temporarily to Dr. Mukesh Batra. Let's introduce Sarah and see what she has got to say. So, Global Namaste, Sarah. It's fascinating to have you once again with us, sharing all of your wonderful tips about health coaching and habit formation. I remember when we spoke briefly last year and you were telling us all about your 30 day program and how to stay in optimum health. What tips do you have for us today? Oh, thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. And thank you, Rajiv, and to yourself and to all the hosts here for inviting me. Yeah, um, well, I've always been interested in the whole body approach to healthy living for mind, body and soul. Um, so there must be a lot more Eastern medicine in me than there is Western medicine, because I've always, always aligned with everything you guys are saying. Um, and I have used many modalities for myself and my family, from homeopathy, aromatherapy, reflexology, diet, exercise, and so much more. Um, you know, meditation, yoga, uh, Reiki over the course of my adult life. Um, and for the last 10, more than 10 years, I've been part of a very well-established global wellness movement that really aligns with this integrated health that really does believe that everyone can flourish with sustainable, healthy living. And I know, you know, all the speakers here would 100 percent, you know, um, back that as well, because we are everything we do encompasses mind, body and soul. You can't remove the two from each other. Um, and yeah, part of that healthy living journey that I love to take people on is a 30 days and beyond healthy living. Um, and I really love awakening people to believe in small daily positive changes really can lead to massive possible changes for how we look and feel and thrive. Um, so I was just going to go over um, some top tips, really, some of which some of you have already covered so beautifully. But to me, Healthy living really does encompass a holistic approach towards maintaining physical, mental and emotional well-being. And that's it. You know, it involves making choices and adopting behaviors that have a positive impact on our health and quality of life because we truly are meant to feel at our best. Um, and those components of healthy living can be broken down, as some of us have already mentioned, or some of you already mentioned, into several key areas, which does include lifestyle, nutrition, um, you know, dietary supplements, gut health, the gut brain connection. Each of these components does play a vital role in our overall wellness. Um, you know, lifestyle. Lifestyle choices are the daily behaviors and habits that influence our overall health and longevity. Um, and those key lifestyle factors include, I would say, physical activity, regular exercise improves our cardiovascular health, as so many of you will know. Um, it strengthens our muscles, it enhances our flexibility, and it supports mental health um, by reducing symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, sleep, the one thing that we often don't get enough of, especially when we're running our own businesses, but sleep, adequate sleep is essential for our body to repair itself. 
Um, you know, it helps to consolidate memory, regulate our mood, and poor sleep habits are linked to various health problems, which so many will know, including, you know, cardiovascular disease, diminished immune function. And then, of course, we've got stress management. Chronic stress can lead to serious health issues like heart disease, anxiety, disorder, depression, and therefore effective stress management techniques include, as some of you already said, meditation, deep breathing, engaging in hobbies or act or activities that really relax and rejuvenate us. Um, and nutrition, that's, you know, the favorite thing is like, we are what we eat, we are what we absorb. So good nutrition is fundamental to healthy living. And it involves consuming a balanced, balanced, this key, a rich diet in whole foods, in fruits and vegetables. I mean, I've been a vegetarian since I was 27 years old, which is more than 35 years. Um, and I've been a plant-based, just plant-based for over eight years. And, you know, I feel happier and healthier than I've ever felt before. So, you know, I think those fruits and vegetables, right? We have to have high in vitamins, high in minerals, high in fiber and antioxidants, which help protect us against chronic disease. Um, whole grains, sources of essential nutrients and fiber, which aid to digestion and can help prevent all sorts of cardiovascular diseases. Obviously, lean proteins, which are so important for our muscle repair and growth. Um, for me, I would only be using plant based proteins, but others may use, you know, good quality fish or poultry or, or lean cuts of, of uh, organic, I would say, um, meat, if that's what you want to eat. And then obviously healthy fats. Um, my favorite definitely is avocados, but um, might be different for you. But those healthy fats that can be found in nuts and seeds, oily fish, which support brain health and reduce the risk of, of heart disease. You know, um, I, I read somewhere recently that more women in the UK die of heart disease than they do of breast cancer, which we're all told pres presumably more people die of. But heart disease, we have to keep our heart at all times healthy, don't we? So while a well-balanced diet should provide most of the necessary nutrients, dietary supplements can obviously fulfill those gaps. So we should look at those. And then, as some of you have already said so beautifully, and you are far more expert than I am, um, the gut is what it's all about. The gut health plays an overall role in our um, overall health, um, you know, for a strong immune system. And that is our heart health, our brain health, our improved mood, our healthy sleep, effective digestive system. I mean, our gut is our second brain, isn't it? It rules what we do. And it, those things may help some prevent some cancers, autoimmune diseases. Um, so, you know, keeping that probiotic and prebiotic, the foods that we can, you know, find or the gut health um, supplements that we can use to really help, whether that's through fermented foods that we eat or whether that's um, in the probiotics or the prebiotics found in, you know, food like bananas, onion, garlic, these all nourish those beneficial bacteria. And then obviously consuming a high fiber diet supports the growth of healthy gut bacteria. And there is no getting away from the gut brain connection um, as a two way communication system between our gastrointestinal tract and the brain, which influences everything from our mood to our immune response. So adopting a holistic approach to these components, it will, to me, to me, definitely lead to a healthier, more balanced life, potentially preventing many chronic diseases. And we're all supposed to feel great. So why wouldn't we do all that we can, you know, to, to, to adopt that kind of lifestyle? And obviously, I appreciate that we should consult a healthcare professional if we're going to make significant changes um, to our lifestyle. And, you know, while nutrient dense foods provide energy, while junk food zaps our energy, you know, high in sugar, high in salt. And so we we have to support those different ways of doing what we want to do. And I think forming habits for healthy eating, adopting a healthy eating, nutrient dense food, to support healthy living involves making deliberate choices and changes to our eating patterns. Um, so just a quick before I head off, because I think I might be nearly up in time, shout when I am. But I would just say start small. Number one, start small. Make small incremental changes to your diet rather than attempting an overnight massive overhaul. For example, incorporate additional serving of vegetables into your meals or switch from refined grains to whole grains. Number two, plan your meals. 
um, you know, this is one thing I love. It, it's some. It's one of the biggest awareness things that people can often have is like, oh my god, I've, I've started to p- plan my week, my my meals in advance, so I'm not just grabbing stuff. And if I know I'm working out and I'm on the busy and I'm at meetings, then I plan my stuff and I take it with me whenever possible. So planning that really makes you intentional. Start planning a few meals each week and gradually increase as you get um, more comfortable. Number three really important is keep healthy snacks handy replace you know chips and candy with healthy snack options like hummus and fruit and crudités because you can gather take those things with you and then have them when you're feeling peckish number four listen to your body pay attention to your hunger and fullness you know what your body's telling you and eat mindfully it really encourages to, to save your food and recognize when you're satisfied reducing that likelihood of overeating and helping and then helping you f- choose foods that really genuinely nourish your body um and what i've done over the last 10 years 15 years because i didn't really know anything about that before was i number 5 i educated myself i understood the nutritional value of different foods and how they can motivate and help us make um, us and help us feel, make healthier choices. So learn about the nutrient benefits of nutrient dense foods and the drawbacks of fast food and junk food. And that can really empower us to choose foods that support our health. Um, number six, if you can cook from home, you can prepare all your meals and that really helps. So experiment with recipes that use whole unprocessed foods to discover new favorite dishes that are both nutritious and delicious. Um, and the last two things really is is to create a supportive environment. Surround yourself with other people who support your and their healthy eating goals. So whether it's family members, friends, a community or a group, having a support network can make it so much easier to stick to healthy eating habits. And lastly is be patient and flexible. Forming new habits takes time and there will be setbacks. So be patient with yourself. Recognize that every meal is a new opportunity to make healthy choices. Being flexible is key. You can you can eat amazing, healthy, nutritious meals actually out. Loads of restaurants provide amazing, healthy opportunities. And if you know you're going out to eat, maybe, you know, ring ahead and find out what's on the menu. So by gradually incorporating these strategies into your daily routine, eating nutrient dense foods, can become really a natural, enjoyable part of your lifestyle, which will support you on your journey. And I really believe we are all supposed to feel amazing. We're supposed to feel energized. We are supposed to live long, healthy lives. And that's how our body wants to feel. And if you're not feeling like that, at least 80% of the time, ask yourself, what changes do I need to make in my diet, in my daily exercise, to my mindset, most importantly, that will help me be the best that I can be. Our body is so wise, as so many of you amazing, incredible experts know, but your body is so wise, it knows what to do. So just ask it and you will find the answer. So thank you so much. And I hope that's given you some top tips to think about. Thank you, Sarah. As always, absolutely phenomenal. I think you've packed in so many golden nuggets in just such a short time that there it's just so much wisdom that everyone that was listening to that, I'm pretty sure they took away even a go- couple of golden nuggets there that they can start to implement. And as you say, a habit takes time to form, but it's about having that patience and being able to catch ourselves when we're falling off that habit and bring ourselves back on track and it's just a beautiful dance to be able to observe um Rajivji what were your thoughts yeah it's amazing because in this world where the air is contaminated the food is contaminated uh even the thoughts are contaminated the whole body mind soul need nourishment and correct nourishment will actually change our life and lifestyle. So Sarah, your thoughts, your expression and your knowledge that you have shared today have really enriched and helped us that how we can complement this whole system of the body, mind and soul, particularly through nutrition to make changes because nervous system change with our food and the ingredients. So thank you so much for that. I think we have got the next speaker. So um, hand over to maybe uh, any other thoughts otherwise we can move on to next session i'm very conscious of time thank you 
thank phenomenal. You. So once again, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. A big global namaste to you. I look forward to catching up with you soon as well. Without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Amrita, who has always been so sensational, her happy, smiley self that always comes onto screen and brightens up our day, to introduce the next speaker, Rotan Lal Goal, to us and to have a fantastic session. So, Global Namaste, Amrita, please take over. Global Namaste, Riddhi. It's always really wonderful to have you as a co-host with me and also Dr. Rajiv uh, for having this episode and making it so successful. It's really very nice to be a part of it. Um, let's welcome Rotarian Lal Goel. Uh, Global Namaste to you, Rotarian Lal Goel. Global Namaste to you, Amrita. Rotarian Lal Goel is the founder and charter president of Rotary Club of Organ Donation International. He is also chairman of Organ Donation India Foundation and Gyan. And today we have with us Dr. Rotarian Lal Goel with his guests, which who will be talking about how integrated medicinal system is so useful and wonderful. And the integration of health therapies is one of those spectrums that we must look forward to make this earth a better one so welcome again and over to you for the session of an hour, hour or so 45 minutes thank you thank you thank you very much amrita and thank you neil kumarji for giving me opportunity to host this particular segment on the integrated health transforming health care integrated health combines traditional medical practices with complementary and alternative therapies it emphasizes treating the whole person rather than just focusing on specific symptoms or disease. Integrated health approaches often incorporated lifestyle factors such as nutrition, exercise, and stress management. Patient empowerment and shared decision making are central tenets of integrated health care. The goal of integrated health is to promote wellness, prevent illness, and optimize overall health and well being. And today, to discuss and to give their views, we have a very elect uh, uh, panelist are with us. And I would like to invite my first panelist guest, and he is Dr. Rajiv Anand. Dr. Rajiv Anand is the senior psychiatrist and marriage counselor. Dr. Rajiv Anand passed his MBBS in 1976 and did his MD in psychiatry in 1980 from King's George Medical College, Lucknow. He opted to serve his country when it was very common to settle abroad for a brighter future. He has been serving society with his base in Mumbai. He has clients all over India as well as in many other countries. He was honored with the Lifetime Achievement Award by AMA. He has conducted more than 4,000 workshops for different groups and companies with an audience size of 10 to 800. His television program on various channels have been widely appreciated for his forthright and practical approach. He has been leading in the field of mental and emotional well-being for last 44 years. He was president of IMA for two times. He was interviewed in several talk shows in domestic and international circles. He is the author of a book on sex education for adolescents, which was released in 1994 by the Minister of Higher Education, Government of Maharashtra. Welcome, uh, Dr. Rajiv Anand, on this very, very special global show, which is brought by Healing Our Earth, courtesy uh, Mr. Neil Kumar and his team. And this show is being telecast for more than in more than 26 countries. So welcome and thank you very much for joining our this hour in India, which is 9 p.m. So Dr. Rajiv Anand, you know very well the subject today is integrated health, transforming healthcare. And being a leading psychiatrist and a, a medicine counselor, we would like to know from you, your views on integrated health, transforming healthcare, Dr. Rajiv Anand, please. Thank you, Mr. Dhan. I hope I'm audible. Just, uh, yeah, just, just, uh, just turn your mobile in a landscape uh, position uh, like this, so you will be, yes. Please. Is this right? Yes, yes, okay. please, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lal, for inviting me, and thank you to this organization based in London for talking on this very important very vital topic of integrating healthcare because these days there's a trend there's a fashion like the proverbial elephant 
the health care is even if one has caught one hair of the proverbial elephant's tail, one become expert in the hair of the tail. And one claim that he knows the elephant very well. So every small patty, every recognized, unrecognized patty claims to be all and end all or claim to be omnipotent and more than practicing their own knowledge in the judicious way, in the ethical way, there is unnecessary competition and rivalry to push out the others. In that background, India is the only country, not after we were born, much, much before for centuries, India is the only country which has allowed all kind of pathies, all kind of traditional medicine, all kind of Yunani medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, homeopathy, magnetotherapy, and acupressure and acupuncture, and many other not so easily mentionable or rememberable names. Now, each one of them may not be omnipotent may not be effective in all decisions in the spectrum. Each one of them have a role. When we are talking about integrated medicine, when we are talking about the transforming healthcare, then we have to take pride and we have to celebrate. Like in Hindi, we call it Vasudev Katumbukam Kutumbukam. Ki pura vishwa hamara ghar hai. The same philosophy is applicable to that we all have the same traditions in the past. I am talking a few words in Hindi here. Some of the people would understand it and I would equally translate it into English also. That we believe in the words of wisdom. We believe in the practice which is inspired by the wisdom of the ages, wisdom of the sages. Wisdom of the ancient time. In Hindi, we call it Nani Dadi Ke Nukse. Popular term is Dadi Nani Ke Nukse. And many of us so-called highly educated people laugh at it. What is this? But very often, that's the best and the fastest remedy. Where an antibiotic or a painkiller may take three, four days time with the potential side effects on various organs of the body, this so-called Nani Dari Ke Nipse can give it relief, be it from pain or be it even from the fever at times or the burning sensations, so on and so forth. So India can take pride in this fact that we have been working since ages, much before we began talking about it. The transforming healthcare has been an ongoing exercise in this country. Integrating medicine has been an ongoing endeavor for for hundred of years. Haven't we heard about that Shushuta was the first person who did the plastic surgery of nose, cosmetic surgery or nose in nose implant? It may sound incredible to us, the present people. Shushuta who was thousands of years back. In those days, where were the operation theater? Where were the post-operative care? Where were the anesthesia? Yet, it was done. I also heard, read somewhere, the king of Varanasi, long, long back, he had to undergo an operation. Anesthesia was not easily available. And he needed to be operated. He needed to be operated periotomy, uh, sorry, whatever abdomen is opened out and access to that. And he willingly allowed it. He said, I would change my mindset. I would fine tune my mind. I would go into a different realm or different phase. And I would go through the operation without making any disturbance, without making any noise. And this is well documented. Operation was performed on him. An operation was successful. How many hundred of years back? I may not be ready with that figure, but this is well documented. 
back to the topic of the integrated medicine. Each of this pathy has got its own beauty, has got its own unique, specific features. If this is applicable in 10% patient population, why we should not give the benefit to that 10%? I'm a psychiatrist based in Bombay, passing for 43 years. I believe in all patterns. I also believe in different kinds of approaches. Fine, in one way, many of us would look down upon these practitioners for few reasons that many of these practitioners for their own regions of identity crisis. Natural healing is one such. When any person having read one or two books become natural healing doctor and he called himself doctor. And there are enough gullible, vulnerable population in this vast country who just see the name of doctor and will go to him and pay him peace for but he's not a qualified one. So in this big ocean of humanity in this country, many people have their own need for identity elevation. So they use this various pathways to elevate this social standing on the doctor, but they are not qualified one. I would prefer that they call themselves natural not even dog. Or for the matter, homeopaths should be called homeopath, not doctor. Magnetotherapist, magnetotherapists. Arveda Char, Arveda Char, not Bachelor of Unani Medicine and Surgery, the UMS or BAMS, Bachelor of Ayurvedic Medicine and Surgery. Anyway, that's a different aspect of looking at things. The positive aspect, the brighter aspect, they have something unique which works wonderfully in certain section of people. Now, who would decide which particular client? Those people of any particular specialty, they would fight among themselves to drag a client to their domain. Every patient can be treated by homeopathy. Every patient can be treated by magnetotherapy. Every patient can be treated by acupressure. Every patient can be treated by acupuncture. That may be their training. That may be their inculcated, borrowed, conditioned belief system. That may not be true for all fields. But they have been trained to believe that and talk about it. Again, I am sidelined with this. But if someone who believes, who accepts, who respects different methods, different approaches, to healing the human, to healing the suffering. And there's someone could be who have little knowledge of many such pathies and who have vast knowledge of his own, own speciality. And there's someone could be, I believe, many of you may not agree with me, someone could be fully highly educated in the modern system of medicine. I'm emphasizing the word modern system of medicine. Because modern system is edu any educated person is sensible person. He has no need to impose or force his views on others. He is willing to listen. He is willing to accommodate. He is willing to accept. Like India, the only nation in the world where you can find church, you can find mosque, you can find gurdwara, and you can find chantam, you can find synagogue, and you can find many other kind of uh, different beliefs, different religions. And they watch this without any internal war. Well, all of us know about it. Many of these religious faith, they have their own various sects and they fight among themselves. Needless for me to name any particular one. But even I heard that even Buddhism had, probably if I heard about it correctly, 300 different, different uh, sub faith or different divisions in that. And all those few hundred or 300 are talking about Buddhism only. So they have recycled, repacked Buddhism. Well, back to the main topic. That India is the only nation which traditionally had believed what more we can, what better we can. I come from this country. I take delight and I take pride in believing in that and practicing that. My belief has helped me huge inputs. Of whichever faith, whichever pathy, 
and has helped my clients more than me. It may not have helped me become richer. That's not my goal. It may not have helped me become popular. That is never been my agenda. It may not have made me feel bloated in my ego that I'm the best. That has never been part of my living focus. No, it has helped my clients. If a client can be focused by meditation, if a client can be helped by, by pranayam, if a client can be held by various kind of even Surya Namaskar, if a client can be held by different kind of yogic asanas, if a client can be held by chanting, if a client can be held by various subtle myriads of ways of transcending your body, transcending your mind, going beyond the boundaries of the body and mind, and merging your consciousness into higher consciousness. And I, am, I have right reason to believe that India is the fourth paradigm. The whole world has borrowed this wisdom from India, from our saints and sages. That's why all over the world you would hear various gurus, various saints, various popular names who are shining globally. They have presentation from presentation from India. Be it from Isavaran, or Mahesh Yogi, or Deepak Chopra, or should they all more Indians? So India had been trying to integrate many paths, many things which are helping our human population in endless number of ways. That's the small message I would like to share over here. We are spiritually rich, we are culturally rich. And we try to share it as best as possible. Let's not have a very narrow vision, narrow view, a skewed view. Let's not believe in that if I'm a tiny island country, I can fight with anyone in the world. No, I should know I'm a tiny island. I cannot fight with the whole world. I don't make sense. Similarly, if there is any party which is attractive, applicable, in certain well identified, well diagnosed cases, so be that. Why we should deny that? There have been various acupressure, acupuncture, even dance therapy, even music therapy, even laughter therapy. Many people may find it unscientific. But different ways to make a person feel better, different approaches to make one diversify his mind or divert his mind specifically from illness-centric, from suffering-centric to highly. To be happy on the fourth front, since the communication medium for the internet was not as easily accessible, maybe the India might not have been able to reach out to the world and enlighten the world that we are already doing it. But ever since the communication technology improved last 10, 20, 30, 40 years, see the way everywhere yoga exercises, everywhere yoga teachers, religion, prana, everywhere meditation. So I would like to add over here my brief contribution. If anything, any further question or so, I would take it up. Thank you Thank very you. much, uh, Dr. Rajiv Anand, for giving your views. And as you rightly said, that uh, integrated health is not one. Pathy, it's a combination of pathy. The main aim is to see that the person, sh the suffering should end. And that is a very, very good message from a doctor, an allopath doctor, to tell everyone that you don't believe that only one pathy can work. Thank you very much. We will come back to you. Please be, be on the line. Uh, now, I would like to introduce and invite my next panelist guest, and she's Professor Dr. Rashmi Kundapur. Professor Dr. Rashmi Kundapu is the additional professor, Department of Community and Family Medicine, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. She completed her MBBS in 2001 and MD in 2006 at JJM Medical College, Deva Gri, Karnataka with first class. She has 105 publications with an H index 16 and 20 as an I index with one. 1093, 1093 citations, publications with impact factor ranging from 0.51 to 5.53.
She has more than 60 presentations at various state, national, and international conferences. She is the editor of the IAPSM textbook of preventive and social medicine published in 2019, second edition in 2021, and third in 2024. She is the editor of the IAPSM textbook of comprehensive research methodology. She has written 12 chapters in three books. She has given more than 52 guest lectures and trainings. She was invited to speak up for three international conferences and 15 national conferences and workshops. At the 31st National Conference of 2004, she won the Young Female Scientist Award. She was awarded the Young Scientist Award by Kut at the 46th conference in Manipal by the Karnataka Association of Community Health in the year 2011. In the 46th Nation Conference of 2018, IAPSM, she was awarded Presidential Appreciation Award. In the 47th Nation Conference 2019, she was awarded a Fellowship in Preventive and Social Medicine, FIAPSM. She won the Best Published Paper Award in the 51st Conference of IAPSM in 2024. She has completed seven funded projects as co-investigator and 10 projects are ongoing. She was secretary for IMA Mangalore 2019-20. She is the vice president of IAPSM for the year 23-24. Welcome, uh, Professor Dr. Rashmi Kundapur on our show. Professor Dr. Rashmi Kundapur, you are in the community and family medicine and uh, very popularly known even in Karnataka and nowadays in uh, Hyderabad, where you are based. Uh, uh, Professor Dr. Rashmi Kundapur, just you have heard uh, the Dr. Rajivan and where he mentioned that all pathies are invited. If some pathy is working 5% or 10%, let it work. No one can claim that everything. Now, being a professor in a uh, government run, a very prestigious institute called All India Institute of Medical Sciences, we would like to know your views on integrated health, transforming healthcare. Professor Dr. Rashmi Kundapur, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Algolji, for invite me, inviting me into this uh, talk for the session for this. I want to start the session with a small uh, story for, by which I started joining the medicine. Here comes what is called science, what is called belief. So I'm just starting with that story. I joined medicine when I was, uh, I was not even thinking of a medicine. When I was thinking of journalism, I suddenly, well, my mother who was suffering from some problems in, in her gut and she was not getting uh, increased in her weight from 35 kgs to suddenly went to an Ayurvedic practitioner near my home who was quite well known at that period of time and was treated suddenly to be a, a good treatment for himself. And then she was suddenly gained a 10 kg of weight in a year. And I realized, oh, this is something as a important thing and a miracle which has happened, which made me feel that I should learn the med this part of miracle from this man. I was a 16 year old going into my 11th standard, wanted to learn miracle from that person, went to him and said, I want to work with you and learn this miracle to be a better healer. At that time, I believe that people are the healers and I said I want to be a better healer with working with you I do not want any degree I just want to be with you he was my classmate's uh, uncle so I knew him also he suddenly he told me very clearly that he was an Ayurvedic physician being trained in BHU that is Banaras Hindu University and then want, wanted to do it on himself and he was going into and he clearly told me I it will not be possible for him to take me because of many reasons because he stays in a forest takes things and many other things and after that then I asked him could I join an Ayurvedic college or a homeopathy college and learn from what so the man who was at that period of time at his 66 who was trained Ayurvedic physician told me that if I have to learn science and medicine I have to get a degree of mine an MBBS degree from in modern medicine because that is the science is not on belief or not believing in miracle but believing in evidence and he had always felt that many of the other part of the um, system is lacking the evidence which I have to learn an evidence from the modern medicine and transform whatever is there from the other medicine into the this integrated health was spoken to me by the man in at my 16 for which I joined into a medical college. 
that was the start of the journey to start on with again coming up to saying that it's not the belief what we have to and if i want to say that osteology which was not considered as a medicine which was a mexican medicine in us right now is taken in a forefront and they the people who finish their uh, bachelors in osteology could be taken into the normal residency that's what is happening in the us that they will be taken into residency along with other people who have done their bachelor of medicine that in their residency so they're saying saying that that has to be integrated why did that happen over a period of time the osteology started as an universities in the south us where they started to bring up evidence to the system of medicine unless there is an evidence i believe that it's not about the belief it's a science science is questioning and getting an answer to the question so unless you question and start getting an answers with the question it cannot be a complete science so integration of health what integration of medicine is possible when the evidences is been created within all the system what has been present i'm not saying that what is present is a system is a wrong something which is unanswered is not wrong it has to be answered it has to be taken a stand so the point is it's not just a belief or it's not just the help but it is how much of help and what type of help to what extent it can help we have to bring in into the system and being in all india institute I, if all of you all know indian government has started all india institute of medical science has by itself started and all india institute of ayush which is coming up in goa and there are recently they have called for the faculties and they are trying to develop a system in which the ayush medicine is transforming into the same system where there will be brought of all india institute of medical sciences all over the country are brought in to collaborate the medical teaching and the research in any of the part of the medicine and so that is the same reason ayush has been started in goa and that could be a milestone to bring in integrated medicine into the forefront I'm not saying it's not present as the earlier speaker were himself saying there are many people who believe they are healers everybody can think they are healers even a preachers can think they are healers but healing is not medicine by itself or uh, what we talk about a placebo therapy is not a medicine integrated medicine has to happen it's a it's a truth integrated medicine by itself is a truth but unless the truth is said that what extent is this is to be taken into consideration becomes a science science is again searching of truth so we should as part of all the medicine search into the truth to what extent and what are the consequences they can do for example many of them claim that yoga is a treatment i believe i'm like i it has been already proven yoga has a lot of preventive aspects which is well well by itself proven but for the treatment i'm not sure how much has been proven but the prevention aspects to bring into the community to bring in to develop your within systems it is very good it has been proven so what has been proven is to be accepted what is not to be what is not been proven has to be proven or has to be taken as a truth to understand and make a further consequences not always say that that's what that should be the people who are trained in whatever concept of medicine they are should be become science science scholars i'm not telling scientists but scholars or researchers by themselves and start start finding the real truths in themselves not just go on a hearsay or go on a mythology or go on a history but they have to be in line with today's concepts of what is the etiology of pathogenesis or etiology of a disease may not have been found out few years back somebody must have been doing something which was unknown but when it is found out what is even before cholera was been found a water sanitate uh, sanitation person just did that by stopping the water going there that doesn't mean he found in medicine for cholera he prevented cholera but when we came to know vibrio cholerae is a disease by its cause cholera is caused by vibrio cholerae you need a treatment for vibrio cholerae so these aspects we have to move in for integration the integration has not happened because there is 
concepts in both the places which is going wrong means the concept of scientific mind in other systems and the people rigidness in the modern medicine believing that they themselves are the only scholars yes because they are doing that and others are not doing this is the concepts which has to be broken ring to make the integrated medicine to work out and that's what happened in many of the countries could be in us or germany where they brought in other medicines into the system so my would want to say that transformation in healthcare will happen if the integrated medicine would happen scientifically and take into consideration of everybody and no belief and science comes as a truth thank you very much uh, professor kundapur for giving your forthright views as always and uh, you rightly said that the, the lacking lack of research the results which has not yet come out uh, has is that's why the other therapies uh, are, are lacking otherwise if they will have the proper research if their the results are proven then definitely and if it is published in journals like a uh, lancet etc definitely uh, then uh, then people would like to have more faith and they can be used scientifically and, and then we can very well say that it is a really integrated health uh, care because that then we can integrate scientifically thank you very much uh, dr rashmi kundabo please stay i would like to invite my next panelist guest and he is dr m anand Kulal, uh, Dr. Kulal is B.Sc. M.B.B.S. Diploma in Diabetes, P.G.D.H.A. M.B.A. I.A.P.C. Certificate of uh, in Palliative Medicine Fellowship in Family Medicine. He is a senior medical officer in the Department of Palliative Medicine, District Venlock Hospital, Mangalore. He worked as Chief Medical Officer, Professor, and Hospital Administrator at Shrinivas Medical College Hospital, Shrinivas University, and Shrinivas Group of Colleges, Mangalore. He worked as PRO, Medical Officer, and Chief COVID Medical Nodal Officer at District Venlock Hospital. He is a recognized resource person for legal, social, and ethical aspects of family medicine and family medicine practice. He organized and attended more than 150 CMEs programs of the Family Doctors Association and Indian Medical Association, Mangalore, to as president and secretary he organized several blood donation camps and free medical and diabetes checkup camps around mangalore he was actively involved in bringing out a pharmacology textbook for paramedical students he is involved in several survey oriented research studies like effect of school bag weight on school children role of physical psychological and financial factors of a driver in road traffic accidents effect of yoga and exercises on diabetes militants he is the past president and secretary of the family doctors association mangalore he was the district coordinator and chief secretary indian medical association mangalore he was the president director of indian medical association family doctors wing he was the national working committee member of ima he organized and attended more than 200 medical cmes as a resource person as well as an observer nominated by the karnataka medical council and rg uhs he received several awards like prestigious d devraj urs state award 2022 dr b c roy award ima karnataka 2019 20 rf bhat state award dk district rajyotsav award giants international award sadhna ratna award ima national president appreciation award swasti shri state award etc 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 so many awards welcome dr kulal on our show dr kulal you have heard our earlier panelist guest about the integrated health Yes. One, yes. Uh, and Dr. Uh, uh, Rajiv Anand said that it is it has to be a combination. Every therapy, every uh, pathy is having the advantages. We should utilize them. Dr. Kundapur is forthrightly said that until unless it is not scientifically proved, we cannot use it. But it should research has to be done. Now, you being a family uh, medicine doctor and doing so many rather, you are famous for the second opinion. we would like to know from you your views on integrated health uh, transforming the healthcare uh, dr kulal please dr kulal are you there please uh, please give your views rotendian lal i think he has dropped the signal but uh, yes fantastic question that you have posed that let us integrate and maybe with scientific research we can even claim it or do health authorities and we yeah, i think he's we, there we've him back we've got him back and here he comes yes dr kulal please unmute yourself yes, yes yes sorry i am at my village 
uh, i am attending my daughter's birthday she is her birthday i met my village so okay. my link is my net is very low but i strongly appreciate uh, this kind of discussion being a family physician after t- around 30 years experience being a palliative medicine practitioner i strongly uh, say that what dr rashmi said what is not scientifically not proved it should not be considered as any sort of medicine because we should not cheat the people in the name of holistic medicine or it may be uh, any clubbed medicine but i agree uh, it should take care of your Oh, body, mind, and soul, irrespective of the medicine. It may be allopathy, it may be homeopathy, it may be uh, whatever you say. Uh, it may be Irish, but uh, they should strongly believe. They should strongly believe in scientific. Doctor Kula, your mobile is you have to keep it like noise. I, yeah, again, it I, is. Oh, please, please go ahead. Okay. Huh? Okay. So I strongly believe as a family physician. I started my practice from a slum area. just for 10 rupees to a metro city side now in the same town so i have seen a patient from the 5 rupees rupees to 5000 rupees to walk, come walking to the opd i have seen so what i feel is they need a humanitarian basis approach to the human being not the, the posh and the integrated or international standard treatment they need a basic human uh approach is required i feel they need a sweet touch they need sweet talk they need a very healthy communication the communication is missing whatever the uh, integrated medicine or allopathy medicine or homeopathy medicine the communication is missing the india or world or universe it requires the communication patient and uh, doctor relationship is spoiled that is required only it is possible because of the family physician the family medicine is vanishing now it is the extinction it is in the breed of extinction so we have to take care of the family medicine family medicine mean they should have given enough time to the people to discuss they are not only a physical disease not only the physiological disease along with the physical and physiological we should take care of their psychological they have to take care of their ethical part at the same time you have to take care of their spiritual type up also the spiritual health is also important nowadays we are not thinking of their economic status we are not thinking of their family history we are failing in taking the detailed history of the family our personal history economic history financial history we are failing everywhere that's why the whole world is looking for the combination of everything combination of everything should be as rashmi dr rashmi said we through work together she was my secretary when i was the president of ima we have found that she is a community diagnoser we have found that proved one the fake medicine should not be given fake injection should not be given because they believe they trust they come to you means we have to take care of their faith we have to take care of their trust the trust is breached nowadays that's why a lot of attacks are going on on him a hospital lot of attacks are going on on the doctors lot of attacks are going on the health institute this should be stopped I mean first you should be a human being you have to take care of the feelings of the public our patients who are coming to you that's why i am talking to you in palliative medicine as a family physician after 25 years of practicing family medicine i am shifted to uh, go because of some covid environment because of some other crisis i have shifted to my palliative medicine i did specialization in palliative medicine how i found that palliative medicine is the branch is going to be geriatric medicine family palliative medicine these are the medicines is going to be in future you have to take care of the end stage people you have to take care of the bed care we have to take care of the psychological aspect of the people that is missing in the world whole universe is suffering from psychological problems psychological disturbance whole universe is looking toward the where we are getting a emotional support where you are getting the psychological support that is only possible in the family medicine and integrated medicine you have to mix everything you have to see that which is helpful to them you have to give them it may be ayurveda it may be unani it may be yoga it may be whatever it is but it should give a relief we should not cheat the uh, patient by the name of fake medicines that is the things i want to tell as a family physician we can talk plenty on these things we can debate this all thank you very much uh, dr kulal for giving views and you have given a new dimension about the spirituality also that is very very important because if we can not treat and we know that the end is coming and if we give some spiritual uh, things to the patient and that patient uh, 
gets the solace in that. That is also very important for the healthcare. So thank you very much. Uh, now over to you, Amrita, uh, as you have given me the time limit. So I have to also follow the time limit as our Dr. Gupta has also mentioned earlier. Uh, Dr. Rotarian Lal Goyal, thank you very much for your wonderful host. Uh, Dr. Kulal, being the past uh, president of IMA, you are going to be a valuable source. So Rotarian Lal will contact you with our do Dr. Wai Ching and Dr. Rajiv Gupta at Healing Our Yes, Earth. sir. Yes, sir. I'll, be, I'll in... be in the service. I'll be in the service. Yeah, we are taking integrated health in-person service in 2025 in London where we can create some white and blue preppers so it will be very useful. You can say a quick hello to Dr. Rajiv Gupta, one of our producers here. Rajiv, unmute yourself and say hello to Dr. Kulal and uh, Rotarian Lal Goyal. You are on mute, uh, Dr. Gupta. Okay, he's frozen, so let's, just in case he's freezing there because he's driving. Okay, Rajiv. Concentrate on your driving. We'll come back to you. Uh, Riti, say hello to both the guests. Uh, Wai Ching, if you are there, put your camera on. Uh, quick say hello, and then we'll be back to you, Wai Ching. Just say hello to the IMA's ex-president, who is in India. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us and to provide such a valuable session to bring together different modalities and through individual life experiences to it was lovely to hear you and to have your contribution today. Thank you, Riti. Stay around. Wai Ching, say hello to the former uh, IMA president in India, uh, Dr. Lal. I think he's there back in his party. Uh, say hello. Hello, Ching, Lal. Say hello to Rotary. Hello. Lal can you hear well. me? Yeah, we can hello, hear can you. Hear also, Dr. Gupta and, uh, Fantastic. Hello, Thank you, Roman. So much, much for your. Sorry, I think, I think meet, meet and say hello to uh, Rotarian Lal Gohel, and later he will be part of our forum that we want to do with the World Health Council and the Healing Our Earth that will be leading the way in London 2025. Say hello to Dr. Uh, Rotarian Lal Gohel. Excellent. I'm really pleased to um, make your acquaintance and also to collaborate in integrative health and uh, with the World Council for Health as well, of which uh, Healing Our Earth is a coalition partner. And we are starting World Council for Health India now with a few doctors already in place, and I would love to introduce them with you, to you as well. And so we can, together, we can make a difference. For yeah, that. Uh, Amrita will facilitate some introduction. Rokhati Lalgoy, you are a regular producer now, and you've got a lot of eminent... Uh, contributors that are coming. Uh, uh, Rajiv Gupta, you are driving. Please concentrate on driving and we'll have you in a while because your signal is intermittent over there. Uh, Waiting, stay around and we will talk about a few things in a moment. Uh, Amrita, let's share what is happening in a while at Healing Our Earth. So if you could share the episodes over here. And then we'll go to Dr. Anil Sharma, who will be taking over from uh, here onwards with Mavish and other people. So let's introduce a few of our future events over here. Amrita, if you could read that out. Yes, yes. So in the near future, we are celebrating the fourth anniversary of Healing Our Earth on 7th of April, 2024. So let's celebrate, come together and cheer up on the gesture of the fourth anniversary, singing, chanting, sharing up your messages as well as your experiences and delivering a lot of expertise as well on this day. And then the next week, the next Sunday, which will be, and by the way, all these episodes are an on different partner channels run from 2 p.m. British summer time onwards. So on 14th of April, we are having Ram Naomi special where we'll be having a combination of what happened in Ayodhya, the Ram Pratishta, as well as the celebration of bhajans, kirtans, and a lot more on 14th of April, 2 p.m. British summer time onwards. The next Sunday after that, we will be having something really yummy that you can have on your plates as well as your dining. 
So with the vegan and vegetarian kitchen achieving good health gastronomically, join us for this free global online session on 21st of April, 2 p.m. BST. Coming up is the World Tai Chi and Qigong Day on 28th of April, 2024, and we'll be celebrating it with a partnership of Tai Chi and Qigong associations worldwide on 28th of April, 2 p.m. British Summer Time. So we all look forward to have you all on these episodes to make us everything so more beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita. Riti, stand by. Rajiv, you are driving, so I would suggest you concentrate on your driving, please. If you want to say a quick hello, unmute yourself. Over to you, Rajiv. Okay, thank you so, so much. Uh, I was having some problem. It was not letting me unmute, says post code. So I think it was fantastic to hear uh, all the thoughts, and I would say that uh, I have been a, a Western medicine practitioner. And I know in India, uh, for commercial reasons, there are a lot of other issues uh, which prevent this integration. But being in the Western world, uh, where the people are more advanced, there is more evidence base, and there is no personal uh, animosity with other uh, sciences, I think the integration is, in a sense, and it must happen, and it must go on. There is a lot of work that has gone into it, and I'm so good that some of the speakers were very keen that this should uh, progress forwards, and I'm pretty sure that with good research that we are collecting and all the sciences bringing their food onto the plate so that the whole plate look good. You can have one vegetable, one dal, uh, one sweet, the chapati, and then one guri, and that sort of stuff. But the plate looks not good. And this is how we are doing that. All the pathies or sciences or whatever needs to come together. I'm, 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 I, I took uh, into account uh, some people were saying, oh, there is uh, not, it's a quackery. It's not a quackery. It is more scientific. Even this, I am. And I you comment people or you can't uh, treat or cure. But there are conditions where you can because diabetes, if you do want to cause this species pancreas and reduce the insulin. And so there is a scientific basis. Most important thing is people who are not bothered to look into the scientific basis, they will continue to pass those comments. But let's just move forward. And you know, we have heard how acupuncture can help chronic pain where there is no cure in acute medicine or modern medicine. We have heard about the Tai Chi Chi Gong, how the movements can help uh, arthritis and other problems. We have heard about Ayurveda or plant based medicines, which have very little side effects compared to chemicals. We have heard about different local family. We have heard about other parts. So I think it's a fantastic day. Thank you so much for the speakers and the audience for a very good participation. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rajiv is uh, commenting that there is some scientific-based evidence which is now progressing towards there. So the Western will touch in touch with Eastern through the integrated programs, and we will make sure that we will share some of the scientific data that are trickling in now. World is advanced, so yes, it is fine that we need scientific evidence which we are progressing. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, sorry for intermittent uh, uh, sound there. Uh, Riti, let's go to our famous Dr. Ranit Sharma, who has been in Healing Our Earth before. And let's carry on with our next round of things. And Rajiv, please, as soon as you are settled in a, in a, in a permanent place, come back again. So, Riti, over to you. Thank you. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Anil Sharma. Dr. Neil Sharma is a practitioner of alternative medicine. He's been practicing yogic neurotherapy since the last 31 years, and the last 20 years have been in London. He is a yoga neurotherapy, which is based in yoga, asana, and physiology. 
stimulating nerves and glands by applying pressure on specific parts of the body. He does it so well and so meticulously that he even combines it with nutrition in order to reduce inflammation. So global namaste, Dr. Neil Sharma. How are you today? I am very, 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 very good. And uh, hello to everyone. And good evening to everyone from London. So, uh, uh, so could you please tell us how yogic neurotherapy helps to A, reduce pain and B, help with chronic conditions? Yes. So basically what uh, we uh, do in this therapy is the applying the pressure on the uh, certain body parts and divert the blood towards certain glands. And according to the condition, we choose the gland that which gland is needed to produce which chemical. Like if we want to produce uh, heparin, we stimulate liver. If we want to produce sodium bicarbonate, we stimulate pancreas. So everybody knows if we have uh, want to neutralize the acid, we have to produce or we have to enhance more alkaline in the body. So body produce sodium bicarbonate, the alkaline through the pancreas. So this is how we use the body's own physiology. So physiology means what enzymes body is producing, what hormones body is producing, and steroids and uh, antibodies, antibiotics, and uh, different kind of uh, other chemicals. So this is how we take the, it's like in anti, uh, anti-inflammatory, first we want to control the acids of the body. So we produce alkaline through the pancreas and liver. And then we go on to the left kidney to excrete extra uh, acidity from the body. Then we go on to the steroid side as well through the adrenal gland. So this is how we produce the medicines inside the body and which is called the internal medicine system of the body. So in yogic neurotherapy, basically we learn about the uh, physiology of the body and apply according to the glands, according to the uh, different diseases and according to their, like if you go to the uh, uh, modern medicine doctor for painkiller, they give you the anti-inflammatory steroidal or non-steroidal. So that would work through your blood system, but going through your stomach. So going through your stomach, it can destroy your stomach lining, your uh, other uh, uh, body parts, your liver will get extra uh, stimulation to eliminate. Your kidney can get, uh, in the long term, kidney can get a little bit uh, sluggish because of the long term of painkillers. But what we do is the producing the alkalines or the anti-acids or the anti steroid inside the body where it is needed. So this is what is the difference in modern medicine and in the yogic neurotherapy. So this is how we reduce the inflammation. And in UK conditions, in the damp conditions, cold conditions, no sun, vitamin D is less. So a lot of inflammations and a lot of osteoarthritis kind of thing, degenerations are really very, it's too much, too many people suffers with that. So we're, I'm very successful in them to reduce the pain. So here we can fill up the gap of the painkillers and st- uh, stimulate the body within to heal the inflammations. Fantastic. So your therapy works really well with inflammation to begin with. I think it's the first two weeks, if I remember correctly, that it works on reducing the acid, controlling what it is that we're eating, really trying to create the alkaline conditions within. And how does that help us when it comes to controlling the nervous system, calming the nervous system, creating a sense of homeostasis? How does this help? Yeah, so so calming the, the body system, everybody knows the serotonin is the happy hormone. So serotonin is produced in our body and the neurotransmitters through the, you know, the apineferine and the serotonin. These are the two chemicals which mix together and makes our, makes our brain cheerful. So our small intestine, 
our small intestine is the main uh, producer of the serotonin. That is all, uh, also called the second brain of the body is the small intestine. So our uh, brain has to be cheerful, our intestine should be very healthy. So what we do with this therapy, we increase the blood circulation or if you have seen the yoga, uh, the uh, posture called the Vajrasan. If you do the Vajrasan, Vajrasan is just the uh, folding your legs and sitting in it uh, when the Muslims sit in the namaz position. What it does, it just slows down or cut down your uh, blood supply in your legs area. And what, what is the result of that? It increases the blood circulation in your gut area, in your stomach area. So this is what is the principle of the yoga, diverting the blood supply through the different postures and increasing the blood supply where it is needed most or more at the time of giving the treatments. So this is what is our application of the therapy. And then serotonin and your uh, uh, apinephrine from adrenal gland and from the, in females, it's from the right ovary. We stimulate it and makes them like in menopause cases. Is, uh, this is what is our targeted glands. And small intestine, then uh, your uh, adrenal gland and your right ovary in females, if they have. Then I have seen loads of loads of patients gets come out of the even severe depressions. Yes. Yeah, so how, how does this therapy help with like the mind conditions as well? Because there's a very real connection, as you just mentioned, between the mind and the gut. The gut is actually the second brain. So we are actually working on the HPA axes. We're able to access both of them to be able to calm down the body and the mind to a state where we can actually work with it, where it's conducive to help us to reach a state of optimal health. So how do you feel that we can actually boost these things? So mostly, the see, the uh, what is the most important for our body is first is the oxygen, second is the water, third is the food. Thank so you. food comes last. So whenever you have any kind of uh, nervousness or anything, you start doing deep breathing. Drink a glass of water, start doing little deep breathing and deep breathing will increase the oxygen in your body. And the last thing is the food. So avoid the food which produce the more inflammation or gas. Like uh, people say this is the gastric uh, trouble making uh, foods. Like some people don't... Uh, uh, get digested properly with the cauliflower or with the uh, aubergine or with the, some uh, peppers. So they produce more gases in that. So gases is not the byproduct gas. Gases is the byproduct of the swelling or the inflammation in the stomach. If that inflammation is reduced, the gas, there will be no place for the gas to get collected. So to reduce the gases, we have to reduce the inflammation. If the inflammation is reduced, there is no place for the uh, gases. So that's how we treat the inflammation or the gas. People give the uh, Gaviscon and kind of anti-acids and all the other things to uh, give the lit, uh, time being time being relief. But if you want the longer effect of the body and getting calmer and uh, more uh, uh, you know, like calm and quiet and relaxed. It should be, your gut should be very good. So lighter foods, do more Vajrasans, drink plenty of water, do deep breathings. These are the natural things what you can do. But when the patient comes to us, then we stimulate certain other things as well, other glands as well, to control the inflammation also. So controlling the gases means controlling the inflammation is the most important. <clears throat> Sorry. Is there then a real relationship between being able to stimulate the glands, being able to stimulate those organs, um, the breathing itself and Ayurved? Um, I think one of the things that you're mentioning there is knowing what foods to eat and when to be able to create that optimal health. So would you say that Ayurveda is actually a massive part of that? Yes. So Ayurveda has the 
वात पित्त एंड कफ वात इज वायु गैस एसिड पित्त इज एसिड एंड कफ इज एल्कलाइन सो दिस इज व्हाट इज द बेस ऑफ द आयुर्वेदा so gas is all over if you see if you anybody knows the physiology of the body our left side produces more acids our stomach is on the left side which produces 90% hydrochloric acid 90% concentrated hydrochloric acid in the stomach pancreas is a fish shape the pancreas head is on the right side which produces more alkaline sodium bicarbonate liver is also on the right side liver bile is also in nature is uh, alkaline so this is how we can uh, balance our body in dog yogic neurotherapy so acid is left side alkaline is the right side now food wise if the patient comes with the inflammatory diseases first two or three weeks as you know that we cut down we ask them to cut down the acidic foods like oranges and lemon and tomatoes and uh vinegar and these kind of things for one or two weeks when we start the treatment and ask them to drink at least 6 to 8 glass of water every day this is the dietary change we do normally uh, in our in inflammatory conditions patients and then we try to diagnose of uh, the thing that whether it is a alkaline is more or acid is more inflammatory always acid is more so then we start doing the alkaline treatments this is what is the line of uh, treatment in our therapy Fantastic. so this is how we relate with the ayurveda as well yes and also ayurveda has a deeper thing of ayurveda psychology which basically starts to work with the way that a person thinks a way that a person feels so by actually going through the treatment and by stimulating the different points by stimulating the different organs it seems to me that there's a sense of calmness that's created which calms down the nervous system which creates a balanced state of being it's almost like yoga where somebody basically goes through the asanas they go through the pranayam and then at the end when they lie down in shavasana it's just complete bliss mm -hmm. so it seems like by actually working with yogic therapy and by working with the way that the neurons are controlled even in the brain and the way that the brain and the gut are connected to each other it has a similar effect yeah so the calmness in the body like in you mentioned the shavasana in the uh, yoga so yes. when the shavasana shavasana is always uh, done and uh, after the whole uh, whole batch of whole asanas that is the last is uh, asked to do the shavasana and in shavasana they say do so the deep breathings it's the, not the shallow breathing just inhale around 4 second hold 2 seconds and exhale 4 second so slowly breathe in slowly breathe out so slowly breathe in slow, slowly breath uh, breathe out that means 10 seconds is the cycle which the one breath takes so in that 10 seconds body captures 50 100% what normally uh, in the shallow breathing the lungs capture 35% of the oxygen and in deep breathing lungs capture 70% of the oxygen so this is the difference of capturing the more oxygen so gives the relaxation to the nervous system and you know because you have taken this uh, neurotherapy how we give the therapy is give the pressures in lying down condition so patient is lying down so that is also lying down patient is nothing doing the therapist is doing the pressure on it so lying down we ask them to just do the normal deep breathing when we are applying the pressures so 10 15 minutes of the session they are capturing more oxygen and we are diverting the blood toward the suppose i choose the liver or pancreas or uh, the left kidney or right kidney depending on the diseases so that gets the extra blood supply extra oxygen extra nourishment whatever we eat reach through the blood to every cell of the body blood is the transporter as well carrying the oxygen carrying the nourishment carrying carrying the, the vitamins minerals to the particular cells and bringing the, the debris as well or carbon dioxide as well 
So blood is a transporter. Wherever the transport doesn't go, is the deficiency happens. So this is how our therapy is performed and gives the more relaxation. Even patient get go into the sleep while doing the treatment sometimes. Yes. <laughs> so that was absolutely fascinating, Dr. Neil Sharma. It's always a pleasure to speak to you and to learn more and see how the mind and the body connect together as well. Do stick around. We will be back with you for a panel discussion. But global namaste. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. So that brings us on nicely to Dr. Pierce, who is an Absolutely fascinating hypnotherapist. He's a registered clinical hypnotherapist and psychotherapist. He helps to release the emotional blockages that cause issues. And as a depression, anxiety and fear specialist, he enjoys helping people by using his knowledge and his experience. In fact, he's the man to go to for getting things into the right perspective. A global namaste to you, Dr. Piers, um, Piers Day. Thank you for joining us here at Healing Our Airs today. Good afternoon. Well, it's afternoon, afternoon here in it's afternoon here in England, anyway. Absolutely, yes. So you have a wealth of experience, and um, a lot of it you've practically you've built up in your clinical hypnotherapist experience over the last twenty to twenty five years, and you've worked with a myriad of um, clients as well. That many of them have actually been experiencing much of the problems that we've just been speaking about, where the nervous system has been out of alignment. Um, they're feeling certain things. There's emotional trauma that's going on. Which which is causing them to numb and lock down. Can you give us some more tips on that today, please? Yeah, one of the things interesting I was listening, um, I've been on, I've been in and out all afternoon lis right. listening to it. And what is interesting is people talk about the, the body and how the body deals with a lot of these the modern day problems. And when you listen to people, people who are experiencing problems, they go, I feel ill. I feel scared. I feel this. I feel that. It's not actually in my head. So one of the things I do is when I start working with people, I get them to close their eyes and I say to them, where in your body do you feel it? And they go, oh, my word, it's my chest. It's my stomach. It's my knee. It's my elbow. It's my thumb. Wherever it is, people feel it inside their body. And because they're feeling it, it's no longer in the head. So then we start connecting from the body into the head and the mind and body reconnecting. And as soon as you get that reconnection, you can then release the feeling. And the feeling is normally associated with something that's happened to them. As I say to people, something's happened before today to make you feel and act this way. And it's amazing how things from the past, whether when you were very, very young and you someone called you a poo-poo head in the sandpit, or whether it's something happened quite recently, something is making you feel bad. And we just got to release the blockages that inside people. And there are so many different ways. I mean, when I um, I kept, went, I spent quite a lot of time in Thailand a few years ago, and I learned Reiki. And releasing blockages just through that energy. A couple of years ago, I spent time in northern India. And that was amazing, just the, using the yoga and the breathing techniques and that sort of stuff to release the body's energy. And so I get very passionate with my clients, just getting them to, to feel things rather than blocking it. Because in the outside world, we try and keep all the problems away from us. And I say, when you work with me, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's face to face, I want people to take that front mask off and feel the problems so we can deal with them. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. One of the things I do a lot of is I work with teenagers and I work with suicidal people, people who are self-harming, um, have depression, anxiety, and basically do not want to be around anymore. And with them, I go and say, right, what are the feelings? What's driving this? I will never say to someone, don't do it. I'll say, okay, fine. You're being driven by a feeling 
let's release the feeling. And we use hypnosis, I use EMDR, I use tapping, I use breathing, I use meditation, um, I use mindfulness, all these things just to release the feelings. Sometimes I have to do a little bit of regression and go back and work with people to, to find that lost in a child. Other times we have to get rid of a lot of anger, a lot of frustration. And anger and frustration, if they're, if they're kept in and you keep pushing them down like this, become toxic. And those are the blockage feelings that you have inside your body. So when I work with people, this is what I love doing is someone comes in feeling really bad. And I say, okay, that's the person there. That's the old person. What do we want to create? Oh, the new person up here. So I'm actually looking at the finished article before I'm looking at the, the, the damaged person. And by dealing with the, wanting to know what they want and what they want to get through, it's very easy to work through it. So we're releasing emotional pain. We're using physical pain. I get a lot of people who come to see me because they've had an accident or something like that where they're feeling pain inside their body. And that's old pain. And that pain has no real business being in the body anymore. So we go into the mind and we use hypnosis and some other wonderful techniques um, to release the pain that's got trapped inside the body. So it's rather like having uh, a fire in a building and you put the fire out, but the fire alarm is still going. So we, sometimes we have to go back into the unconscious mind and reset it to allow the person to turn the pain off if it's safe to do. Now, I was working with a lovely lady quite recently, well, about six months ago, and she was a constant pianist and she had rheumatoid arthritis and her hands were like this, little old lady in her early 80s. And she used to play at the Royal Albert Hall in London. She was quite a, a big name in her day. And she had to stop playing because her fingers were just locked like this in pain. And we spoke to her unconscious mind in hypnosis and she released the pain. And this one got rid of all the old pain, the old pain to go, one of the techniques I use. And as we got rid of the pain, she started doing this. And her fingers, and she was moving her hands out. When she opened her eyes at the end of the session, she kept doing this. And so I haven't been able to do this for years. And she went home, got her piano, and did exactly what I told her not to do. But she went in and she started playing the piano. An hour and a half later, she stopped. And her husband came up to, into the room where she was and said, who was playing the piano? It sounded like the old you. And she said, yes, it was. And the next morning she rang me up. She said, Piers, it's all gone horrible. I can't move my fingers. So I said, come back in. And I said, what part of limit yourself that you do not understand? And I said, your body, we set up a signal inside the body to make sure you don't get hurt that as soon as you feel an ache, you stop doing it. So we reset the switch and she went back and she can do 15 to 20 minutes each day with her fingers like this. And as soon as she starts feeling an ache, she stops. And by doing that, six months later, she's still playing the piano. I had a wonderful um, Scottish rugby player who played for Scotland, the national team, and he broke his leg in a tackle. And he lost his nerve and he couldn't, he couldn't, uh, when his log leg was mended, he, every time he went in for a tackle, his body tried to protect him and was stopping him from doing it. We did exactly the same. And he started tackling again and he was really coming up in his game. But he was pushing himself until one day his body reacted and said, I'm not going to do this anymore. He got back in touch with me. We had to reset it. And he now knows that as soon as he starts feeling any ache, it goes like that, and the coaches swap him over with somebody else. So it's about negotiating with the mind, with the body, to make sure that you're safe not to redo the damage, not to do it again, not to hurt yourself again. When I'm working with people who are suicidal, again, what is the feeling, the F word, the 
feeling it's and for some reason the suicidal people it's normally just above the heart it's about here uh there's that little bit above the heart right in the center that's the point for most people i deal with where the problem is and that's where they feel it and if we take away the feeling and we can do it without knowing what the feeling is because as soon as we isolate the feeling by giving it a color and we disassociate the, the, the horrible feeling, just make it a color, which is generally gray or black. We can then get rid of the color and put something nice in there. So we take out the old and we put in the new, something really powerful, something that's going to really make them feel loved, safe, secure. So when working with people, especially the young people, I just... That to me is where the future is. And they're the people in the end of, you know, in 20 years time when I'm in an old people's home or um, needing help, they're going to be the people who are coming up in the world who are going to be looking after us. So I've got a vested interest in the future. So by getting people to concentrate on the body rather than the story, we can get rid of the pain, whether it's mental pain, physical pain, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, whether it's overwhelm. A lot of people I get, um, when I when they contact me, they say, Piers, I keep going into overwhelm and I cannot cope. That's too much information coming in. So we just slow the process down and let a lot of the, the overwhelm bounce off them and only the prioritised ones coming in. So using hip, hypnotherapy and various other, a blend of other therapies that I know and have learned over the last 25 years, we're able to deal with the problems in a way that I believe that when I started my journey into the therapy world and the coaching world, the counselling world, I uh, didn't exist. Or if they did exist, they were just all over the place. And people came in with NLP, and various other bits and pieces that I've learnt um, all over the world, that they are able to put together a system that works for pretty well everybody. And what amazes me is when people, when clients come to see me, they say, Piers, you're not surrounded by books or, or libraries of information. No, because it's all up here. I spend a huge amount of money and a huge amount of time every year just training and learning something new. So often when I'll listen to people on here, I'll contact them afterwards and say, can I learn what you do? Because to me, it complements what I do. And I love doing it without giving or get, without having people um, medicated. Because to me, when you go to a GP, they are so overworked. They know everything about the bones in your fingers and your skin and your nail and that sort of stuff, but they don't know, they're not trained in how to help people with mental health. And to them, it's just have another, have another, have another medication. And that to me is one of the, the, the shames of the world nowadays is it's too easy to medicate people. And there should be more people like my the fellow um, guests on this on this event um, who are able to help people, whether it's breathing, whether it's yoga, whether it's checking your body's pH, depending what it is. And that's what I love about alternative medicine is because it's a so it's so, so vast. And when, when I was in India, I arrived up there to on a yoga retreat for six weeks. And I, could, I was about as bendy as my mobile phone here. By the time I left it, I was a little bit bendy, but my mental state was so much better. I hope that made I hope that made sense. Absolutely. Piers, you have a wealth of experience, and it's always a pleasure to be able to tap into your own little crumb of what it is that you have to offer. And stay around. We will be back with you before the group discussion, but we're just going to move on now to our next guest speaker. So stick around. We'll be back. Thank you. Thank you.
So our next guest speaker is Mary Parrish. Um, she is a phenomenal woman. She specializes in Reiki and energy healing as well. She's from the UK and currently lives in Switzerland with her husband and two children. She has spent over 20 years of her life in corporate marketing and project roles as well as training in alternative therapies in her spare time. She was able to pursue her love of well-being after the move to Switzerland when she finally had time to put pen to paper and get down to those books. Simply well-being and simply gratitude and daily wins are her two books that she has authored really well. And she is currently a well-being coach and facilitator. Her message is your health is your wealth. And it's her favorite motto too. Mine too. Mary, welcome. Glebo Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> How Thanks. are you today? Uh, very good. Thank you. All good. Thank you. Fantastic. So I hear that you've actually gone through a lot of this yourself. Um, you've been able to give birth to your two children by just using the sense of hypnotherapy and um, coupled with the other modalities that you use and to really be able to calm yourself down where you're not having to actually go to the modern medicines, but you're able to actually tap into the knowledge that you have, that Eastern knowledge, uh, so to speak, the knowledge that is so powerful because it combines all of the different types of healing together, be that physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. So please go ahead, tell us a little bit more. Thank you. Um, I've absolutely loved being on today. I've been dipping in and out, listening to 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 all of the guest speakers, and um, uh, similar to all of you, I've always had a real interest in holistic ways of um, of doing things. Um, so what I was asked to speak on today was actually hypnobirthing, which leads on from, from your, um, your 15 minutes, peers on, on hypnotherapy. Hypnotherapy has always been close to my heart as I was somebody who suffered with anxiety and panic attacks a lot in my teenage years. So I actually found hypnotherapy, went to a hypnotherapist um, who taught me basically how to, how to control my breathing, how to control the panic attacks as and when they happened. And we also did some regression therapy to understand why they were happening um, and what have you. So I've always been a massive um, advocate of, you know, mind over matter um, and, and that actually, you know, the mind is what controls a lot of our physical symptoms. So in terms of what I wanted to talk about today was a little bit about my story as to how I came across um, hypnobirthing, um, which is, um, yeah, which, which I absolutely um, I'm very passionate about. So let me just, um, yeah, spend the next five minutes talking to you about my story. Um, I trained as a hypnotherapist in my early 20s after I had hypnotherapy myself just because I was fascinated by it. And one of the units which we did at the time was actually that of pain management. And there was many examples of patients that had been put into um, hypnosis and therefore had been operated on without any other form of anesthesia. And I found this absolutely amazing. Now, when I found out that I was pregnant, and we're talking nearly 20 years ago now, um, after I started telling people and the initial congratulations and everything that you get from, um, you know, from telling people that you're expecting a baby. But then soon after, a lot of women decided that they thought it was their right of passage to, to tell me of, you know, what was, what was about to happen from the birthing perspective. Um, so all of these horrific stories started coming up about, you know, the length of labor and, and the pain management and this and this and this and this and this. And it just didn't sit well with me at all. So I decided to go and Google an alternative to these very medicalized births, which had been explained to me by women. And I was very fortunate to come across hypnobirthing. And I was absolutely all in um, remembering, um, you know, the pain management side from my hypnotherapy course. So I booked myself and my husband onto this hypnobirthing course and off we went. Um, much to his dismay, I might, might add, he's not necessarily into all the holistic stuff that I am. But for me, the course was 
absolutely fascinating. And it's something which I really wish that certainly in the UK, it is taught um, alongside all other um, childbirth training, if that makes sense. So for me, there was there was three things really that the hypnobirthing course did. The first one was actually explaining to women how their body is actually working. Um, at no point in my life did anybody really explain what the body is doing when it's given birth. Um, my mother never told me. I was not taught this at school. Um, the midwife didn't share this information with me. But once we actually understood, you know, how all of the muscles are working during birth, um, and that there are specific breathing techniques that you can do to help to work with your body, um, I was absolutely 100% all in. Um, so that was the first thing that the hypnobirthing course actually teaches women is, first of all, first and foremost, how their body actually works and what it's supposed to be doing at the different stages of labor. Okay, the second thing that the hypnobirthing course teaches people um, is that of putting positive imagery into the mind. Okay, so everything I believe from the from the body perspective is mind driven. Okay, your whatever you think in your mind will play out in your body. So having positive imagery in your head when you're about to birth a baby is really important. And what we find certainly in the Western world is that Birthing is portrayed as something which is going to be excruciatingly painful. You've only got to turn on the TV or watch a film of, of a woman giving birth and you just think, oh, my goodness me, why do people do this? Um, whereas actually, you know, the reality is, is, is not necessarily that case. But by having all of this negative imagery um, that, you know, women are um, subject to, then they end up believing it. And this is one thing which hypnotherapy really helps to address is to get rid of all those negative um, beliefs and uh, images which we've been subjected to. And as part of the hypnobirthing course, you basically release that negative imagery and um, replace it with positive imagery. So you watch hypnobirths and oh my goodness they are just amazing to watch um you know they're they're just magical it's a very spiritual experience so as part of the hypnobirthing course you get rid of the negative energy sorry the negative images and they're replaced with positive images you know positive affirmations and actually when you see a woman birth using hypnobirthing and you realize it's possible it's like oh my gosh why does not everybody know this and the third thing which the course teaches you is that of self-hypnosis and breathing techniques. So after the course, I had a, um, a CD to listen to, which I religiously listened to every single day um, for the next three months. And it was basically a 35 to 40 minute meditation, if you like, where um, you um, you practice your breathing techniques, you listen to the music and somebody was guiding you in a meditation to open up all of your chakras and to basically tune into your body and tune into your baby and to know that the two of them are going to work in tandem when birthing came. And by listening to this CD over and over again, I was basically conditioning my mind to go straight into relaxation as when birthing started. A little trickle of music, honestly, even if I hear it now for this very day, I will just start relaxing because to me, my mind knows it has been conditioned that when I hear this music, it's time to relax, to chill out, conscious mind over here and body to start to relax. So I religiously listened to this, as I said, leading up to my birth. And when I went into, into labor, um, I got taken to the hospital, um, as that's what my husband wanted me to do, and was, you know, busy listening to my meditation over and over and over and over again. I basically had it on repeat the entire labor. Um, the midwife didn't really think I was particularly far along they just left me in a waiting room with like loads of other people I didn't even have my own room at this point um and it was and it was kind of a, a few hours in I suddenly thought oh you know I need to need need the bathroom and my son was literally nearly born there um the midwife came rushing out and I was rushed into 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 a room to you know to finally give birth to him but I had no other 
pain management. I had no other, um, uh, you know, intervention whatsoever. It was 100% natural and it was just amazing. Now, for me, after the experience, um, I met a lot of women in that first year who didn't have such a positive experience as me. Um, and so I decided to train as a hypnobirthing practitioner because I wanted to share my story with as many women as possible. And I wanted to, you know, demonstrate to women that there is a different way. Um, I do understand that, you know, two, three percent of um, of births could and can result in medicalization and intervention. But the majority shouldn't. And unfortunately, in the UK at the moment, the statistic is nearly one in three births is a cesarean, which I find a bit, you know, um, I find that quite frightening to be perfectly honest. Um, my second child, um, I also hit in a burst. I was adamant I was having her at home. I had an amazing midwife the second time round who was into every single holistic therapy known to man. He was a little Dutch man. Um, and um, home birth is, is, a, is a really, a uh, common thing in, in Holland. So he was 100% behind me going, absolutely, Mary, I'll be there. Um, and I knew that my daughter would be born quickly. Um, that's one of the benefits of, of hypnobirthing because the mother is relaxed. The mother isn't fighting. You know, the mother is basically working with the body and the baby to, you know, to birth naturally. Um, my daughter was born in under two hours um, in the bath, at home, the most amazing experience I've ever had. Um, it was very spiritual. Um, and again, I had no other pain relief whatsoever, just my meditation and my self-hypnosis and my deep breathing. And it was awesome. Um, an hour after she was born, I was downstairs in the lounge with my mum and dad having lunch. The baby was calm. Um, everything was amazing. So, so that's my story. Um, as I said, I, I I trained as a hypnobirthing practitioner, and and I run this course with you know with um, parents, expecting parents, um, you know, to 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 share this different experience, um, and and to basically demonstrate that yes, you know, the the mind can control the body, and you can. You know, if you're taught, you can actually learn to control your own mind and to be in control. And that's very empowering. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Mary, for actually sharing your experiences, because I'm pretty sure people listening to this right now as well would have been so inspired by your positive story and by just how easy it is once you allow yourself to let go to actually just reach a state of relaxation where you can just program your own mind and I think that is a, such a powerful thing in itself um Piers what is your experience when it comes to clients that have perhaps experienced a state of sadness um how easy is it for them to be able to relax and to let go well parents um I often get um, I think they 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 call it um, postnatal depression and that sort of stuff. Um, one of the ways of letting go is a very simple mindfulness meditation, where you stop thinking about the past, you stop thinking about the future, and you become in the now. And I teach them a, a two minute exercise, and they do it so many times in a day. You know, normally four or five times a day. And it allows them just to step out of that sadness. Brilliant. So coming back to the here and now, um, Dr. Rajiv, we've just heard from three phenomenal experts that have basically taught us how to be able to calm, relax the nervous system, how to use imagery and meditations combined with breathing in a way that enables us to just be and I think that in itself is really powerful what are your comments on this I think it's a fantastic session I've been uh, listening to it and I'm kind of so inspired that it's so much of wealth which is there and uh, we uh, have just done a taste of what the deep uh, meditation yoga and and the psychology and the things behind psychology beyond many layers are there which uh, will be so good to really come back on some other session to have more detailed discussion 
just two quick questions. One is for peers. You mentioned about those two minutes thing that would change that whatever mantra meditation. Can we have that experience? And second question is to uh, to Mary. What would you say to hundreds of women who are listening and some of them are in childbearing age? Can they do this self-hypnosis at home to give a hypnobirth? So, <laughs> to, uh, okay, okay lady, ladies first. Fantastic. Mary, you first. Thank and you. Thank you very much for coming. Um, definitely. So there... I I trained with um, the Marie Mongan method. Um, she's an American um, lady who um, who pioneered hypnobirthing um, many many years ago. So certainly, you know, for any women out there of childbirthing age, my first recommendation would be to read her book because all the information is basically in 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 her book, Marie Mongan um, uh, Hypnobirthing. And the second is to find, you know, that there are there are many practitioners now in the UK and and across Europe. Um, and, and 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 you know other parts of the world. Um, I would definitely book yourself onto a hypnobirthing course to find out more. Um, you know, and my what I would truly love is I know in the UK obviously NCT is the majority is the most uh, popular childbirthing um, course which a lot of women do. Um, I would love it to actually include a lot of the hypnobirthing things just so that you know the, the two the two sit alongside and that women have all the information. Um, which which they need and then they can they can make the choice which is right for them so so yeah I hope that answered your question Rajiv. Thank you so much and thanks for coming here I know it's uh, Sunday but I can just appreciate so much of wealth is there and thanks for sharing story and giving us that knowledge back Thank to peers. <laughs> thanks um, Mary. Yeah Mary I, I trained with Mickey Monaghan 25 years ago Ah, wonderful! And she's she, she's it's a fantastic course. awesome awesome. <laughs> Hypno, hip, hypnobirthing rocks! It really really does. I I love it. Absolutely love it. Um, yeah, the 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 very quick mindfulness thing. I was taught, uh, God, probably about thirty years ago by a five year old on a mountainside in Malaysia who couldn't speak English. It is that simple. But I've 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 connected it with. Um, breathing more breathing techniques etc and it's the very simple breathing in stop breathing out breathing in stop breathing out and by the time they've done that it's 30 seconds there 30 seconds back but allows them to put the snow globe what i call it of the brain some people call it a monkey brain i call it a snow globe that's always doing this and all the there's glitter and all the thoughts and feelings and emotions are floating around. And by the if you put them down, everything settles. And as soon as it settles, the unconscious mind can go, keep, keep, rubbish, rubbish, keep, 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 rubbish, keep, keep. And it allows the mind to take the person very, very centered in that moment. And I just get people to do it between two and four minutes, two, three, four times a day. And the feedback I get from people is incredible. It is so simple. And if anybody wants to know how to do it properly, I haven't done it, but I will record a video and I'll send it to you. Um, That'll be great. That'll be great. Yeah, send me send me a request and I'll I'll record it. It'll be me sitting in this chair just doing this. It's about a th well, I'll teach you how to do it, and it'll take the whole me explaining it and you doing it will take about four minutes. Perfect. I was thinking to give you extra four minutes to do it today. <laughs> if you want me to do it properly, I can, but... Yeah. Whichever you think is, is better, uh, we will probably accept it. Um, if, if, if you want to do it in four minutes, I think it'll be amazing experience to add value. Uh, more than happy to do it. Let's go yeah, for go it. Yeah, go ahead, Piers. Go, go ahead then. Um, when you're Sorry. excited, people breathe, go, yes, and they breathe in and they normally raise their arms like they're victorious or something, but they expand their chest and helps them breathe. When someone is depressed, 
they breathe like Eeyore in a wonderful character from Winnie the Pooh. It's, mm. When someone's suffering overwhelm, panic or anxiety, it's <laughs> lots of short breaths. So how we breathe depends what state our mind is in. So when someone is sad or depressed, we, what we want to do is get them breathing, get the breath up. At the same time, we want to put those thoughts down. So everything that snow globe of the brain goes quiet. So the easiest way to do that is to take your mind on something really boring, change your breathing, and change everything about the state that you're in to create a relaxed state. And from that relaxed state, you can then achieve anything you want. So you're not going into the future. You're not going into the past. You are in the present. And anybody who's sad, depressed, anxious, or any feeling like that, also if they're going to go into have a baby or something like that, I often... <laughs> It's it's a very simple thing to do. You can use it on an aeroplane if you're scared of flying. You can use it whenever whenever you like. So I was good without further ado. Everybody, could you put your hands like this, please? Put your hands like this and get one finger and put it there. And if anyone's watching who I cannot see on the screen, if you are driving or using any form of machinery, please do not do this because I'm going to ask you to close your eyes in a minute. But what I'd like to do is to breathe in. Stop. Breathe out. 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 Breathe in, stop, breathe out. Breathe in, stop, breathe out. Close your eyes, breathe in, stop, breathe out. Breathe in, stop, breathe out. Breathe in, stop, breathe out. Breathe in. Stop, breathe out. Breathe in, stop, breathe out. Breathe in, stop, breathe out. I'm going to go quiet, continue by yourself. Excellent, keep going. And I wonder which finger is the most sensitive. Just think to yourself, is it the middle finger? Is it the finger that's doing the rubbing? Of course, it could be the thumb. Good, and then when you're ready, Clear the screen, let your eyes open and come back. Everyone, eyes open. Good. And those of you who can see all the faces, just look at the smiles. Look at the smile on everyone's face. And what you've actually done is you've literally just let that snow globe of your brain let go. So if anybody, if, if you can teach anybody how to do this, it's such a powerful thing. It's so simple, but it's so effective. If someone's going into an exam, if a kid's going to an exam, I get them to do this to help them relax. If someone is going to um, get a razor blade and start harming themselves, I said, put the razor blade down, just do this for a minute. And as soon as they do it, they say, Piers, I didn't cut myself. I didn't need to. So whatever that feeling, that thing going on in their head was, just to allow them to relax. 
I think I've used four and a half minutes. Sorry. I think it's fascinating how quickly we can actually get self-hypnosis to work. And combining that with the breath, it's almost instantaneous. Mm -hmm. It's like the example that we had earlier today, where it was taking somebody from a position of fear to a position of love. And fear was the one that was really contracting, whilst love was the one that was really opening and really just allowing. And I feel like that's what we just did there as well. It's just reaching a sense of content where we're not actually worried about anything else because the mind has literally just put everything down and we can just be from that element. And I think even that is just so powerful. Because we, you, live in a, we live in a push button world where everything is like this. People want instant results. And sometimes actually you just have to slow the process down to allow the mind to work the problem out. Wonderful, wonderful. A uh, very, very good demonstration, players, And it's just a technique which I think practically all of us can use. And as you said, that a, for us, if you're going for any anxiety-inducing uh, meeting um, or a situation where uh, we are facing people which don't have any harmonious relationships um, or interview or exam or even board meetings we can do that uh, for mothers to teach their children this technique uh, for teachers to teach children the technique and for husband and wife to teach their spouse what pierce has just shown so i think it's amazing thank you so much i'm uh, just thinking we can't ask mary to demonstrate hypnobirth because <laughs> <that's>... <laughs> <laughs> And um, Pierce, just a quick one. Would that technique work if we weren't doing the whole hand thing? Or do, is that part of the actual hypnosis itself? Um, I've never been asked that one before. Uh, yes, it can. Yes, it does. It does work without actually doing this. Right. But it was part of it is the reason why this you actually want your mind to concentrate on something else. Because one of the problems people find with um, most forms of mindfulness and meditation, they believe that they have to empty their minds. So they go into this state of, I must clear, I must empty my mind. Oh, tomorrow morning on my way into work, I've got to drop some money off at the newspaper, man. Oh, hang on, my mind's busy. And so it's a very good way of actually telling your mind to shut up. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Piers, for sharing that and for actually just being so open and giving today as well. Pleasure. Really allowing us to tap into that energy as well. It was really grounding. It was really centering. So amazing. And yeah, it sounds like this is something that we can come back to time and time again where it comes to mental health and a lot of the times mental health is seen as a taboo subject so by you actually coming on today and giving this some voice hopefully it's a trickle of hope for people out there that are watching as well so thank you pleasure and global namaste dearest sharon how are you my darling global namaste i'm so happy to be here I oh, was so happy that you are here today and because usually you have a practice of just going into different dances, going into different trances and showing us your ability to basically be able to align to the music and align to your energy and align to the whole body sensations, which is phenomenal in itself. But today, I believe you are going to be doing something slightly different. You're actually going to be teaching us the philosophy and the psychology behind dance which I am just so excited to hear well there's so much I want to bring forth uh, I started dance as a three-year-old and it's been the base of so many things and music and dance are just uh, inextricably intertwined and what did that do that brought me into the physical, the physical, the body, the movement. And what do we do in dance? You know, we express. 
We express our thoughts. We express our feelings. We express all the emotions. And so dance for me is way, way more than just this physical movement and showing off and being sexy. Dance is a spiritual, deeply, deeply spiritual experience in which we can transcend and transmute all of the issues that we have, all of the fears. I did a lot of work when I was doing my master's thesis. It was psychology and dance. And I had the dancers, my students, dance in different emotions. And then I would say, okay, five minutes, you're just gonna dance your anger. And then I would say, okay, how do you feel from that? What does that make you feel like physically? How's your breathing? You know, are you tense? You know, um, where do you feel it in your body? And then, you know, what happens? Actually, at times I use the, the nine rasas, actually. <laughs> you know, what when you're in Shanti, you know, what does that feel like to dance? What does that feel like in your heart? So I've worked with that for a long time. And I feel that, you know, all every experience that we have, whether it's positive or negative, is encoded in our bodies. How we walk, the positions and postures we display, both physically and psychologically, the tones in our voice, the sounds we make, the expressions on our faces, they've all been shaped by our society. We're conditioned by our parents, our teachers, our religious and political leaders, and now increasingly the media. This process that we call shaping, molding, or conditioning is, is also called imprinting. Who we are and how we are molded is one of the most important factors in shaping our lives. And this looking at the imprinting and looking at the, these forces that shape our lives and, and the way that we can shed all of the negative and strip ourselves of the masks and shedding these imprints, I think is one of the final acts of maturity for us as human beings to observe ourselves with total clarity and reorient ourselves through all of these techniques. There's a gazillion these days is the way that we need to go. To me, it's the only path to, towards true fulfillment and true healing. Because if we're not first true to ourselves, then to our larger families and communities, then what are we really? So from dance, dance has been the, the path for me that led into deep training in many different traditions. I was very honored to work with a man named Dr. Robert Masters. He wrote a book, a famous book with his wife, Dr. Jean Houston called uh, Mind Games and one called Listening to the Body. And so uh, Dr. Pierce, what you were bringing forth is some of what I was trained in by Dr. Masters. They, because they put together, they worked very deeply with Moshe Feldenkrais. Um, I first encountered, as a dancer, I injured myself young. I was like, what, about 20. And I was living in Jerusalem and I was taught this Feldenkrais technique, which is moving bringing consciousness deep, deep into the tissues and moving in a way very slowly and very delicately. Um, if you have a neck injury, for example, 
you're moving your head. One of the exercises is to slowly move your head and slowness is really, you know, as a dancer, I was like wild, right? But this taught me to go deep, deep, deep inside and, and use movement as a way to heal, as a way to really bring the consciousness deep into the tissues. So like, I remember I had a neck problem because I'd had the, I'd been hit by a car, you know, so um, I had whiplash. And so this exercise was, you know, bring your, your focus on your chin, right? And then um, move your head very, very slowly, you know, to the side and then and look, then look to the side, stick your uh, tongue in your chin and go further and then release that very, very slowly and come back. And then you do the other side the same way. And then you would focus on your mouth and do the same thing. Focus on your nose and do the same thing. Focus on your, with your eyes and you do the same thing. Uh, Dr. Masters, what he did was he combined all the work that he had done in hypnosis <laughs> with the work of Moshe Feldenkrais. So you're bringing, it, it's a very interesting system in which you're very slowly doing this exercises and bringing your consciousness in. And from that, then I, I wanted more, I was excited. I was dancing at that time. I already lived with my Guruji Sitara Devi and trained deeply one-to-one -one in Kathak dance. And that, well, that brought me uh, this understanding and experience of mantra and mudra and transformation and becoming like freeing myself through becoming if i felt you know fear if i felt even anger i would just transform into dorga right and say her mantras and dance the dance of dorga you know uh, <laughs> killing the demons and those demons symbolically represented the thoughts the negative thoughts in the mind and the negative emotions so for me these these dances were a way to continue to work with the nature of my mind and the emotions and free myself of these patterns and these imprints. I'm working on it today, every day. You know, it's a long, long process, but it's a process of enlightenment. And so dance has been the vehicle for me. It's been the vehicle to become the most loving and just caring human being that I possibly could be. The, so I worked a lot, a lot with emotions. So even in the, in the dance, you know, it's very, very different to dance like Kuan Yin, who's sitting over here. <laughs> Kuan Yin, uh, her mantra is Om, Om Mani Pe Mei Hung. I pay homage to the jewel in the lotus. And uh, that's her Tibetan mantra. She has a Chinese mantra, Namo Guan Shi Yin Pusa. And that means she, I pay homage to she who hears the cries of the world. And so when you're dancing, someone like her, it's the softest the most giving, the movements are slow, like Tai Chi, like Qigong, which I've trained a lot into. <laughs> Qigong, that's a dance. They're all dance, you know? So, so like Tai Chi and Qigong, which is really, uh, since, since Guan Yin is a Chinese Taoist goddess, she's very associated with Qigong. And so all of those movements, those very slow, graceful 
those are also created to slow your heartbeat, to slow the thoughts in your mind, and to just bring you the sense of relaxation. Now I do a whole, like almost every day, I do a whole inner meditation which involves movement. It involves that slow, beautiful dance, or if I feel, you know, harassed or something, I might turn into Dorga. Or if I feel really sensuous, I might turn into Lakshmi and say the mantra and become Lakshmi. Hi, namaste watching, you know all about this. And so dance is a path. Yes, there's, I've also been trained in what we would call dance therapy. And the, that is all about using movement. I worked uh, at that point when I was training, I worked with children who had autism and children who had many different conditions. And we would, again, and that's before I knew all these things, what we would do is do things that would generally slow them down. Movements that were soft because they would be doing a lot of jagged, that was their nature. You know, we, we observe, when we work with people, we observe the positions they're holding their body in. You know, the tone of their voice, all of these things that I've been talking about, we observe. And then, you know, we create kind of a prescription <laughs> to help them heal, to help them move in a softer way. And if they're very weak, we might want to do something that helps them move in a stronger way. Mostly that's really, there's so many layers and so many levels of this. One of the things I did want to bring forth is that sometimes I, I'll, I'll lie down on the floor and I include yoga. I haven't even talked about the power of yoga <laughs> for all of this. And yoga is a dance. I mean, many times I've seen uh, Dr. Donata and her Veda Mela. She had a whole dance. It was like a yoga performance and it was a dance performance. So they're so inter, inter, intricately intertwined, all of these things. And I just really feel that Western medicine to bring these alternative techniques and movement and, and the relationship with your emotions and your thoughts and with your body and your illnesses would be so powerful to bring, to integrally bring these different modalities together and create a true, true healing modality. Simply beautiful. What it sounds like is playing with the parasympathetic and the sympathetic systems um, to be able to activate and deactivate according to what it is that we need. And it's similar to what um, is actually taught in hypnotherapy as well, entering different states. So being able to actually enter the Hurga or enter Kali and to be able to play with those different things in a divine way which basically is completely different because at the end of it, they feel fantastic because they've had the activation in the way that they've required it to then be able to calm down again as well to a state where they are actually really content within themselves. And I think that's such a powerful thing that you've mentioned there is that link with spirituality. It's that link to the divine, seeing ourselves as mother divine, to be able to then step into that and to be able to continue that. And I think it's beautiful there to see the transition between one, one first feels those emotions and starts that beautiful dance to then what we actually get at the end. And it's such a great thing to actually combine that with a bit of Tai Chi and Qigong, having practice that myself we can see how the energy had the prana starts to move even within the body so something that is actually a really simple move because we feel the power and the strength within it actually ends up being even more powerful whereas something that um 
enables us to move with the rhythms of life, as I would actually say it. It's to be able to feel that strength within and then be able to move from there. And it's just completely different. Um, Dr. Rajiv Gupta, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Perfect. I think it's... Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, it looks like uh, what when Sharon was talking, her voice was calming me down because I had to be in and out and I was feeling a little um, anxious. Thoughts were going that way. But Sharon has got that powerful voice. And when she was talking, it was just, you know, amazing to say that the voice changes and motion creates emotion. And that's what I think Sharon was talking, which is wonderful, that it can help um, anger to calm down. And on the other hand, if you are depressed, you can bring energy into it to activate that. And both of these can be extremely good. Uh, I think uh, Dean is already in here, so we probably need to hear him. But I was thinking to Sharon to demonstrate the dance that will <laughs> calm down the anger. Well, I'll, um, I'll share one and we'll do it the next time. I'll do that. I do we'll want do to mention day. before I bring in Dr. Dean, uh, two things. <laughs> One, rhythm. You, uh, rhythm was mentioned. And rhythm and dance are completely intertwined. And what I find, you know, from, from my training um, is that each tall, actually, each rhythm cycle has its own energy and can affect you in very different ways. And that's something we could talk about the other another time. And the other thing I want to mention is that when I do these psychophysical exercises, which have this very deep hypnotic quality as well, when you're guiding them, and when you're doing them yourself and you're bringing your consciousness in and you're breathing deeply, um, what I find is that I'll be doing that. And then all of a sudden I'll notice that my mind is off, my body's tense. That's because my mind has gone off with some kind of problem. And the minute I, and I notice that, I relax it. I relax my mind, I relax my body, I take a deep breath and I'm free. So, Wai Ching, I want oh. you to say hi to Dr. Dean, but I know you have, just for a moment, I'd love you to, to speak. Yes. Hello, Dr. Dean and Sharon. I mean, this is uh, uh, beautiful in that we want to integrate this awareness, this somatic awareness, the intelligence in our bodies into integrated medicine, because this is what I call medicine-less medicine. Just by doing this, we can heal the cellular structures of the body and the psyche. And that all filters down, you know, from, as Riti was saying, I mean, her commentary was just so eloquent as well, into, you know, from the parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous system and really moving through the vagus nerve and all the way into the musculoskeletal system. And, you know, this is what we I did in somatic education and combined Qigong to aesthetic dance. And so I know this is why I'm, highlighted here and and I think what you said about the rhythm is so key because that starts with the rhythm of our heart and the rhythm of our blood as well if we quieten down we can hear all this and then you know we hear the music of our soul and when we have that everything is into a, a space of ecstasy and letting go and then we find that our physical pains also disappear. And that is the miracle of the medicineless medicine. And, uh, you know, just like your voice transported, uh, dear Dr. Rajiv, to another dimension, is that we, we had so, we've forgotten how to use our bodies, our voices, our spirit, our essence to just heal. And that's why they call the bedside manner of the doctors. It's just being just being there in our beings. And so, you know, this is the, uh, uh, very uh, aesthetic for me <laughs> and to, to be here with all of you. This, this segment here is just lifting, uplifting me. And um, so thank you so much. And Dr. Dean, I'm looking forward to hearing 
your sharing and um, I'll just continue to just receive and be in a elated state here. <laughs> yes, so much. I think we'll deal with this in separate session, more details of each because there's so much more to pack inside it. So we will have another follow-up session as I mentioned in the beginning that we will have more detailed sessions. We're absolutely right watching your contribution, Sharon and uh, Riddhi and all that. We all have the same hymn sheet slightly on a different page, but we'll bring it together. So thank you all for your contribution. Back to Sharon to introduce Dr. Dean. I'm so Hi, to have Dr. Dean here with us. Global Namaste. I want to introduce you. Dr. Dean is a lifelong professional musician that has been practicing holistic healing for more than 35 years, a board certified acupuncturist, naturopath, radio show host, author, professor, inventor, and philosopher. Dean used his combined training in oriental medicine and cross-cultural music theory that led him to the rediscovery of the role of the pentatonic scale in Chinese healing and his creation of the acutone technique. Dean teaches acutone to acupuncturists and health practitioners and has invented numerous musical healing devices, including the resonance bell, which he employs in his busy clinical practices. Thank you, Sharon. It's good to see you, even if it's on Zoom. <laughs> yes, it's always a pleasure. He's been, for those of you that have met uh, Michael Henry Dunn, the Kirtan singer, he's been playing with Michael Henry Dunn lately and bringing his knowledge into that wonderful world of Kirtan. So I would like to know about your experience of sound healing. What does that mean to you and how can that help us? Uh, I thank you. And it's very nice to be in the presence of so many people with a like mind. And we are all in a position now of changing the direction that the healing arts is going. And I, for one, have found a technique that has enabled me to have access better than anything that I've ever found in the sound healing arts. Now to the credit of Sharon's work in dance, it's her work has given her her own access to return to grace. We, we are in a very confused and very chaotic world right now. And I will just give a brief story of how I got involved with sound and the reason I had been so determined to find the answers of what had happened to me. At 11 years old, I was a young hockey player, loved the ice. I was raised in the Detroit, Michigan area. And for all of you that are aware of that area, it's a hockey town <laughs> of sorts. So I was a hockey player, a young hockey player. And what was going on for me at that time is I was constantly skating. I was doing free skating. I was skating with my equipment and I was on my travel hockey team and so on. So I was fortunate to be able to play and I was very good, but there was an accident that happened when I was doing free skating and there was this tall man who didn't skate very well. And he uh, was falling down and he swung his arm and he hit me and I went flying and I didn't have a helmet. And at that time, I was pretty confident that I could do most anything as a kid, right? But um, I had an injury. I'll just show you briefly. There's the scar. And I had my head crack open on the ice. He knocked me down. My head cracked open. Fortunately, my father was there on the ice, too. He picked me up, put me in the car. No time for an ambulance. But I was bleeding horribly. And when I got to the hospital, they did not do any surgery. They didn't want to touch it. 
And I had for many years after that injury had seizures, grand mal type seizures. And in that process of healing, I had uniquely been without anybody's instruction, focusing on tones that were being created in my head. And if I was to explain this a little further, the tones weren't what you might imagine in terms of like ringing in the ears. It was different. And it was more like a resonant frequency that was coming from my skull. But I went in the seizures and it became where I would go into these types of uh, spasms where I couldn't control my muscle movements and I had to watch where my hands were, but I couldn't control them even though they were going on on their own. But at the end of these seizures, I had a ringing sound and it was, uh, my body would be sweating profusely and I would have this sound of what would be something like a thousand crickets going on in my ears, in my head. And this high chirping sound and it, my whole head would buzz and I saw a light and this happened over 20 times in my uh, early 20s into the later 20s. But I saw a light and it would dissolve into a circle and it took several minutes for this to happen while this buzzing was going on. So you can imagine this kind of supernatural type of thing that was taking place in my body that no one could talk to. No one could speak about what was going on because during these seizures, I also would most of the time go into a spin like a whirling dervish. And I would go into this kind of spin that was supernatural. I couldn't spin like this if I even tried to. But it would be at the speed that you would imagine a figure skater that was on the ice and she was doing a twirl like this. And then I would go through the opposite direction. I would stop and then I would go the other direction. So I would go clockwise in a spin on the top of my toes. Remember, it's it would be impossible for me to do that. I couldn't spin like that on the top of my toes if I try. But I did it. And I did it in these seizures, going clockwise, and then I would slow down and then go counterclockwise. And so I was unwinding, essentially, what was happening. And I'd hear, hear these tones that were going on. So I went, I, I'd be exhausted. I would go through this uh, healing kind of crisis. And the release was happening in the form of these seizures and sound happening on simultaneously. I've had some actually some whirling dervishes that wanted to meet with me and get this experience documented. But I speak about it in my uh, classes that I offer. I've taught in Brazil. I've taught in China. I've taught throughout the United States. I have been able to decode, if you will, the frequencies that are directly related to sacred geometry and in oriental medicine and the perfect correlation. Chinese medicine had originally formed their art through sound. And I speak of this in my book. And when you're doing things like acupuncture, you're actually doing what I call acutone, which is my book. There it is. It's my picture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, and that frequency that the acupuncture is communicating with the cells in the body on a physical level, you could think of the needle as an antenna, okay, a receiver, and it's also a communicator. And I found a way to use this in a practical way on how to imprint the frequency back into our physical body. So why is sound important to me? And why is it so important now? I very much see that this is a timely technique, although there are many others. And uh, of course there's gongs that are used and there's chanting. 
uh, in a variety of different cultures, the Tibetan chanting, uh, we've all experienced some form of healing sound. Uh, what I, example I love to give is the mother singing to their child uh, at night when they're doing the lullaby. La da 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 da. Right, that that beautiful sound puts puts everybody to sleep. I don't care if you're in India, you're in Germany, if you're in Canada, I don't care. Everybody responds to those intervals. And that's a third that's in, talked about in my book. And it's sacred geometrically connected to our physiology. Okay. So there's that. And there's also the fifth. And that would be something like we have here in America. We have Reveille, which was uh, is, is the wake up call in the military, right? Bum, 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 you know, and you can't go to sleep to Reveille. Right. And you're not going to go for your marathon run when you're hearing lullaby. <laughs> OK, so the point is, is that we are all connected to the frequencies that are our, our environment, whether, whether it's the wind blowing, the trees, the sound that we have here during this time of year. We have a lot of wind. And of course, there's the birds chirping and we all uh, can relate to that. So what I did is I made a study into how these frequencies were spoken very uh, difficult to decipher the, uh, the words in Chinese to English in terms of understanding what they were their meaning was when it related to sound. But in the Ling Shu, which is one of the Chinese texts, the Su Wen and others, I was able to extrapolate the information even in some cases, translate old Chinese to new Chinese into English and make a discovery, or I should say a rediscovery. Now, I don't know how much longer I have, but there's a direct correlation with how we use these intervals in our body's organs, our levels of tissue, and even the season. So what I did is I, I brought out a box that resonates to this perfect sound of the frequency of D sharp, which is the sound of winter in Chinese medicine, D sharp, okay? And so I'll, I'll play this for a moment and then show you the spring sound. And then I'd like you to experience what it's like to hear one sound versus the other. And I'd like to get the audience's interpretation on which sound is better. Which one sound resonates to them better? Okay, first this one. Are you ready? Okay, and this would be the second sound. It'll be a little bit quieter. Zoom is not picking it up. Uh, yeah, Dean, Zoom doesn't allow sound to be traveled very well. In that case, all I can do it is happens send when it... I my crystal chalice as well. Okay. <laughs> Just... You know what, Dean, yeah. what we should do is I'll come and, and we'll record it on video and then we can show it. Okay, so then... I'll move on, but those two notes were notes that were calibrated to the seasonal shift, okay? There are five seasons in Chinese medicine. The first one I played was for winter, and the second one I played was for the spring, which happens to be A-sharp, and they're all the sharps in the seasons. There are 12 meridians. There are 12 tones. There are, in our chakra system, the frequencies that correspond to color. I made a chart that identifies these color frequencies. For example, F sharp in my book, I've identified this 40 times uh, above the audible frequency is the color of red in the color spectrum. The frequency of C natural is the color of green. So everything is perfectly matched to frequency. And that goes for even what, what Sharon was talking about, our consciousness, because all healing is about becoming aware. And it's my 
work that has been able to use these tools to identify these frequencies as a way of targeting the direction of our energy. So that's a foundation of why I got involved with the healing arts in, in this particular way. So please, if there's another question or there's another interest or I'm out of time, just let me know what you'd like. Namaste, Neil. Sharon, global namaste. And uh, uh, Dean, what a wonderful, simple, succinct way of getting people into this. Sharon, it's a very good idea that we do the recording because the playing of the tuning fork can resonate with when you close your eyes, the color Dean was talking about, the way which the way you will pick up the frequency. So let's do the recording. So Sharon, number one, uh, Rajiv mentioned that we bring another episode very soon. So the let's play our diary and let's select a date for next integrated year at uh, Healing Our Earth. If you could tell the people the future episodes here, Sharon, and then- okay, And then I want to bring in Dr. Kim. Yes, we are not closing. Sarah, we are not closing till we have good chance with Kim and things. It doesn't matter how long we extend. We are still carrying on, okay? So the future episodes. Celebrating fourth anniversary. Sing, chant, poetry, or deliver a message. Free global online session Sunday, April 7th, 2024. This is so much fun. I've been here for a few of these now. <laughs> <laughs> and and Sharon, it's such a joyous occasion. Yes. And Sharon will be celebrating a 235th episode since pandemic. We want everybody to come and say how Healing Our Earth has helped them or any suggestions or their memories. Just come and share with us one and all. It's all our platform so we can enjoy. Next episode, Sharon, here it comes. Ram Navami special, celebrate with pachans, kirtans, and more. Another really fun episode. Join us for this free global online event, Sunday, the 14th of April. Then, mm -hmm, one of my favorites, Vegan veg Vegetarian Kitchen, achieving good health gastronomically on the 21st of April. I know, I think we're, from what I've heard, we're going to bring in also some information about beauty, using different oils, Ayurveda, plus right. beautiful recipes. We are going plant-based as well, and we are going plant-based beauty products as well. And uh, you are, of course, uh, one of the hosts here, and Seema is there in East Africa. So we're gonna have a global connection again, and it'll be beautiful. And for this one, where you are again, the host, Sharon. Uh, here we go. World Tai Chi and Qigong Day, Sunday, April 25th. There's so many wonderful Qigong teachers and healers that will be coming to celebrate uh, this day that um, Bill Douglas and his wife, Angie, have put together for many years. It's an amazing event. And I'm, I must uh, give, you know, Omar it's sharp. It's sharp for yes. putting this together and bringing all these wonderful people. So uh, jo please join us. We'll learn a lot and about Qigong and Tai Chi and um, meet some wonderful. And Sharon, our, our Wai Ching will be involved in that as well because she loves Qigong and Tai Chi as well. So it'd be so beautiful to have all of you. Rajiv, while you are there with Ridhi and Amrita, since we are all producers, check your diary for Sunday, 26th of May. It's presently between two sessions, so we can block integrated health because we actually want to launch the website of integrated health as well, since now that we've got so many Ayurveda experts, homeopathy experts, and hypnotherapists, and chiropractors. So Rajiv, uh, Riddhi, make a note of it, 26th of May, which gives us enough time to bring more people. Maybe, Rajiv, what we do, we do massive panel chats because panel chats are doing so well so that people can engage and we can have more people included. And presently, I'm going to hold that date for you, Rajiv. Yeah, is... please hold the date and I come back to you uh, in next day or two. To come yeah, there is no way it's still held. In any case, we need to put next integrated because remember, we need a series of them 
And Kim yeah. in United States of America, smiling Kim, welcome once again. And we're not going to stop till we have enough chance with you, Rajiv, Riti, uh, Dr. Lakshmi, we ask everything. So Sharon, take it away and introduce our smiley Kim who has been uh, on our platform before. Over to you, Sharon. Mm. Dr. Kim Namaste. Engar. MD LAC has been practicing natural medicine for over 30 years. She's a licensed naturopathic doctor, acupuncturist, medical herbalist, and Qigong instructor that is committed to healing with natural medicine. If there's anyone I know that is really someone involved in integrative health, it is Dr. Kim. She provides a full range of naturopathic and TCM services for her patients, which include an integrative approach with exams and diagnosis, treatment plans, and nutritional support and education. And she is my- Thank doctor. you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me, Sharon. She also uses sound healing as well. So let's- so talk to me about your experience of integrated health, integrative health. You have, I know, worked with many Western medical doctors as well, as with so many, many different modalities. Well, I think it was touched on since I've been on the space for the last half hour, at least, um, about how different modalities are reaching people in a different way right now. And I think that has to do with Kali Yuga and it has to do with the energy shifting that's going on on the planet, which is natural too, um, that our, our bodies, not that we haven't resonated with these things for multiple millennia and, and even longer than that, but I think that it is a wake up call um, to help to clear a lot of dis-ease with simple essence type practices, you know, and that includes a lot of things that you've already shared in doing our own practices, which is really important so that we can continuously ground and clear ourselves. But I'm just finding more and more um, with my consulting and practicing that um, and working with people that more than ever, you know, that they need to have some tools to navigate this really expansive space that can also be very challenging. And I think Dr. Dean mentioned that as well. Um, and I think that certainly you don't want to get sidetracked with, you know, you want to become masterful as much as possible with the modalities you resonate with as a practitioner. But I just find that even some of my patients who are very connected, they have their own practices that they're even asking for just a sound therapy treatment of balancing the chakras, which is so powerful. Um, not that the, the nice thing about natural medicine is that it's already resonating with all that. So to in, introduce a plant medicine or to introduce even a natural powder, um, amino acid or something that our body is already resonating with, resonating with, we may need more of, we may be using up because of the energies be, we're being exposed to. That can be elementals. That can certainly, when I say elementals, I mean trace minerals and things, but I also mean working with crystals and other, other types of sound therapy, vibrational medicine. And having kind of started in that realm with my early years of herbal medicine and studying a lot of hydrotherapy and alternative therapies, so to speak. I don't like to call them alternative therapies, although I know we tend to do that um, because I think they're really the elemental therapies, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that Western medicine doesn't can't resonate with that if the intention is there. Right. So it's like having been a paramedic and emergency medicine person for decades, even prior to being a naturopathic doctor, there are certainly a place for all of that and to work together to reach um, the best state of health is the important thing. And I think that as practitioners, we end up finding those people, no matter what type of medicine or healing we might be doing to help to integrate that with people. So. <laughs> I know that you're very aware of what's happening 
um, in the media and how that and the energies that are going on and how and that seems to be very deeply affecting so many of your patients um, so what modalities do you feel uh, bring a calmness and um, you know take the mind away from the the fear that is being brought forth especially in this country it's interesting we say media i i think that there are sounds and energies that not necessarily are natural that are also negatively affecting people that people may not be consciously aware of and that's okay if they're not i think the answer is just making people helping people find a place in root chakra find a place to release whether that to be be to gaia energetically um to nature you know use these natural ways with practicing um our own practices right and having been a yogi for 40 years as well as qigong i mean i i need to do that as much as anyone else every day you know and i i take that seriously having taken a medicine buddha vow in my practice as well, that um, that in order for me to be in alignment with someone's needs, that I need to emanate that myself. So it's as personal as it is for anyone else. Um, and it's challenging. Um, and living up at altitude and living where nature and the wind and the intensity, I think Dr. Dean had mentioned as well, not that we don't have that all over the planet, but it's a good reminder um, that we need to honor those natural rhythms in ourselves. And what I've seen, even with sound therapy, I, I have some patients asking just, and I thought it was great that Dr. Dean mentioned the sound therapy of the needles, because I remember some of the early days of working with acupuncture for myself, just seeing the vibration of the needles and having patients with MS and other types of neurological blockage where the needles would literally fly out when the channel opened, like during the treatment. And I had students that were like, what just happened? And the patients would say, oh no, like we just opened that channel. You know, we just cleared that resonance and, and got it to, you know, just allow space, right? And I think that's the biggest message. It's so simple, but to just create space in our lives. And the problem with media is it, you know, sometimes, of course, there's good information. There's, look, we're using media right now. This is a wonderful way to transmit really good knowledge. But I think we need to have like the media break too, so that we can connect again beyond just our connections here or, you know, being bombarded with a lot of negative vibrational space um, that we can create that space of peace and calm and grounding so that we can clear and create more space because if you i remember living in in the phoenix area which is very hot for many years and it was really interesting when it would get past a certain temperature of heat you could see this fuzziness in the air and it was literally the vibration of the molecules it was literally the speed at which the molecules were moving in space that they would create this kind of different kind of um vibration that was visible uh, to me, and I mean, I talked to people about it as well, and they said, yeah, people that had lived in the desert for a long time said, yeah, it gets like that. And this wasn't dirt, this wasn't dust, this wasn't wind, this was really the vibration of the molecules. And as the vibration of the molecules become faster, you know, in a sense, you could say there's less space, right? And that we need to create more space to let that light therapy in just the sun therapy right which is so powerful against viruses and all kinds of things i remember um having been exposed to viral meningitis years and years ago you know over 30 years ago and my husband at the time was very sick with that and just doing sun therapy uh to help get rid of the virus of course i use sound and some other things and i i took some of that on myself and um, I was nursing my oldest child at the time. And I luckily was able to stop doing that to be able to create space and transmute this, this viral thing. Um, but, but these elements, these basic elemental things that we could use, including our own practices, our own connection, is really powerful. 
it doesn't negate other types of medicines and they're certainly necessary. But the beautiful thing about natural medicine is that it integrates beautifully and it can integrate with allopathic medicine, you know, Western medicine. Um, and I always find that so beautiful and powerful when I see studies um, about natural medicine lining up with a DNA diagnosis, you know, with some kind of testing or some kind of uh, more Western type of testing. When it's in alignment, it all it all matches out perfectly, you know. Um, I remember one of my patients years ago uh, was working with a supplement company and she had the access to genetic testing very early on, which happened to be very expensive at the time. And we were working under a TCM diagnosis therapy, you know, and, and I could see that she had some missing links to some of her detoxification pathways. You know, she had a tendency in her family towards cancer and other things like that. And so we were doing some mitigation for that uh, in terms of like from the Chinese medicine diagnosis and the Ayurvedic in this case too, um, that it just showed that there was stagnation in certain things. And when she got the genetic testing back, it said the same thing. It, but it gave, you know, the specific liver pathway, but it didn't matter. And she was just so glorified by that, that it's like, this is truth because this is lining up and her treatment therapy didn't need to change. We could expound upon it. We could do more with it. And that's the beautiful thing of creating environments and situations where people have these experiences of healing, where we can show that that integration doesn't take away from any of those modalities including allopathic medicine, it, it can all work together um, for the patient as long as everyone has the right intention. Beautiful, beautiful. Dr. Rajiv and uh, Mai Ching, are you still with us? <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm so mesmerized. Uh, it was so amazing, so good experience. And having Kim here, Sharon, thank you very much for getting into this vital slot bringing back the whole integration together and her experience right from the working within and being a prescriber even of the Western medicine to the Chinese medicine and also having the experience of the ancient uh, Indian heritage uh, culture uh, bringing it all together was amazing and overall I'm so glad that Sharon your own like bringing the dance and dance into healing and the whole purpose of connecting to the soul through the dance and creating a space which is outside you so that you can look in and motion, create emotion. So we are just immersing into it. And from being the music is amazing. How so dance therapy, music therapy, aromatherapy and all that is just like whole complementary work together and together with the dance you brought the qigong which is so good and uh, amelia dr whiting was uh, talking about also the same thing how the whole qigong energy movement can add the value because there is nothing like this in the current contemporary or western medicine and that is a void because i and riddhi have been talking over last week continuously for like hours on there is nothing like prana in the modern medicine or western medicine and therefore if we can bring the two together because this the modern medicine is like a different level evidence-based, you know, double blind control trial, and this is there, what is there, and the whole new generation is everything is evidence. If you don't have 22 reviews, they would not buy from Amazon. You know, the whole kind of thing is driven by that, and you know, people are whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Um, this whole review thing is there for hotels, for resorts, for food chain, everywhere. This is because that is the evidence. That is surrogate evidence. Now we are all driven by that evidence and there is more and more evidence needed as the generation is moving down. So they are losing touch to many of these things and it's good for us and it's our responsibility to bring back this 
I was talking to somebody, I uh, mentioned to Riddhi and some other people, a, a guy who didn't manage to come today. In fact, uh, uh, there was like so much of people talking today. He was talking about mantras and how mantras change the nervous system. And when I was talking, I was thinking of neuroplasticity. And that can all relate into one. So when we connect all this and write in a scientific language that the modern medicine people can understand, we can make the difference and make that connection which is missing currently. So I think that's amazing. I think uh, Kim wanted to say something. Oh, I just wanted to mention, you know, with Hippocrates, there was a thing at, mentioned as the vis, which is really the prana. You know, so if you go back to the original origins of allopathic medicine and Hippocrates, and they talk about the vis, uh, you know, the power of the vis, the energy of prana, the conscious energy that flows within us. And I think, like you said, it, there's just some things been lost that we need to reconnect with that. Um, so no matter what word, you know, whether it's Latin, you know, or, or any, any language, we have this sense of that of that conscious spirit of energy that's within us that can help us heal. Wonderful. And uh, Sharon, we had had long discussion on this um, a few days ago. And I'm, I'm glad that this whole compact and composite of different parts, which are like a different screwdrivers um, and spanners, uh, and they are coming together in a toolbox in order to take a good shape so that we can mend the body in a much effective and powerful way. So thank you so much. And uh, I don't know what Riddhi wanted to say, um, just to say add any well. Dr. Rajiv, I would like to say something. And it is, I tell you, it's a pleasure to feel you receive all that is being said today. And especially with this group, I mean, I could just feel that energy and your openness and your reception. And that's all us energy healers here. We can feel that. <laughs> and your, our souls merging. I mean, for something that is going to blossom into something magical. The magic of medicine is what we're bringing back. And I really so appreciate your comment about not having it be evidence-based, which is... Uh, really takes the mystery out of medicine. And it it really, I mean, not everything's evidence. I mean, later on, it's all exploratory. Science is exploratory. It's always evolutionary. It's revolutionary. So to have, you know, even some of the people I, I work with to say evidence-based, evidence-based, you no, know, it has to be that some you just have to receive the, the miracles and some anecdotal um results some stories that we can't explain yet so thank you so very much for really bringing this true meaning of integrative medicine thank, thank you, you so as much. well absolutely Rizzi, and it's not just the prana within us it's also the prana around us and by having conscious conversations like this and bringing together all the different modalities we begin to gain that appreciation that otherwise we wouldn't have. And especially with the integrated health work now that Rajiv, you want to put together and I'm supporting you on it. It's fascinating to see the different ways that all of these different modalities can begin to work together that can really start to bring out the best. Um, an example being the one that we heard today in terms of the whole sound frequencies and the mantras and how different mantras will actually vibrate at different frequencies. And those different frequencies release different emotions and the emotions in motion is what makes the world go around. And so by actually just being present and tapping into these different modalities, I think that is the biggest thing about it is that we could go on and on until we are literally blue in the face, but actually just having an experience of it is something completely different. And I feel like that's what we started to tap into today is to actually 
start to bring things back down into a concrete level. Um, I think it's fascinating how we can start to explore and start to play with this, even for ourselves, and see the different energies and different frequencies and how they all interplay. Um, I think, Dr. Rajiv, again, it's really important, as you're mentioning, that the medical stuff is pretty much peer-reviewed. There are several journals, several articles around this stuff, but by actually creating an integrated health forum like we have today, which is just literally the tip of the iceberg, we can begin to bring together all of these different modalities. We can begin to explain it. So we can begin to see how different modalities fit together, almost like a jigsaw puzzle. And there's so many things that overlap and we just call it different things. For example, prana and chi is pretty much asymmetric to itself even with Shiva and Shakti, asymmetric to itself. And so by actually seeing how these different practices overlap with each other, we can start to see the differences. Um, Sharon, you were actually mentioning earlier about dance therapy and about the symmetries there between hypnotherapy and yoga. And it's exactly that. All of these um, different modalities are literally working on a deeper level. I was mentioning to Rajiv G the other day about the nervous system and about how all of this stuff, if we don't actually deal with it, if we're not vocalizing what's going on, it can be really difficult because we're just in our own modalities trying to deal with it. But the body will keep the school. And sometimes we're not even aware of what's happening. And yet there's something going on deep inside. So by actually working with practices like this, which basically allow us to tap into the somatics behind it, we can then start to release. And it's that release, it's that letting go, it's that expansion that enables everything to become so much more. Um, and a lot of the times that's where the healing actually does happen. That's where we can actually then start to be a part of this bigger picture, the bigger world, because at the end of the day, it is one consciousness. Uh, Neil Kumar, what are your comments? What are your thoughts on this? Thank you, Riddhi. <clears throat> what a wonderful production, Rajiv, Riddhi, Sharon. So many wonderful guests that we have got, and we have got very relevant chat over here. We're coming to a closing time. We've extended way beyond because it was so exciting and Rajiv and Riddhi had so many people, including Sharon. I want to go around the panel and I want to get the five best tips from you that are free. The five best tips and point you to them. Sleep is free. Oxygen is free. Sunlight is free. Water is free. Breathing is free. Anything that is free and readily available to even the third world country, to those who are listening to us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, website, etc., they can take advantage. So select yours, even if it's repetitive, doesn't matter. We'll go around the panel and Kim, we start with you. Five best free tips, please. Um, uh, can we can we, can we uh, listen? Lakshmi Vyas, she wanted to say something. Yeah, she will and be coming. Rajiv, she will be coming in a moment. Kim, go ahead, please. Uh um, I think the thing that I found that seems to be helpful with my experience of what people are experiencing currently um, would be space, um, earth or grounding, um, breathing, taking in that prana or chi. Um, and I think it was mentioned by Sharon when she was talking about qigong and other things is just to let ourselves stop and take that breath in and then connecting with nature um, I think is really important because there is healing there for us to tap. Okay. That we forget about just walking on the earth or listening to the wind or feeling the sun. Maybe I just added a few more than five, but I'll stop there. Thank you, Kim. So I'll just summarize that space grounding Breathing, nature, where really you connected the sound, the wind, uh, everything over there. Thank you, uh, Kim. Let's go to our Dr. Lakshmi Vyas. He's the president of Hindu Forum of Europe and part of uh, Healing Our Earth Women's Forum as well, which is going lips and bound now. So, Dr. Lakshmi Vyas, your five tips 
that are free, that are readily available anywhere for anybody on the earth. Global namaste to all of you. Um, Rajiv ji, I was just waiting to thank you for your wonderful, um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, input in all these uh, um, uh, talking and um, um, discussions. And, um, you know, when you disappeared, I was wondering, are you coming back or not? I'm very glad that you came back. And um, once again, thanks a lot. And regarding the five things, I mean, I, I, I may be different from the others. For me, uh, so some, of the, uh, some of the important uh, five points are chanting. Uh, chanting helps uh, uh, in many ways. Uh, then um, uh, breathing, uh, breathing, uh, uh, that is yogic breathing, I would say. Uh, singing, dancing, and walking. You know, these are some of the um, uh, things that I do on a regular basis to get um, happiness and to be healthy. Thank you, Dr. Vyas. You are very clear. Chanting, breathing, singing and dancing and walking. These are all free. Whenever you feel like, keep on walking. If you drink a glass of water, bring it back, clean it, go back and walk. If you want to pick your remote control, put it far so you have to walk to pick it up. If you go to supermarket, park your car the furthest and you'll have to walk. Don't take lifts. So again, so breathing is common over here. So it's beautiful. Wai Ching, your best five tips that you have experienced throughout your time. Okay, what's free? It's smiling. A smile is free. And a hug and the generosity of spirit. Um, dancing and breathing through life and uh, daydreaming and meditation and astral traveling. It's all free to go home to the divine So and bring it back uh, into the planet. So all that is free. So it's, um, yeah, no travel coupons. You can just go. So I think back. says you don't have to dream in your sleep only. Daydreaming is good because it can boost your hormones up and everything. Smile whenever you see. So you will always notice a child is very crafty. Right up to the age of two years old, whatever they want something, they smile. And you've never ever seen a rational mother slapping a child while uh, he or she is smiling. So smile, hug whoever is next to you. Give them a nice big hug. Sometimes when you hug and your aura is clean and the flash and the, your temperature, body temperature actually cleanses the person you are hugging or that person is cleansing you. So do that. Dancing, breathing and daydreaming. Sharon, your best five tips that you have used in your life. You have seen several decades on this earth. Okay. I know you love dancing and singing. But your best five tips that we can share with people. There's a song that keeps coming into my head. Make someone happy. You know, really send love. And, and begin with yourself. In, in Qigong, there's something called the inner smile. You smile to your organs. Smile to yourself. And bring that joy out to others and all the other things, nature, walking, dancing, singing, all of those things. Wow, care beautiful. For care for yourself, that's free. Take care of yourself and do what you love. Take care of yourself, do what you love, singing, singing dancing as well. Sharon is a proof, she has been doing that for I think more than 50 years. And here is the proof. She only looks 30 plus VAT. And the reason why she does is because she keeps herself happy. And we go to Riddhi. Riddhi, your best five tips in your life that you have experienced that you would like to share with people that is freely available. Oxygen, deep yogic breathing, water, making sure that we get the adequate amount each day. Chanting, being oneself, when we're doing mantras, but actually chanting them, feeling the frequencies, feeling those emotions, feeling content. 
there's a difference between feeling happy and feeling content and everything else. But that comes from being, that comes from stillness. And the fifth one, take walks in nature. The more that we can actually be outdoors, the more that we're actually in that environment, the more we're allowing that environment to be a part of us. And we are one consciousness. So Riti likes being out in nature, which is very to connect yourself back to nature, back to basic. It's going to be beautiful. You will love it. Rajiv, your best five tips that you have, because you are a, you are an NHS doctor, you are a yoga practitioner, you are an integrated health developer, and you carry multi hats over there. Your best five tips that you think are free that anybody can share anywhere, anytime. Uh, fantastic. So my five tips, the first one is mindful eating. Avoid distractions like TV or smartphone during meals. And that actually instantly improve your digestion and also reduce overeating. So that's first. The second was active transportation. Whenever possible, choose walking or biking or public transport or driving so that you have got the time for yourself. The third one is uh, learning and creativity. So keep your mind engaged in learning new skills. I have always taught myself. As a student, I am still learning new skills, digitalization, reading, indulging into creative, painting, writing, writing books, musical instruments, whatever. Uh, fourth is social connections because that gives food to mind. So that is a crucial for mental health. So engaging in community, volunteering, joining groups, clubs. And the fifth one is exposure to nature. I love walking in the garden barefoot because then you can connect to the nature that reduce your anxiety and your whatever stress you have and it boosts the mental health but also give you more oxygen elate your mood and physical health and mental health so those are my five tips yes multi-variety there from rajiv because he's a multi-variety practitioner there as well thank you rajiv let's go we've got dean lloyd as well dean your five favorite facets or attitudes or or matters that is readily available anywhere on the earth, including third world country where they've got no water or nothing. What are your five tips that you think you want to share with people? To launch off of what Sharon said about the smile, I practice daily something called the inner smile. So I smile but it shows from the inside out. <laughs> so if I may, uh, I put the smile in the body first and then let it come out. It's not um, difficult to imagine how when something makes us happy, our responses are organic. They're natural in themselves, right? So if we're smiling inside, we're happy inside, it's going to reflect on our face. And it's beautiful that it, that was mentioned before. Number two would be listen. Now, what is the benefit of, okay, I hear the doorbell ring or I hear, uh, you know, somebody's, you know, doing something in the other room or those are things that are in the outer world. I listen to myself on a regular basis. I check in and I I don't tune everything out entirely. I just focus on the inner voice. So I would put my attention on the inner voice. And that would be also tied into when uh, you mentioned listen to music, doctor, that this is part of our job is to make music. You know, if I went down to go get some water down at the river and I noticed that I'm humming along, it's going by much better than it would be if I was not making, you know, making a tune or in other words, I've been able to program myself so that music and sound becomes part of my practice, but I don't think about it. I'm just naturally humming. So I signed at the end of my letters and uh, my emails and any notes that I'm taking for people. They know it's me when I say humming Dean with explanation uh, points on each side of me, because 
I'm all, I'm humming constantly because everything's in motion. Number four is it was also mentioned earlier about water. And you probably know Dr. Emoto's work and how he was saying how you send love to the water and it takes on that crystalline form. Well, I would do the same. Inward, out. Send love to the water. And I do that daily. I got a structuring, very some very sophisticated structuring uh, uh, tools in water. Uh, but the most, of course, important is that you're sending love to water. And then uh, last is, and it was also touched upon, sending love to others and that we are so needing to send our love energy out to those that are receiving us. And that could be, you know, family members. It could be friends that we need, no need healing. But we are all in this together if we are focusing on a particular person or somebody that needs our connection we're silent, but we send that energy outward. And thank you for the opportunity. That was a beautiful thing to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. And Dean's uh, salient point says, listen to your inner self, inner smile, inner voice. Don't be scared. Go for it and send love as well. And since I'm also a little part of this organization, sometimes I'm allowed to have my say too. I'm going to throw you off completely and go completely in a different tangent. For last 40 years, I've been arguing with authorities, parliamentarians, gurus, that the only thing that we cannot survive with for more than a few minutes is oxygen. You can stay without water for more than a week. You can stay without food for more than 10 weeks. You can stay without sun for more than six months. Some countries don't get that. Believe me, you, the only matter that you cannot stay on the earth with, without is oxygen. Literally, seven minutes is maximum if you are a scuba diver or a, a, a guru in a Himalayan mountains. They say there are gurus without oxygen. They leave. I haven't found one. If you find one, please connect to me because I would like to interview them for a TV. But oxygen is very important. So do yourself oxygen cleansing, which we will discuss why we should be doing that. And another thing, very important thing that is freely available. Do not harbor yourself with any grudge, any vengeance. Throw it away. Like how you throw the food waste or newspaper waste, which is nothing, and you put it in the bin that goes into after bin, goes into a truck, goes into port incinerator. Do not burden your body with any grudge, any malice, any vengeance, because spiritually it is not profitable. You understand all profit because you understand pounds, dollars, rupees and things. Well, why don't you understand spirituality as well? That's free. Cleanse yourself. Another thing, if your mother, and I'm very specific, I'm not talking about brother, father, sister. If your mother is alive, Ring her right now. As soon as this session finishes, tell her you love her. If she's not alive, connect to your mother because she gave you the birth. It's the, it, this is why the earth is called she and not him. Okay, We are connected to that. If you go to mother every day, connect to your mother. You'll be shocked what you will come up with because they can heal you so fast. So I'm talking something completely different. Water. It's a good idea because that's readily available, although you can survive without that. Water consumption is very good. If you don't want to take medicine and you don't want to be forced with also alternative medicines, cleansing mind, understanding oxygen, connecting to your mother, walking, drinking water, they're all important uh, facets of life, matters of life, and they're all free. But all of you have given so much over your singing, dancing, go to the inner self, smile, watching self, smile. Also, why not be a child for a while? Because you've forgotten to be a child. You've taken things for granted. You don't, you don't go and run behind the butterflies anymore. You don't go and follow the little insect which is bringing a mall hills and everything. You, you, you've forgotten living. That's why when you become a grandparent, your grandchildren forces you to bend down or knee down or ask you questions 70 times. You need that 
just be there. You are all wonderful soul. We have made so much difference to people today. People have really enjoyed. I love you all. And you are all amazing soul. Rajiv, thank you. You've been working out tirelessly, changing the schedule as many times as I've requested you to. Ridhi, Sam, you and Rajiv have been in touch. Uh, Sharon, again, your slot, you adjusted your slot to come quite late. Uh, Amrita over there connecting uh, our Lal Goyal, who is our prominent producer. What a wonderful family we are. Together, we can heal the earth slowly. Ridhi and Sharon. Time maybe to chant Gayatri Mantra and we can close officially. Wai Ching can do as well. Wai Ching likes closing as well. Wai Ching is our regular host. So any one of you, Ridhi, Wai Ching, uh, Sharon, if we can just formally close this. And next week, don't forget, we want each and every one of you, you be here as a part of celebrating what healing our earth has done for you, what it means to you, what do you feel we ought to be doing? What are your suggestions? How has it made difference to you? Because this platform is ours. It's each one of us. There is no gender bias. There is no racism here. There is no caste, culture, religion. It's pure, simple. It's earth. We are healing slowly together. Ridhi, Wai Ching or Sharon, please mantra and let's just close and we'll go private and we can chit chat amazing i just want to say a massive thank you to everybody that's taken time out today that's been there with us that supported us thank you as well to rajiv gupta who's been mentoring me who's been guiding me along the way it's had a massive impact and it's just absolutely phenomenal to see how all of these different modalities can come together. Again, it's just one consciousness bringing everything together simultaneously, harmoniously, to see how we can create a better impact, a bigger impact in this world. Let's close with the guide thing once more.